temperatures. So for instance, in Sweden, it takes us one to two days to take the sample. Somebody would come to your home with a taxi, take the sample, take it to the central lab, and then that has been analyzed and the result coming back takes often uh, one to two days. So when you look into this from a resource limiting settings, that becomes even more challenging. So uh, one way to address this is basically to develop tests that can be applicable at the point of care. And uh, in this case, this is really some of the uh, challenges that we've been looking at and started to develop methods for that. So those of you who took my course, you will not be surprised to see what I'm talking about. So uh, this technology uh, has the possibility to be scalable and be done at the point of care. It's based on uh, uh, centrifugal microfluidics. So you have a piece of plastic, it rotates, and by rotating you can control the fluid precisely. And uh, it, we believe anyway that the benefits of this one is quite rapid, it's very simple and scalable technology. The technique behind it is that we use uh, a combination of uh, smart fluidic design and the nano porous agarose beads that allows the nucleic acid to be captured in one position and that is what you're looking at here. So what I'm showing basically is that, um, let me see, yes, uh, this is the disc and here you have agarose particles and if you have nucleic acid they will be capturing those and then you can use a, a simple cyber green to actually make uh, effective detection. And you can see it by naked eye or with a simple smartphone. And when I say the amplification, what I'm You, there could be some forgiving, but if you shrink your world into microchannel uh, uh, volumes, then the background starts to be of uh, uh, problem. So what I'm showing you here is that an amplification that's not amplified gives you background noise, and the same thing when you are supposed to amplify it. So it's very difficult to differentiate those.
it uh, selectively captures nucleic acid based on um, a sequence length. So what I'm showing you in this graph here is that uh, basically if you look at negative input and output, you take away those short sequences effectively from the reaction. That's it. To make a long story short, we characterize the size dependencies, and here is a ladder with specific uh, uh, length of nucleic acid. So the shorter the nucleic acid length, the more efficient this capturing is into the agarose leads. So how would that work then? So we're looking into that, can you do this agarose bit to selectively take away background fluorescence in negative sample? Uh, here you see, when you have negative, all the primer dimers are now being captured on the beads, whilst when it's uh, positive, uh, a number of them are not there because the reaction has already amplified and made the lamp product much, much longer. So the question is, can you also differentiate in liquid? And this is also what we did. Uh, here I'm showing you the comparison between when it's only liquid and when you use the beads. So what happens is that all the signals from the negative are now captured into the uh, beads only, while for the positive, they are both on the beads and on the uh, uh, solution. So uh, with that knowledge, we went into centrifugal microfluidics. So we designed our chips. We know what uh, we wanted to do. What we wanted to do was having a way to effectively mix the beads with the reaction after the amplification. So once we've amplified, we, uh, we're using a rotor to basically push the liquid through the beads. And what happens is that the air that was there from the beginning gets pressurized. And then when you reduce the flow, uh, the um, rotation, it goes back. So if you keep doing that a couple of times, you effectively mix your lamp product with the beads. And this is the prototype we developed. It's uh, quite simple. It uses a, a rotor, and this rotor comes from, uh, it's a drone rotor, which means it's uh, quite low cost when you buy it. This is the disc. We have a, a filter here. We have a laser. This is the uh, laser diode. And then we have a plastic filter. We have a, uh, this is um, uh, a lens uh, to basically enable us to use any type of smartphones to detect these uh, reactions. And then the second one we did was a heater. And this heater is quite simple. It's basically heating a mat, blue copper on it, which sandwiches the disks in between. So we have uh, within, within 20 to 30 seconds, you come up to 65, and it maintains that. So you uh, amplify here first 30 minutes. And then you put it into the rotor and let the rotor uh, take care of the mixing. And uh, after uh, that, you take your smartphone, you take uh, a picture. You can see by eye already without doing any image analysis, this is negative and this is positive. Here is a magnified version you can see here. And what we then do is we take uh, an image analysis software, um, image A in this case, it's an open source. Uh, we take 100 pixels from here to here and look at the uh, intensity. So the higher the intensity, the more likely it is going to be the negative. So we calibrated it. So we calibrate such that with 99.9 .9 accuracy, something that's above this threshold is considered negative. Below this threshold is considered positive. OK, now come to the most important part. So with that, we actually validated this using clinical sample. We collaborate with the Karolinska Hospital, where they take nasopharyngeal swab, put it in a transportation media, heat and activate it, and transport it to my lab. And then we, uh, um, we run the samples. It's not working perfectly for me, but we run the sample. So what I'm showing here, uh, if you focus on this one, this is the RT-PCR cycle threshold, and this is uh, the RT lamp time to positive um, signals here. So they overlap perfectly until a certain 
I'm sorry, until a certain uh, CT value, and then above a certain CT value, we're not able to detect them accurately. Uh, more important also is that uh, the negative is maintained negative, so specificity is 100%, while um, sensitivity is 96.6% until CT value 26. After CT value 26, our methods start to be less sensitive compared to a gold standard. I think I also need to reiterate here, the gold standard uses an extraction upfront, so you do a nuclear classic extraction, and then you do uh, uh, RT-PCR. Here we take a clinical sample directly from transportation media, one microliter, mix it with your lab reaction, and then run it into the machine. So uh, where can this be important? Uh, You are already recovered, which means you're not transmitting it anymore, so you can go back to the uh, society. So at this stage, you need to be isolated, stay at home, while then at this stage, probably, you are safe to, to go out. And uh, really, this is where the antigen test has been very effective. When you have the highest viral load, antigen test will detect it. And uh, so, our suggestion or proposal would be then to complement uh, antigen and PCR test with the lamp reaction, where the lamp will be able to take this between zone between very sensitive PCR and not so sensitive antigen test. All right, am I doing okay time-wise? Good. Yeah, Two minutes. Two minutes. Very good. So what, what has happened? What we've done basically is that we published our data recently, and now we're looking into, uh, into uh, increasing the sensitivity by incorporating also enrichment uh, uh, state. And uh, this is for Keisho. I'm uh, now going to be doing some other testing for the next AIBBC meeting. We've been related work that we've been working as we're looking into the variant analysis. We use rolling circuit amplification. And we also do a new method that's amplification-free nucleic acid um, uh, analysis. So very shortly about the RCA-related work, what we do is we skip the cDNA uh, part, we go directly with the RNA, we have a bitelated anchor, hybridized ligate, and then we use agarose beads to capture, amplify them, and then detect them on a flow cell. So what that gives you is it gives you to look into a variant analysis so on, a, on a single base uh, variation. The second one I want to show that's a bit exciting in our lab now is that we're looking into um, analysis of nucleic acid that does not use any enzyme whatsoever. So the way it would work, this, is, this would be fantastic for resource limiting settings. Uh, the way it would work is we have a pre-labeled uh, nucleic acid, you incubate it, you heat it up, you lower the temperature, and then insert it in the flow cell, and you can then look into your concentration of interest. Uh, this has, of course, uh, limitation in terms of how low, uh, uh, how low you can go in terms of concentration, and we're working on it. So to finalize my slides, I go back to the uh, lamp. So what we've done is uh, we are now looking into piloting this uh, uh, COVID test with several collaborating labs, and that's one of the beautiful with this uh, um, conference and this uh, group of people is that you get the chance to meet people who have like-minded and would like to pilot our method. Of course, funding, and we just recently spun out a company. The company name is Afiet. Afiet means help in Arabic. And KTH has been kind enough to support this. 
and we are also getting support from EU with regulatory related questions. So APIET, in a nutshell, simplifies or, or um, uh, highlighting the need for the, what we're doing here basically is the picture so let's help us let's uh, work together to change the story rather than to, re uh, to repeatedly comment on it and really this pandemic has shown us that we can we can be smart final words uh, the people that I'm showing here are the people that have been specifically uh, uh, working on the COVID test this is the group and I normally finish with this one if innovation collaboration is not optional anymore Alone, we are smart together, we are brilliant. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Aman Rusam, for the interesting presentation. I think we'll open the floor for questions to Professor Aman. Hi, I'm hiding behind the pillar over here. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Just quickly, um, turnaround time, how much is the throughput repetitivity for getting different things accomplished in a setting, in a point of care setting? Is the ideology screening or is it screening and then treatment? What is what is the overall consultant strategy for implementation of this technology? Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, very good question. So to start with the turnaround time, this uh, takes 30 minutes for the amplification uh, and then maybe a couple of minutes for the detection. However, in the first instance, what we're doing with the detection is we're doing an image based image analysis. So that part is still not incorporated yet. But if you would say at the final stage, this would be 5 plus uh, 30 plus 5, so which means 40 minutes. Uh, what's uh, interesting with this technology is that I was writing scalability there. So we take 18 clinical samples, one positive and one negative per disk today. And you can tailor it and shape it slightly differently, but that's roughly the capacity. Uh, so this is, we're aiming basically to the labs that would take, say, about 500 samples per day or so. That would be the target for this technology. Question for Professor Anand. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, really enjoyed the presentation. And at the end, you talked about the possibility of developing very low cost rapid tests, but you, you questioned the sensitivity and I want to ask the question, is there a place for tests that are very low cost and very cheap, but don't have low sensitivity, but immediately give you uh, a good result when someone has very high um, uh, teeter of something? Because at the end of the day, that, that may be very useful. That's a very, very uh, a good question again. 
I think what we're looking at here is we have been uh, following the PCR trend for several decades now, which can give you down to single molecule sensitivity, but uh, especially the one that I was mentioning, Hydelix, that takes 10 minutes, no amplification, but it has a limitation with, with regards to sensitivity. So there are some clinical uh, uh, situations where there is high, uh, high loads. Some of them, for instance, urinary tract infection, we're talking about thousands of bacteria. We're not talking about very few in that case. So there are some cases, and we are actively looking into uh, those cases where the uh, nucleic acid material is high, and then you don't need to do PCR or any amplification in that manner. And when we look into this uh, COVID now, uh, we're looking into tapping the gap between very sensitive and those that are rapid but not so sensitive. So there is a somewhere no man's land that you can tap into it. But of course, what you said is very important that to find those cases where you don't need to have very sensitive methods, and then 10 minutes test gives you really advantage in that case. So thank you. Last, any last question to Professor Man before we move on to the next presenter? Yes, I've always followed your work with a lot of interest. And uh, you pioneered the DVD on a, was it? Yeah. Love on a DVD. Yes. Now you've come up with a very magnificent platform. And so always, uh, the one thing that we want to bring to our part of the world is this sort of innovation, which can be very simple but very powerful, and can change the platform of the advanced And uh, maybe you might want to share your insights with the audience on how you come up with so that, that sort of innovation. Do you have a supportive uh, platform that enables you to achieve this? Or is it, uh, how, how do you advise us to kind of follow that path in the innovation of this diagnostic use? Thank you very much. I think, uh, um, in my opinion, it all started here. Uh, if you remember some of you who were my students three, four years ago, last time we actually did a platform that is operating with a mobile phone, we use a rotation and build something together. So I think uh, this type of capacity building is a very good start. And in my case, we are, our research is quite applied and we do have innovation office that support us when it comes to patenting, uh, stuff like that. So which means I think the next step here is to really look into how do you identify something that is novel, something that's unique, and then look into the uh, organizational structures to support uh, patenting. So for us, I think uh, innovation never sleeps, but you should not sleep while you accidentally invent something. Uh, most of the things we do, uh, we do it because we want to solve something, but in the context of uh, AIBBC, uh, maybe one thing to add into what we're already doing here is looking into how can we uh, capture innovations within your own organizations. So that could be something to be discussed in the following uh, AIBBC. But as far as for me, I think uh, uh, inspiration comes from here. We've been inspired to look into how can we develop technologies that are simpler and simpler and simpler. So last time I talked about Love on DVD, that's quite advanced. And now what I'm talking about is a piece of plastic, a rotor which uses from drones, and then a smartphone. So quite not so sophisticated. Okay. Um, so I have a, a quick question. I wanted to find out what your opinion is on the uptake of some of these technologies, in, especially in Africa. Um, with the uh, African Free Continental, uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement, there's talk about harmonizing all the regulatory processes so that once it is regulated in one particular country, it is easy for, for it to be sent to other parts of, of Africa. But what I also find difficult is that a lot of regulatory um, um, of bodies in, in Africa especially are very skeptical about some of these technologies. They are used to uh, paper diagnostics, rapid test kits, uh, and all of those things. 
Well, how do you think we can navigate around this uh, uh, um, regulatory hurdle when it comes to uptake of some of these new innovative products? Thank you. Thank you. Um, another very important question here. I think uh, some of the issues that we're facing is that the moment I come out with this test, the first question I will be asked is how does it compare to Cephite? Uh, those big companies that already have been in the market for a number of years. So there is this, uh, uh, as you would say, skepticism when you come with something new. Uh, the regulatory sy system also is quite uh, complex when you look into it. Uh, most of the African nations tend to look into the uh, FDA approval process or CE mark in Europe. So, and then you would come to Africa. This is something we are actually actively looking into uh, disrupting, disrupt because we want to come to Africa as priority number one. And probably one way to do it is through partnership. But uh, there is a hurdle to be, uh, and I, I think the skepticism is well, well. Uh, rooted, you need to have very good methods in the first place. So you cannot have half good and then claim it works better than anybody else's. And with that said, there must be mechanisms that you don't compare yourself with those that have a, a monopoly in the, in, the, in the market. So I keep hearing all the time when, we, when I talk about this technology, how do you compare with Cephite and or Abbott or other big corporates, Thermo Fisher, etc. So probably partnership, uh, disruptive regulatory, so you can look into can some products be developed specific for Africa, ideally by uh, Africans as well. So which means partnership looks to be a very good way to go forward. Thank you for the question. Okay, so thank you so much, Professor Aman, and uh, thank you for such a great presentation and for the insights that you've shared with us. We really appreciate it. So the next speaker will join us uh, uh, online. Uh, he's presenting from Japan, and I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Masaharu Hiratsuka, who is based at Tohoku University in Japan. So, Professor, just a minute. Uh, Professor Miratska is currently an associate professor at Graduate School of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Tohoku University in Japan. He graduated with a PhD in Pharmaceutical Sciences from Tohoku University, Japan in 1996. He moved to the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences at Tohoku University Hospital, where he started his research regarding pharmacogenomics in 1998 uh, in 2006, he attended section of pharmacogenetics, Department of Physiology and Pharmacology at Karolinska Institute. He has a guest researcher in the laboratory of Professor Magnus. His current research interests include pharmacogenomics, drug metabolism, and clinical pharmacology. So just uh, hold as I try to set uh, Professor Hiratska to give us his talk. And I think it's Thank you. Um, yes, you're very perfect, and you're good to go. We have Thank you very much. Okay. I think you record. Should I start it? Can I record your talk, sir? Yes. Okay. Thank good. you very much. Thank you. Sir Chairman, for your kind introduction. Recording in progress. Should I start it? Please start your talk. Okay, uh, I'm Dr. Masahiro Hiratsuka. Uh, I currently work at the Tohoku University in Sendai, Japan. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to participate in this interesting AIBBC conference. I will talk about our pharmacogenomics research on anti-malarial drugs. Understanding the functional characterization of C2D6 a rig variant is very important for primaking as malaria therapy. Imagine a future where we can identify a number of pharmacogenomic markers and then increase the efficacy and safety of anti-malaria drugs. Therefore, I believe that this research is very valuable. 
Today, I'd like to present the paper titled CIP2D6 Genotyping Analysis and Functional Characterization of Novel RX Variants in a Kenyan and Nibanetu population. Malaria is the most common infectious disease worldwide. It is caused by the plasmodium parasite and transmitted to humans by bites of human mosquitoes. Estimate from 2019 reported 229 million cases of malaria and 409,000 deaths. Primakine is the only licensed drug capable of treating relapsing liver stage hypnotide of plasmodium vivax PB. In addition, it is gametocytal against plasmodium falciparum PF and uh, capable of blocking transmission. Primakin is metabolized by the drug metabolizing enzyme cytochrome P450 to D6, CIP2 D6 in the human liver, resulting in the production of the number of redoxycline metabolites. Among them, 5 hydroxyprimakin is thought to be responsible for anti hypnozoid and or anti gametocyte activities. The CYP2D6 gene is highly polymorphic, with over 100 parent variants in human populations, and thus exhibit a wide spectrum of phenotypes defined as ultra rapid, extensive, intermediate, and true metabolizers. This CYP2D6 phenotypic variation suggests that the Primakin might not be equally effective among all individuals. And it was reported that the association between CYP2D6 activity and Primakin failure. CYP2D6 consists of nine enzymes. Recent studies have suggested that the impaired CYP2D6 function caused by polymorphism leads to the therapeutic failure of primakin as a radical cure for P virus malaria. Patients who experienced multiple malaria relapse were on serozygous, star 4 and star 41, and uh, 6 to D6 star 5 and a 6 gen. CYP2D6 star 4 and star 41 cause splicing defects, while the gene deletion types is CYP2D6 star 5 and CYP2D6 star 6 cause a frame shift mutation. These early variants should lead to a loss of function. Currently, there is little information on the frequency of 6 to D6 RX variants associated with the differential metabolism of 6 to D6 in malaria endemic countries such as Kenya and Vanuatu. Therefore, it is of great importance to establish an association between the drug efficacy of primatin and the genetic polymorphism of 6 to D6. Determination of genotypes and frequency of CYP2D6 in Kenya and Vanuatu and the characterization of the functional changes of CYP2D6 variant encoding proteins will be useful for malaria treatment and eradication effort. We planned two types of investigation. For the genetic analysis of CYP2D6, in Nibana 2 and Kenyan subjects, all DNA samples were provided by Professor Akira Kaneko of Osaka City University in Japan and Dr. Jesse Itaka of Mount Kenya University. 
The number of DNA samples were 278 from Vanuatu and 195 from Kenya individuals. All nine exons of c 6 gene were sequenced through standard sequencing, and the copy number variants were analyzed using specific polymerase chain reaction PCR methods. We then evaluate the functional characterization of the novel c 6 variant identified in this study by using recombinant proteins expressed in human-derived 293 FT-cells and three compounds that are typical cyp 2 d 6 substrates, namely bifurarol, dextromethorphan, and primac. Nucleotide changes such as single-type nucle nucleotide polymorphism SNPs, insertion and deletion in nine exons of cyp 2 d 6 were analyzed by conventional PCR assay and uh, SANA sequence. Copy number variation C and D, such as whole gene deletion, tandem genes, and multiplication genes of cyp 2 d 6 were analyzed from PCR assay. Here, I present the results regarding the frequency of cyp 2 d 6 phenotypes predicted by genotypes. In Banner 2 populations, the frequency of CYP2D6 intermediate and pro-metabolizers was 5.8%. In contrast, 34.9% of the Kenyan subjects were CYP2D6 intermediate and pro-metabolizers. Interestingly, the frequency of CYP2D6 pro-metabolizers in Kenyan population was higher than that in new Banea 2 uh, population. Therefore, such CYP2D6 genetic polymorphism may contribute to pre-marking failure in many Kenyan patients who have a relapse of malaria. Through DNA sequencing analysis of new Banea 2 and Kenyan subjects, we identified eight novel CYP2D6 variants with amino acid substitutions. 5 B104A, P171M, R269Q, G306R, B402L in Nibana 2 subjects, and 3 L203F, I339F, and H376R in Kenyan subjects. Next, we performed the functional analysis of the recombinant CYP2D6 variant protein expressed in mammalian 293 FT cells and three compounds, bifurado, dextromethorphan, and primakin, were used to evaluate changes in enzyme activities. Generally, recombinant proteins are easily expressed by bacterial E. coli, yeast, or a bacterovirus insect. However, we have selected mammalian 293 FT cells because we would like to evaluate changes in the functional CYP2D6 variant close to original protein status. The wild type and the variant CYP2D6 cDNA were subclone into the expression vector and transfected into 293 FT cells. After six hours of transfection, five amyloid acid, five ALA, and uh, iron ions were added as a source of him as CYP2D6 protein. The cells were incubated for 40 hour, 48 hours and then scrubbed off the dish. The cell suspension was centrifuge and the pellet was used as a microsomal fraction. Western blotting analysis 
was used to determine the expression of C2D6 variant proteins in two nice reactive cells. Carnexin, a typical microsomal protein, was used as a loading control. As you can see, all C2D6 variant protein were detected with 50 kilodalton C2D6 molecular weight with similar to bound intensity. First, CYP2D6 activity was measured using Ushuaro as a representative CYP2D6 substrate. To analyze the change in enzyme activity, the amount of its metabolites, one hydroxy was measured through HPLC fluorescence detection. Incubation time and the temperature uh, was uh, 15 minutes and uh, 37 degrees Celsius, respectively. Reactions were run at a different substrate concentration to analyze enzyme kinetics. The results confirmed that the old CYP2D6 variant showed the activity curve similar to Michael's maintain equation. In comparison to the wild type, CYP2D6.1 blue couple line, a moderate decrease in V max was seen with a 203 uh, Roshin 2 phase value and more prominent decrease with a 339 uh, isoleucine to leucine substitution. The results obtained after calculating the parameter for the enzyme Kinetics are uh, shown here. For two types of CYP2D6 variants, G306R and H376R, the amount of metabolites produced was below the detection limit, indicating a loss of function. In addition, there are five types of variants and significant decrease in intrinsic clearance compared to wild. V104A uh, is 65%, R269Q is uh, 59%, V402L 9% in one and two population, L203F 45%, and uh, I339L is 13% in Kenyan population we detected. Regarding the intrinsic clearance between bifuralol hydroxylation and uh, dextromethorphan demethylation, to assess whether there is a correlation, the ratio of each of the variants in comparison with the wild type is shown. The resulting correlation coefficient value of 0.9125 shows that the specific activities exist in the high correlation. Lastly, we, uh, we measure chip 2 d 6 activity uh, using the antimalarial premarking. The reaction temperature and the time are 37 degrees Celsius and 30 minutes respectively. The compound 5 hydroxy primakin is an unstable metabolite that is capable of redox cycling to its corresponding kinon image because this redox cycling produced hydrogen peroxide and lead to oxidative stress. It is believed to be responsible for primakine synthesis. So 5 hydroxy primakine is unstable and rapid leaks with water to form the stable 5,6 orthokinone. Thus, 5,6 orthokinone was used as a surrogate marker of the presence of 5 hydroxy primakine. We have quantified 5, 6, also known, uh, by LCMSMS. Here, the enzymatic activity upon addition of 250 micromolar primatine is shown. For G306R, the amount of the metabolite produced was below the detection limit, 
indicating a loss of function. In addition, three types of CP2D6 variant, L203F, I339L, and H376R, identified in Kenyan population, were significant decrease in primapine hydroxylation activity. Currently, we are performing ongoing experiments to obtain the kinetic parameters of primatin 5 hydroxylation activity on CP2D6 alpha variant protein. Variation in enzyme activity due to genetic polymorphism were revealed by three dimensional structural analysis of CP2D6 protein. The blue color shows primatin as a substrate. The red color shows him as an active center. And the yellow color shows the I helix. The I helix located near the him is very important for CP2D6 activity as its amino acid sequence is highly conserved in most P450 enzymes and is involved in the binding of oxygen atoms to the him. The 306 mutation is located near the hip on the IFIX with the 309th threonine being three positions behind it. The residue is well conserved in the T450 family and is a very important amino acid. In the CIP2D6 variant identified in this study, the 306 glycine is replaced by arginine. Since arginine is a bulky, basic amino acid, it may interfere with the supply of protons to him, mainly from the 309th threonine. Therefore, we assume that the enzyme activity of this variant should be lost In conclusion, we evaluated the frequency of the CYP2D6 poor and intermediate metabolizers predicted by CYP2D6 genotypes are 5.8% in Vanuatu and 34.9% in Kenyan. And also, we identified uh, six novel CYP2D6 variant proteins showing low activity in vitro recombinant CYP2D6 assay. Since CYP2D6 is an important cytochrome B450 isoform involved in the activation of primakin, these findings provide further insight into primakin array specific activity of CYP2D6 and will be clinically beneficial for malaria eradication efforts. We collaborated with Professor Akira Kaneko, Dr. Chimuai Chen, and Dr. Jesse Kitaka for CYP2D6 genotyping analysis and functional characterization of novel arnic variant in Nibana 2 and Kenyan populations by assessing dexamethorphan or denaturation activity. The paper was published last year in the journal drug metabolism and pharmacokinetics. I'd be so happy you, if you found our study interesting. By the way, I currently work at the Tohoku University in Sendai. Sendai is 350 kilometers away from Tokyo. You can go to Sendai from Tokyo within 19 minutes by blue train Shinkansen at the maximum speed of 320 km per hour. The Sendai station is here. It is especially beautiful at night. <laughs> Sendai was ruled over by the famous samurai Masamune Date 400 years ago, he was unable to see with his right eye. Sendai is famous for Masamune's 
our castle, shrine, hot springs, and beef tongue. Beef tongue is good. You might not uh, believe it, but uh, no one wears a swimsuit at the hot spring. I hope that one day I will be able to meet you all in person in Sendai or somewhere else. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor Hiratsuka, for uh, such an excellent talk and also for giving us a, a glimpse of what Sendai has to offer. I love the beef tank. <laughs> so, but, uh, yes, really great. Good. I know it's great. Uh, okay, so we will invite a couple of questions for you from the floor. If somebody has a question, please come and stand where I'm standing here so that uh, he can see you and maybe respond to your question. Any person with a question, please? Questions? I'm still waiting for any person with a question. We, um, could you come, please? Thank you. Sorry to bother you with the distance. Oh, you, thanks. Yes, it, it would be nice to stand in front so that we can see you. Yes, yes, just take the mic. Uh, good evening, sir. I know it's evening in Japan. Uh, thanks for the wonderful uh, presentation. Thank uh, you. I have one question, though. Uh, we saw that uh, in the Kenyan population, about 34.9% or so were either intermediate or poor uh, metabolizers uh, compared to the other study site. Is it Vanuta or, or, or that? I hope I pronounced it uh, correctly. Uh, as we know, uh, Prima Queen uh, is not the first line of uh, treatment in, for malaria in Kenya. I don't know from this other site uh, whether it is, but uh, don't you think that uh, because we don't use it much, probably this population has not developed uh, the, uh, the required uh, uh, metabolic pathways for this particular drug? I don't know what uh, your thought is on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a good point. Primaken, uh, you, uh, as you, uh, you mentioned, uh, Primaken is uh, the first choice uh, for the malaria in Kenya. Uh, but uh, uh, Primaken is the uh, only drug uh, licensed for the female uh, drug malaria of the, uh, the hypnotoid. So the, I believe that uh, QQD6 genotyping is uh, very important for the uh, personalized relation. Did you answer that? Yes, thank you. I think the, 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 the person is satisfied. I, okay, good. Okay. Yes, good. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have another question for you, sir. Uh, of course. Thank you very much, Professor Hiratsuka. Now, I just uh, add a uh, comment to that question. Uh, as uh, co-author of this presentation. So, as I mentioned yesterday in my speech, in my left speech, primarking is still important in African settings as transmission blocking. So, single low dose primarking, that is a old and new tool to control uh, malaria transmission in Africa for p farch param gametocyte towards malaria elimination. So that's why the, I think this chip to d 6 polymorphism is uh, uh, quite important implications uh, even also in African settings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kaneko. Uh, good comments. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank right. you. See you.
few. Okay, so next speaker, please. So we just have a small change in program. Uh, we will, uh, instead of the program reads, uh, Dr. Wataru Karai is supposed to take over, but we will switch uh, due to some uh, travel plans. We, we will have uh, Dr. Jesse Gitaka will present now. And after Jesse's talk, we will take a break because uh, Professor Nicole Palm, who is supposed to join us from Sweden, is uh, has to run her kids to the nursery right now. It's morning hours, and she cannot really be on time for the talk. So we will take a break after Jesse's talk, and then uh, we will come back at 10.40, I guess, to uh, join uh, Professor Nicole for her talk. So those are the changes in the program, and we ask for your patience, please. So just for the introduction of Okay, I think uh, we, we, we know him. I will introduce him. <laughs> it seems uh, his bio is missing from the, the long list, but I will do the introductions because, oh, you printed it. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I will be grateful. Yes, uh, we are supposed to, so it, 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 it was your turn, sorry. Sorry, I'm supposed to just connect. So the next presenter is Dr. Jesse Gitaka. So Dr. Jesse Gitaka is a physician scientist trained at the University of Nairobi, a holder of Masters of Tropical Medicine and a PhD in Medical Science from Nagasaki University, Japan. He leads a Gitaka Calab and is the founder, founding director of the Center of Malaria Elimination and the, and the Center for Research in Infectious diseases at the Mount Kenya University Thika. His experience spans clinical trials, molecular biology, and epidemiology of infectious diseases in the field-based research and implementation science. And currently, he is a principal investigator in several studies in the areas of maternal and newborn health and infectious diseases, point of care diagnostics, development, and antimicrobial resistant surveillance. He's also an affiliate of the African Academy of Science and a future leaders African Independent Researchers Fellow and a next Einstein Fellow. So welcome Dr. Jesse Gitaka to give us your presentation. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. And thank you Kennedy for inviting me to this uh, meeting. Present. So, my presentation is on the uh, development of highly sensitive molecular assays for malaria and curable STIs. And uh, uh, please join me in, uh, in this journey. Let's see what you have today. So, uh, this is a good starting point. Uh, Man, of course, uh, alluded to some of these uh, issues here. Uh, but, uh, you know, point of care diagnostic testing is medical testing at or near the point of care and at the time and place of patient care. So you need this, there's a set of uh, criteria that uh, describes the ideal rapid test, okay, the so-called assured uh, criteria. It should be affordable, sensitive, specific, user-friendly, robust and rapid, equipment-free, 
uh, and deliver for those who need it. Uh, so, however, uh, this, these aspirations are not easy to be, to be easy to meet, and um, really, the you know having the right asset is, is very essential. So, even as you you know go go on to have the kit, you need to have the biology uh, right for you to be able to to achieve some of these criteria. So my lab uh, works on uh, uh, several other things, as, as, as has been read. And um, a key theme for us is the development of these assays. And uh, we, uh, in the last uh, three, four, five years, we've been using these three, uh, three strategies, uh, deep general mining uh, based uh, PCR and isothermal assays uh, for those infections and others. Uh, immunomagnetic separation assays and crispr cas based assays. However, for today's talk, I'll really just focus on uh, uh, number one, uh, deep genome mining based assays. So, uh, I know you, uh, Professor Kaneko, gave us a very comprehensive uh, discussion on malaria and the challenge that is is ongoing on malaria, and uh, indeed, uh, malaria remains uh, a serious problem. However, uh, the good news is that the, there is a reducing burden, but uh, asymptomatic infections are becoming more prevalent, and these asymptomatic infections are providing the continuous reservoir for, uh, that provide gametocytes, which the mosquitoes pick uh, during a blood meal, and these uh, now become source of new infections to new victims. So, uh, in other words, we may not be able to eliminate or even eradicate malaria if we do not address this challenge of asymptomatic infections, which, of course, being asymptomatic, uh, patients do not seek treatment and therefore are not treated for. So uh, this has been, um, you know, this has been uh, compared with this uh, iceberg, and you can see the iceberg is really huge below the surface of the water, and that is these asymptomatic mostly submicroscopic uh, which have been proposed. You could do mass drug administration or you could do mass cleaning and treatment okay, to address this problem. However, each of these challenges, uh, each of these strategies have their challenges. So, for instance, a mass drug administration uh, has very, you can only use it in a very specific use cases as recommended by WHO. So, either in emergency outbreaks or in pre elimination settings. Um, and of course, there's always this fear of uh, MDAs leading to resistance. So, you realize that in itself, and of course, you can imagine uh, uh, you know, acceptability by communities may not be high or uniform in, in specific uh, places. Uh, the other strategy is mass screening and treatment. Uh, the challenge with this is that uh, the current uh, diagnostics are not uh, sensitive enough. So you may not be able to use uh, micros microscopy, will not give you the required sensitivity, neither will uh, uh, you know, RTG tests. Of course, you may uh, want to use PCR, but as you shall see, PCR has its own challenges. You, may, you need uh, electricity, skilled uh, manpower, uh, cold chain, and so on. And utilization of uh, the PCR machine, uh, PCR technology in the field is not usually easy. And yet, for us to really address, to, to do a, a proper MSAT, we need uh, a, a lower limit of detection, less than or equal to two parsecs per microliter. So, uh, in 2015, WHO stated that uh, a diagnostic tool that is highly sensitive, affordable, and simple enough to be operated in the field would allow for screening of the asymptomatic reservoir, which combined with treatment will be the first step toward elimination. So that just shows you the critical need for highly sensitive tests that will help in driving this uh, malaria elimination agenda. And uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, we, there's, there's a challenge with current strategies. As you can see, microscopy, you have a limit of detection of between 50 to 100 parasites per microliter. 
uh, for RGTs, this may go as, as high as 100 parsecs per microliter. So in, you can see this, this will not serve that uh, purpose. And um, of course, uh, uh, PCR is sensitive. Uh, you could use, uh, uh, you know, multi-copy genes, uh, you know, looking amplified this, and you could end up getting 0 0.02 to 10 parasites per microliter. And when you look for tandem repeat sequences, you can even go uh, slightly lower. You can go lower to 0 0.06 to 10 uh, parasites per microliter. And of course, nested PCR uh, will do even better. However, as I mentioned, the PCR the techniques have their challenges. Uh, so, we propose uh, these identical multi-repeat sequences, uh, PCR, and then also we have an equivalent of it, which is the isothermal uh, uh, IMRS. And uh, so, if you look, the traditional general mining strategies, uh, you, you know, use specific primers, and you, of course, uh, you know, align, uh, as you decide, you align specific repeats, and then you amplify uh, maybe three, four, five, um, you know, regions in the in the DNA, in the genome. And uh, as you can see, that is a bit restrictive. The the the, the new strategy, the MRS strategy, which is um, uh, you know, which allows for multiple, uh, many. Uh, you can identify many, many. Many many regions uh, in the genome, and you'll be able to you'll amplify different uh, sizes of, of, of the different regions, uh, thereby giving you a huge uh, yield, uh, amplicon yield, uh, thereby increasing uh, sensitivity. So just to illustrate that better, uh, thank you very much. Good. So this this shows uh, this cartoon here shows the the PF uh, genome uh, with 14 uh, chromosomes. And with IMRS, you can identify uh, different uh, multiple uh, regions in the whole genome that will be amplified by same, these identical polygons, these identical probes. And when you do the, uh, when you express this on the, on, on the gel, uh, when you, 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 you see that you have, you, you have different uh, products of different sizes. Okay, so you can see here we have a six to two, uh, you know, uh, amplicon product and other other sizes. You know, ranging from as low as, uh, you know, uh, different sizes, different different uh, uh, products because you are, you are amplifying different regions of different lengths in the, in the genome. When you compare this with the traditional 18s RNA where you end up with just one product, you can see that uh, here, you're ending up with a lot of yield, amplicon yield, which then uh, you, can, you can proceed to, to you know, use. So, we, so this, this, this experiment here was just trying to look at, uh, you know, serially diluting the DNA, and, and uh, uh, you, you, you find that when you let's start with the, the traditional 18s RNA, you find that uh, uh, when you get to one femtogram per microliter of the DNA, you're not able to see any signal here all the way. But when you use uh, IMRS, you are able to see products. When you use uh, zero point, when you get you dilute to 0 0.1 femtogram per microliter, you still have products. And even when you go to 0 0.01, you still have some products. Okay, so that tells you this is more sensitive, as even uh, shown by this profit analysis, where uh, the, ISO, uh, the IMRS uh, gives yields faster and earlier than the traditional uh, uh, DNS RNA. And um, the, same, the, the same set of primers can also be used for isothermal IMRS. Of course, there is, as you said, the PCR has uh, its challenges with field deployability. So we would really like to have a test that you can uh, use one temperature, uh, let's say 65 degrees Celsius, and then uh, be able to visualize your products. So looking at, uh, so we, we of course aim to have such a test. So the isothermal IMRS uh, compares very well with 18S. As you can see here, 
the, this is 18 years in blue, okay? And this is ISO IMRS. And as you can see from this uh, profit analysis, uh, it really compares very well, and you're able to amplify your products even at different concentrations uh, within 30 minutes. So this is really something that uh, is really amenable for field uh, utilization. So of course, uh, you want to, we, we, we went on to demonstrate that uh, the amplicons we are seeing on our gels uh, from, from these multiple regions which have been amplified are uh, really, uh, you know, point back to the PF genome. So this is just uh, to show that uh, we, we excised on the gels and then sequenced these uh, uh, amplicons and they really, uh, by NGS, and uh, they corresponded with uh, the predicted regions. Uh, you know, from the in silico work. So we proceeded to do visualization using uh, LFA. Remember, we, we are really aiming at the field okay, uh, deployability. We also do not want to reduce the need for people to do gel electrophoresis in the field. So an easy way really is to use uh, this uh, lateral flow assay uh, where you can, uh, of course, put your products here, and uh, this is the direction of flow, and then using uh, stop using coated gold nanoparticles, you can, of course, capture uh, on the test line, of course, and this is the test line. So you, you'll have a simple readout, uh, you know, yes or no readout here. And um, so when we did this, uh, you can see that uh, uh, if, even at lower concentrations, although this was a bit uh, stochastic, we, and we, we were able to detect uh, our, our applicants using this uh, strategy. So uh, we uh, proceeded on to look at uh, utilization, utility of ISO IMRS uh, performance on, uh, on clinical samples. I mean, how, how, how does the test do if in, the, in the real world? Uh, so we, we, we got blood samples from 19 patients. And, and then uh, did microscopy or, or RGT diagnosis. And this, of course, just tells you whether it's your plasmodium positive or plasmodium negative. And then we compare this with the uh, ISO IMRS assay. And as you can see here, uh, the ISO IMRS positive uh, one nine, okay, out, out of 10, okay. So which really is a very, very nice uh, sensitivity. And when we looked further at, at this parasite here, we noted that uh, it was non, uh, it was it was PF uh, negative, which uh, of course points to uh, it could have been a PF malaria or ovale, uh, which which are also available in our in, in our communities. And also, uh, ultimately, we want to see how does this strategy do when you use uh, non-invasive samples like uh, saliva samples. Okay, because one of the challenges you'll have in an MSAT is that uh, many people may, may complain that uh, why do you want to prick me and I'm not feeling you know, unwell. So you really want to use a test that uh, will be uh, acceptable to most people. And in this case, we, are, we think uh, if you use, let's say, a saliva sample rather than a capillary sample, this, this, this is likely to get more uh, acceptance. So. We got uh, so we, 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 we got much samples, and as you can see, the performance also is so. Uh, this these are universal plasmodium positive uh, samples, and this is uh, PF positive. Okay, so you can see the matching here is quite high. So and this uh, I saw IMRS a PF positive. So really, is strong correlation and uh, and sensitivity. So this is just a proof of concept that this assay could be successful with an invasive samples, uh, of making it more adaptable for 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 field for field use. And uh, so the next thing was uh, seeing that the, the work with this in uh, malaria, we asked ourselves, can we use this strategy for other diseases which are of uh, importance in our uh, population? So uh, I just want to. You know, talk about now the curable STIs. So as you can see, curable STIs is a, is a big problem in the whole, of the, in the whole world. Uh, Africa, we have uh, 12 million, this, this is in millions, 
12 million cases, 11 million cases of, of chlamydia, 11.4 million cases of gonorrhea. And this is really underreporting because, as I shall mention later, the, these infections are really difficult to uh, diagnose. The current strategies are quite, uh, you know, uh, they, are, they are really low, they have low sensitivity. And yet, uh, these infections uh, account for a huge uh, percentage of, of, of causative agents for adverse pregnancy outcomes, like uh, stillbirths, uh, maternal and newborn mortality, and premature deliveries. Okay, and these problems are even worse in Af uh, developing countries. And um, the current strategy, which is mainly syndromic approach, which looks at uh, secretions from the digestive tract, and or even presence or absence of ulcers, uh, have low sensitivity and specificity. And uh, of course, we could use uh, PCR uh, strategies for this, but uh, or, or even culture methods. So culture method is quite time-consuming. PCR is quite expensive and also skill-intensive, and uh, therefore we end up mis uh, m missing out on cases, and therefore uh, failure to treat, which of course means these infections continue to afflict uh, uh, mothers uh, in the population, and which leads to poor uh, maternal outcomes. So there is need for field deployable, highly sensitive point of care diagnostics to enable same-day testing and treatment. So these are the QSTs or the curable STIs, Neisseria gonorrhea, Clavidia trachomatis, Trichomonas vaginalis, and Troponema pallida, which of course uh, causes syphilis. And uh, just to jog your memory again, this is the conventional, so this is looking at a bacteria genome, for example, which just has one chromosome. Uh, this, is the, this is how a, a conventional, uh, you know, uh, you know, conventional probes work. They, they will amplify a particular region. Yeah, or, or even if you have a repeat, just maybe two, two, two regions of the genome. However, if you use IS, uh, IMRS, you're able to amplify at multiple regions uh, in the genome, and therefore have a higher amplicon yield. Uh, and also, uh, we j I'll just throw in some data on uh, TB, which we know is a big challenge in this part of the world, and, uh, and, and maybe just report some progress on this as well. So, just to give you an Example of uh, this is um, IMRS primers for Neisseria gonorrhea, and you can see we were able to uh, you know predict 16 regions in the genome of uh, interestingly same size. Okay, so you are able to amplify at, at different regions of the genome, and when you look at this gel, sorry, you may not be able to see this properly, but you can see here that uh, if you take the 16 sRNA, you can see that the signal you are losing the signal as the concentration goes you know, lower quite early compared to the IMRS strategy, which of course alludes to uh, increased uh, sensitivity of the strategy. And uh, so we, this is this, this, this just uh, you know, a numerical expression of that phenomenon where you can see with IMRS, you're able to really go to very low uh, dilutions of uh, DNA per microliter and compared to the conventional. And even though at lower uh, lower concentrations, you, you really, the application is a bit uh, stochastic. You can see, of course, the performance is far much better compared to the conventional strategy. Okay. The, the same applies, uh, sorry, so the same applies for the others. And uh, so that's just an example of, of Nisera gonorrhea. So we've seen the same phenomena for Treponema pallida, where we had four regions amplified, and you can see the difference in the lower limit of detection is, is, is really uh, the different, the factor is high. Same for T vaginalis, Glamidia uh, trachomatis, and tuberculosis as well. So the next uh, summary, in summary, uh, this malaria, uh, PCR, and ISO, IMRS assay of highest sensitivity and specificity, but we need to do further validation of the clinical samples. And uh, for the QSTs, we are aiming at uh, doing more uh, you know, uh, experiments to enhance field deployability. So I'd like to stop at that point and uh, really acknowledge uh, all these members who have really done most of the work, and uh, my, team, my team from MKU, and of course our funders, 
And um, you, I really like to invite you to look at our posters. Uh, we have posters by our team members. And we are hiring. We have a position for one postdoc uh, in biomedical engineering and two PhD positions. So you can write, write to us as, and, and uh, we could discuss this further. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nitaka, for the interesting presentation. So any questions for... Thank you, Dr. Itaka, for the wonderful presentation. Now, I'm just wondering, among these uh, symptomatic infections that are the possibility of harboring drug resistance, now, do you, did you by any chance have the uh, opportunity to find out the most, uh, the most uh, dominant genes, these resistant genes, and their possibility of being transferred to other organisms? among the asymptomatic cases? Uh, so, yeah, I think you, you're asking about um, the presence of resistant genes. Uh, did I get you right? Exactly. Yeah, the resistant genes among the symptomatic infections and the possibility of their transfer to other organisms. Okay. So, yeah, we have, we have done uh, work of that nature, but uh, this, this work really is that, that is not the scope of this work. For us, we are just looking at, uh, uh, you know, the sensitivity of diagnostics and trying to develop an assay that is highly sensitive. We, at this point, we really are not looking at uh, whether these are able to capture uh, resistant parasites or not. But it's a good idea. We could, we could maybe think of follow-up work on that line. Thank you. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Thanks for a wonderful presentation. I have a general question. Having worked in Kenya for many years and also done work in South America, when we think about asymptomatic infections, the, the two landscapes are very different, number one. When I think about Kenya and an asymptomatic infection, I think about the level of immunity in that particular community. So when you're looking at asymptomatic infections, and we're thinking about a highly transmissible region, a holoendemic region, isn't it important in some ways what the level of parasitemia is that can be sustained in that individual but yet remain clinically asymptomatic? Have you looked at any of those thresholds? So for example, if there are adults that have really low levels of parasitemia and they're asymptomatic, stoichiometric, you know, stoichiometrics would say if a mosquito takes a bite, what is the probability in that blood meal of picking up a parasite if the parasitemia is really, really low? And the reason I say that is because that is the context in many countries in South America. So when they did a good job with malaria, they said, oh, in order to finally eradicate it, we need to go after asymptomatic malaria. And the funny thing is, setting on those panels, you have to amplify the heck out of <laughs> any blood that you get to even find the trace of the parasite. And so I once asked him, and it wasn't popular, hey, you know, places like Kenya, Sub-Saharan Africa in general, you can tolerate a higher level of parasitemia and be asymptomatic. It's probably important there. But in your context, if we have to use a bunch of gene jockeying to even pick it up, do you really think that the parasite is being transmitted from the mosquito at those really low probabilistic mathematic rates of picking up and transmitting. So what levels, what thresholds do you see? It should be regionally different. So in a high transmission region, do individuals, I have no idea, that's why I'm asking, it's super interesting. Do they have a relatively high level of parasitemia that could be transmissible, but yet remain clinically asymptomatic? And thanks for the beautiful work. Thank you very much. Yeah, maybe to even um, a bit more, you know, make your question more complicated a bit. Uh, there's uh, this uh, observation that uh, low virulence phenotypes are now becoming more predominant. So they are able to, you have uh, slightly higher, higher parasitemias that will not lead you to, you know, to have symptoms. And yet, they continue to provide uh, to, to generate gametocytes, which now the mosquitoes pick. So it's, a, it's really, um, you know, a, an evolving situation here. But again, that, that's even more the rationale why we should 
I, I, you know, pay much developing highly sensitive tools to pick even the smallest, uh, you know, parasitic. What level of, in, in a high transmission region, what level of parasitemia do you see in the person that's clinically asymptomatic? Is it super low? Is it more like the other parasites that are more common? Or is it pretty high Oh, of course, this is variable. This is variable in the population. So, of course, the adults who have been having these infections for many, many years, I mean, for let's say 20, 30 years, will, of course, uh, they may be able to write a higher uh, parasitemia compared to, let's say, a child. Okay, but uh, again, remember, through conventional strategies, the, you don't pick these uh, parasites. Okay, uh, I have a comment, and uh, uh, I bet thank you a wonderful presentation. Then uh, my comment is about the uh, point of care test. And yesterday, I also presented about point of care test, and then uh, uh, several uh, other uh, uh, speakers also presented, and then uh, very wonderful works. And then, uh, of course, uh, we should think about the advantage and disadvantage, a weak point of the point of care, like uh, the some, uh, somehow the space, uh, sensitivity might be lower, like that. and then uh, also the, like, uh, the qualitative, not quantitative, those limitations. Then uh, uh, we should uh, we should not try to replace the uh, point of care test uh, instead of other sophisticated test. We should think that the point of care point of care test should be the in a local or a clinical setting. Then uh, uh, if it become negative, then but uh, still have a uh, uh, symptom or po some possibility better to. Uh, take the sample to the uh, provincial level or the central government level uh, the diagnostic lab so that you will not miss the case. Because uh, I, s I read the newspaper several years ago in Kenya that the uh, HIV positive case was diagnosed by a point of care. Then it was turned out positive. So that person uh, uh, the sued the, the company the I had I lost the chance to treat because of the false negative result. Okay, so the uh, we should not we uh, the, work, the scientists working on these uh, diagnostics uh, maybe not, not focus on the uh, the how to say the simple test but uh, as a, mm, how to say disease control of this country we better to have uh, several different uh, type of good test. Means uh, uh, the in clinical or peripheral, the easy test, like POC test. But uh, uh, the province or central level, the highly sophisticated test, like uh, uh, the real-time PCR. Now the national level, the we are using, isn't it, in Kenya, right? So no need to just focus on POC, but uh, uh, the also uh, the, how to say, mix with uh, the complicated test. Yes, I, I agree. Uh, POC tests, uh, centralized tests, you know, big lab tests uh, have their place. Uh, but you see, we have to be cognizant of the realities on the ground. Uh, I mean, in Africa, most of Africa, you have, uh, you know, very huge distances between the central lab, big lab, and, and where the people are living. Uh, I mean, the Kenya situation is slightly maybe better, but think about places like Tanzania or Niger or, or these, you know, huge countries where uh, before somebody is able to come to the central lab, is, it costs a lot, it takes more time, the roads are not great. So I think there's need for highly sensitive, field deployable point of care tests. So, uh, but of course, the, we, we are not saying that uh, we, we, we have to replace, you know, the central lab tests. Thank you, Dr. Gitaka. Please let's clap for Dr. Gitaka. So we'll take the break and then come back for Professor Pame. But I have two uh, announcements. Somebody lost their spectacles yesterday. So if it's yours, kindly check at the reception so that you get it back. And then those people who did the molecular and diagnostic track, kindly sign at the reception desk. So thank you. Let's have the short break. Uh, uh, please, uh, the time to come back after the short breaks.
We are running late by almost 15 minutes already, so please uh, take your tea quickly. The short break is very short. We go, we have to be back here uh, in the next, if you will allow me to say this, in the next 10 minutes. <laughs> so please, please, come back. Enjoy your tea very quickly and uh, come back. Transition <laughs> from So thank you, welcome back after the short break. Uh, I'm sorry we, we have to rush a little bit to catch up with time. We are already running 30 minutes late. So our next speaker will be Professor Nicole, who is joining us from Sweden. And we have the pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Nicole to share her insights with us. As I get ready to do a grand introduction, just hold. And, uh, the speaker, uh, we have, or oh, we will play for you some video message from the speaker who will join us from Japan. Uh, the manage, one of our sponsors will be join, uh, joining from Japan, so we will give you the, the details later. Uh, oops. I don't know whether we will have time to paint in this video presentation. Just a minute, as I try to get some call. She holds a chair in analytical chemistry at Stockholm University in Sweden, as well as a visiting professorship at the University of Hull. Uh, her research activities focus on lab on a chip devices for pharmaceutical, clinical, and en environmental analysis, biomedical research with tissue on a chip devices, as well as process integration and material synthesis in collaboration with chemistry, engineering, and biomedical sciences. This has included several projects with researchers in low and middle income countries. She has authored over 150 peer reviewed publications, patents, and book chapters. She has chaired the co chaired the Microtask 2016 conference in Dublin and served as the president of the Chemical and Biological Microsystem Society. She is also an associate editor for the Analyst which is uh, RSC Publishing. And uh, Nicole obtained a diploma in chemistry from the University of Marburg in Germany in 1999. For her PhD study, she went to the Imperial College London, where she joined the group of Professor Andreas. Uh, it was here that she started working on microfluidics and the single particle analysis, including inside microfluidic channels. 
So today she will be talking to us uh, about her work on uh, microfluidics devices, devices for analysis in resource limited settings. So please, uh, Professor Nicole, uh, uh, it, it is your time to take the podium, and I think we are set to go. Can you record? In fact. Uh, would, would you allow us to record? It's already going on, please. Yes, absolutely, that's fine. There's okay, nothing, nothing too secretive in here. All right, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you, Kennedy, for, um, for the really nice introduction. Yeah, as you, as you uh, mentioned, I've just uh, moved my, uh, my work to, to uh, Stockholm University. So I'm talking uh, to you from, from this uh, building you, you see here on the, uh, on the top right-hand side. Uh, so I just moved here during the summer, and, and, and um, the bulk of my academic career I have spent uh, so far at the University of Hull, which is um, in England, in the in the UK, not far from uh, from Leeds and and York. And um, I've I've built up a team there. And you can see a sort of photograph of the team uh, from from the summertime over the last um, over the last 15 years or so. And um, you might recognize Paul and Pablo who are who are with you at the conference. And the work I'm showing today. Uh, there's also uh, a lot of work from Samantha Richardson, uh, who you see here in the front. So the, the research topics in our groups really largely center around a microfluidic or lab on a chip device. And I know you've heard um, a couple of presentations of these already at the conferences. So we are designing and making these devices with small channels in our own uh, laboratory and then we use them for a range of different uh, projects for example for environmental analysis on site or clinical diagnostics at the point of care we also work a bit with organ on the chip systems and uh, not so relevant to this audience also some chemical synthesis so for the presentation today i wanted to focus on projects where we have designed workflows uh, to function in resource limited settings. So I'll give a little bit of um, background there and then I want to show uh, two examples. One where we do pathogen analysis with a platform that we call iFAST and another one where we use a paper microfluidics as a tool for uh, chemical sensing in the, the using members of the general public, uh, what we sometimes also call citizen science. So if we think about um, analysis, and I'm sure you've heard this at the conference a couple of times, an analytical workflow typically includes taking a sample uh, on the site and then transporting it to a laboratory where it is analyzed. And uh, depending on, on the process, this may take uh, several days. And there's always this um, ideal utopian scenario where we would like to be able to analyze directly at the point of care, at the point of need, to avoid the transport to the laboratory, where we want to have a fast answer so we can get real-time measurements, give the medicine the prescription straight away, or where we can have high-frequency measurements to get a lot of data points to understand for far more about our system. We want to work with our complex samples straight away, the sort of sample in answer out, um, the concept that I know Aman has presented uh, earlier as well. And if we can automate, uh, that can also bring a lot of advantages. In the context of, of working with uh, lower and middle income countries, the uh, World Health Organization is also advocating these assured criteria. Uh, or there are various versions of it, such as reassured. Um, but um, uh, so essentially, we, we need to have our devices affordable, sensitive, specific, user friendly, rapid, robust, equipment free, so that we don't need a lot of peripheral equipment and deliverable to end users. So that's kind of the sort of dream scenario, and such devices or systems rarely exist. Uh, but the concept of working with laboratory on a chip or microfluidic devices has potential in this area of research. So this is all about shrinking down the liquid handling to channels that uh, tend to be on the micrometer scale, so smaller than millimeter scales. And because we have short distances, that means uh, diffusion times are short, incubation times are short, we have the possibility to integrate many processes on a relatively small uh, footprint that um, might also be 
um, a portable device in some cases. And indeed, people have done research in this area for the last 20 years or so, and there are a lot of approaches that have already been published. Some of them are commercial, some of them are more in the, in the literature domain. So centrifugal microfluidic platforms are, are one uh, quite elegant way of, of integrating um, analytical workflows on the devices. And I think Aman showed a centrifugal a system a little bit earlier today. Here are a couple of examples of relatively complex channel architectures where multi-step analytical processes are integrated on one device for sort of a sample in, answer out um, type approach. And then um, here is an example at the top right of uh, John Cooper's group from the University of Glasgow, where they are, have developed sort of paper-based, almost origami folding systems. And this is for malaria analysis that has been tested um, with collaborators in Uganda. So there is a big toolbox that we can draw from when we want to design a microfluidic workflow in terms of how we want to control the flow, um, how we want to store our reagents, how we might want to do the detection. Do we do relatively low tech just with the human eye? Do we do electronic or fluorescence or maybe absorbance detection? And and then there are also many ways by which we can uh, prepare our sample through various filtering steps or sample preparation steps. And when we want to start a project, that we have all this toolbox and something that's great for one step of the work process might not be so great for the next one. And something that would be perfect might be too costly for the application we are after. So when we are developing such microfluidic devices, there is always this sort of compromise uh, between optimize and, and uh, a compromise what we want to do. And another thing that's really important to consider is we tend to use the word uh, point of care quite frequently, but it means different things to different people in different contexts. So for some people, the point of care might be a laboratory that's located inside a hospital, or it might be the GP practice, or it might be uh, in, in the context of Africa, maybe a regional clinic, or there are also remote clinics, and then also there is home diagnostics that uh, people might want to do. So depending on the test and depending on the setting, there will be different requirements for speed versus performance. Do we have trained operators, like does a, a staff member in a hospital, or does it um, really need to be very simple to operate so that a member of the general public can use the system? What is an acceptable cost? What infrastructure have we got? Have we got a, a cooling chain? Is there going to be dust? What are, what are the uh, opportunities to keep things sterile? So these are all important questions we have to ask ourselves when we start on a project. So for the presentation today, which is about 20, 25 minutes, I've just picked uh, two examples um, that I wanted to share with you. The first one is about these IFAS devices, and then uh, we talk about the paper microfluidics uh, in the context of citizen science. So let's start with these IFAS devices. So we first um, started working with these in a project with uh, Kevin Land at CSIR in Pretoria in South Africa. And um, there we had uh, funding to, to look at uh, pathogens in drinking water. So we looked at um, E. coli as, as an indicative bacterium, and there are certain levels there uh, for, the, for the E. coli. And this is checked routinely um, in, in the South African um, uh, water testing laboratories, and the method they use is uh, this sort of membrane filtration system where the water that is brought to the laboratory from, uh, from, from the various sampling points is poured into a filter, the pathogens stick to the filter, and then they are cultured um, on, on this membrane. So this is relatively cheap to do, but it takes um, a significant amount of time, and, and, and uh, including the transport of the uh, sample to the laboratory often several days passed. There is a faster system available, this sort of pouch-based collilaire system um, with, with a reagent kit, and that gives a reading for total coliforms as well as E. coli, but it still takes about a day and, and is relatively expensive, so this cannot really be used for routine analysis. 
So at the start of our project, we discussed a lot about this toolbox, which approach uh, shall we go for, what, what kind of uh, pumping do we want to use, what, uh, what is okay for uh, a manual operation, what needs to be automated, and so on. So the system we decided on is, is this platform that's called Emissible Filtration Assisted by Surface Tension, or IFAS. This was um, first developed by, by um, David Bees group in, in the United States. But what we have here are several pots, several chambers that are filled with oil and water. The oil and water are always next to each other. And these chambers are connected through a little gate, a micrometer-sized gate at the bottom. And then in our first chamber, which is relatively big, we put our sample, so this would be our wastewater sample, together with some magnetic particles that have um, an anti coli antibody on them. And then we can mix the particles with the, with the wastewater, the particles will capture the E. coli, and then we can pull the E. coli cells through the different oil wash chambers into a final chamber. So this is a relatively swift and fast process um, that allows us to do a, a mixing and extraction and then a downstream readout in, in, in one uh, simple design. So it's quite a versatile platform where, where we can do multiple steps. So in this uh, first project uh, where, we, um, where we use this IFAST platform, as I said, it was for the uh, capture of E. coli. So we had about a half a milliliter or milliliter chamber here, and the magnetic particles would specifically capture the E. coli cells. And then in the final chamber here, we have reagents to carry out an ATP assay, which is a luminescence assay that is not specific. It detects any ATP, which is present in any cell, but it is quite sensitive. So we are combining the specificity of the IFAST concept with a relatively sensitive assay. Um, so Paul, who was working on this, uh, tried this first in, in, the, in our laboratory, and we did get um, quite good capture efficiencies and also um, acceptable readouts. They are not quite at the limits required, but, uh, but at least getting near at least the waste for, uh, water limits um, for, for the E. coli. And then we also tried to do uh, these experiments uh, together with the collaborators in um, uh, uh, Pretoria, and um, I, I'm sure that uh, to this audience, the sort of challenges we, we have been facing there are quite familiar. So often, when when we work with uh, uh, groups in the lower and middle income countries, it surprises us how long it takes to get reagents ordered. This can be a really frustrating and uh, and drawn out process. And of course, there were also some some issues with um, with knowledge transfer and, and um, explaining from one person to the next uh, how how the process worked. So we did get um, we did get some data there uh, for the for the limited time we had for joint experiments. Um, but I don't want to go into too much detail uh, for those. I just wanted to sort of show you how we have used this same concept also for a lot of other types of analysis. So in, in a collaboration with Manchester University, we have looked at um, Helicobacter pylori in fecal samples, again with the magnetic particles pulling out the DNA and then uh, extracting the DNA for downstream uh, PCR. And then with uh, Jesse Gitaka's group at Mount Kenya University, who has just spoken uh, before me, we have looked at uh, pathogen extraction um, from urine sample to analyze a GBS in the context of maternal health. And I, I have a couple of slides just to show you how we've also used this platform for RNA extraction um, these last few months. And um, uh, Paul and Pablo will, will both talk about this in a little bit more detail later in the conference. So as I said, it's possible to, um, to integrate a lot of steps into, into these platforms. So here you see a device that has uh, nine chambers. And um, we, we would put our, our SARS-COVID RNA into this first chamber together with magnetic particles that have oligo-DT on the surface. And then again, capture the particles, move them with a magnet into a final chamber where we carry out a lamp assay. Uh, so the, um, again, you, you've seen those assays earlier. And then there is a color change 
that uh, can be read out. So you see a photo of the device, and I hope the video will play. You should be able to see the sort of movement of the brown magnetic particles through these um, different gates. The blue is the water, and the, the, the yellow is the, is the oil. So these are just, um, uh, this is just a, a food dye in the sample. It's, it's not the real setting. And, and um, for our chip material, we first started working with PDMS devices. Uh, but we have more recently moved to a PMMA devices um, for performance reasons and also for, for, for cost reasons. So uh, to do this um, workflow process, we, we don't need a lot of high-tech equipment. So we need some pipettes, the little chip device, a few liquids, and then we do the amplification just on a, on a relatively standard a block reader, um, a block heater, and then uh, this can be read out um, really by eye. But we haven't tested this with um, clinical samples yet, because in our laboratory in the UK, uh, we can't work with um, with a real COVID sample, so, so we are just starting to, um, to work with samples uh, in, in Kenya um, to, to try this, uh, this in the clinical context. And then um, uh, Pablo, who's another member in my group, has also been using this platform to extract, amplify, and detect DNA from uh, gonorrhea, which again falls into the, the context of the uh, sexually transmitted uh, infection analysis. And again, it's a very similar chip device. And here you see a sort of a photo of this sort of interface between the oil and um, the aqueous lamp mixture. And there are some indicative uh, results that show that this works in principle. And he can uh, talk about this a little bit more in detail later. So in the remaining time, I have I wanted to sort of switch gear a bit, talk about um, the paper microfluidic platforms in the context of citizen science applications. So citizen science is a sort of a concept where measurements are carried out or data is collected by members of the general public. And this is great because it engages people in science. Science doesn't seem, feel to be such a distant thing for people, and it also allows us as scientists to really collect a lot of data because we can't send an expensive scientist into the field continuously to collect data. So most citizen science projects so far have focused more on observation by eye, looking at things in nature, maybe taking some photographs of trees, of leaves, of insects, um, or also in the context of astronomy, there is relatively little out there in terms of chemical, let alone biological measurements. So when I applied for my job here in Sweden, I found uh, this example here of um, otter sightings in Sweden. So uh, members of the general public are reporting if there are single otters or two otters or tracks of otters, and then these sightings can be, can be plotted into, into a map like this. So it would be really great if we can collect data like this also um, of chemical or, or, um, or, or, or clinical samples. So we started working with this in, in the context of a European Union funded uh, project. And this was all about uh, water quality. So it was about assessing and treating and preventing contamination of waters. And with this European project, we have different members, so there were um, the participants from the UK, but also from Germany and uh, from the Netherlands. And as part of this project, uh, we, had, we had one block that was about developing such a dipstick test that members of the public could go out and do measurements, and uh, we could use this as a starting point to talk with them about the water quality. So in this context, we settled for the paper microfluidic devices. And I, I guess Chuck will have um, explained a lot about the advantages they have. We don't need any pumps. They are cheap. Um, they are white in color, so we can take some photographs. They are thin and lightweight. And uh, they can also be disposed of by burning. Uh, so many people advocate these as quite an ideal matrix in resource-limited settings. 
And we usually control the flow in the paper by putting a barrier, some sort of um, a wax or, or other hydrophobic material. And there are a few examples here where you see different geometries, different um, ways in, in which we can carry out reactions on these paper devices, sometimes just in circles, sometimes there is flow, or sometimes there are origami folding appro approaches to integrate different, different uh, process steps. So our uh, citizen um, engagement uh, pets, uh, paper analytical devices, pets, are shown on this photograph here. We started um, this work with analyzing phosphate that's relatively easy to detect. And there is um, a color changing reaction already used. So, um, so you mix the sample with a few reagents and then it turns blue. It's a two-step reaction. It requires some aggressive acids and, and, and takes a little bit of time and is normally done in um, a UV vis spectrometer. So this is not really suitable to, to let somebody do in the field. But we tried to convert this onto this paper platform where essentially we are loading the reagents onto this, this piece of paper and um, then we are sealing the paper in, in a kind of a laminated pouch in, 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 with a sort of a plastic layer so the reagents are secure and safe. And then we just cut some entry slits at the back of this paper device so the water can come in when we need it. So essentially, uh, a sample would be taken at the, at, at the site and then uh, our paper device would just be placed on top of the sample and the liquid will soak in and then we have an app where the uh, users can then um, uh, take a photograph and um, report, report the results. And here you see a couple of examples where members of the general public volunteers that have been trained have gone out and taken measurements. The accuracy is kind of more semi-quantitative but it sort of works well enough in the, um, in the sort of concentration range that we are interested in. And here you see such a map where, where members of the general public in the UK and also in the, in, in the Netherlands and uh, Belgium have gone out and taken measurements. So they are on this sort of um, public map and there was about 350 results um, up there already. But when we work with members of the general public like this, um, there were always challenges, and it, it's quite interesting sometimes when we do this transfer. So our volunteers were often slightly older people that um, had a little bit of difficulty getting used to the app. So we had to really try to explain our, our workflow and, and the app, um, and not too much in a scientific language, but really in, in a language that, that people can easily understand. Um, and also the image capture has some challenges, especially when there is sunlight. So we have to make sure <clears throat> that the image is taken um, with, a, with a shadow on it to have relatively equal lighting. So we are using similar concepts also for uh, pollutant analysis with heavy metals or with pharmaceuticals. And also uh, more recently looking at, at soil analysis, so phosphate, nitrates, pH, and so on. And over the summer, we did have um, a project with farmers in, in Kenya who have been using these devices. So you see uh, a few examples there. And uh, we are also working on, on pre-concentration to, to access lower limits of detection. So to compare and contrast these two different approaches, the IFAS system is quite nice for integrating lots of different steps. We can pre-store the agents, but they have to be sort of freeze-dried um, uh, or lyophilized and, and, and put onto the system. This is not an automated platform, but that was okay because we wanted members in the hospital to use this. So it does require pipetting of liquid, but it doesn't require a machine as such. So we can agitate and just move with a small permanent magnet, uh, um, move the particles along. So this works relatively okay in a, in a hospital scenario, whereas the paper devices to integrate a lot of workflow steps is a bit more challenging there. The origami can help with that. The pre-storing of the reagents is relatively straightforward. You just pipette them on and let them dry in. Um, there are no pumps required. They are easy to operate. You just dip them into the water. And the smartphone image is really an ideal detector when working with a member 
with members of the general public because everybody has a smartphone already and usually can download an app. So that brings me to the end of the presentation. There were just a few acknowledgements here and thank you very much for listening. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for such that illuminating talk. So we have, uh, we will open the floor for a couple of questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please come in front so that uh, Professor Nicole can see you. Uh, if you don't mind, come in. Somebody with a question, <laughs> please. Okay. We have a question here for you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, in, when you have sort of population uh, helping to bring science together, uh, how do you manage the data so that the, um, you have a good understanding of what is um, um, acceptable limits and what is not? And uh, how do you make sure that some of the data that may be um, inappropriate or wrong or collected incorrectly uh, gets uh, managed in the system. Thank you. Yes, this is a very, very important um, question. Oh, sorry, I'm just, um, I wanted to go back to the slide, but it's done something funny. It's been a second. Um, so in the work that we have done, um, the, the user takes a photograph with the app and we don't, the app does not tell the user a result at the moment. So this could be desirable where the app does the image analysis straight away, but uh, it, that then poses all the challenges that you have just um, outlined. How do we know it's, it's, it, it's a usable data fault and we don't want members of the public to, to go out and, and claim there are high levels of something when, when actually they aren't. So in, in this particular scenario, in this project, it was managed such that the users would take the photograph and we have just reported the sort of levels as high concentration, medium concentration or low concentration or none detected. So we've even stepped away from saying it's so many, it, it's one PPM, five PPM or 10 PPM. We've just classified it as, as high, medium and, and low and we called it as a sort of um, a medium, but, uh, um, it, 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 just with a kind of a, like, like a color spot um, on these apps. Users are very keen to have an answer straight away um, so there are a lot of communications and, and also when we want to work with the farmers, the farmer obviously wants to know what is my nitrate level, what is my phosphate level, how much fertilizer do I need to give. But as scientists we have to be very careful and, and, and have to uh, optimize our, um, our image analysis and, um, and, and, and reporting of the data such that, that we are confident enough. So at the minute we are not quite there yet and, and I much prefer having the back-end analysis to start with. And I think that will be needed, some sort of quality control is needed and putting things directly on a map can be quite dangerous, I think, in a, in a sort of political sense. All right. So. Uh, if there's any other burning question? If not, I, I want to th say thank you once again to Professor Nicole. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you. So, Thanks for having hope, me. Yes, I hope you will stay tuned. And I know you have um, many collaborators here in the, in the audience, and uh, including Professor okay, Dr. Jesse is around. So thank you so much, and uh, stay well in Sweden. Thank you. Bye -bye. So uh, with that, I think we're going to move on to the next session. And I, I hope the session chairs are around to take over for us. So the next session should be the young investigators, or early careers, investigators investigator session. And uh, Dawn, are you ready with your team? Okay. Okay.
Okay, so the, uh, just a, a slight change in the program. I'm still waiting for the video letter from the from our sponsor, Hitachi. The general manager is working on the video and it should be arriving anytime soon. You see in the program we have a 15 minute presentation by Hitachi. Uh, that should come in. Uh, we will try to slot in that presentation at a later time. So for now we will move on straight to the uh, Young Investigators Award, oh, not award, sorry, the, <laughs> the Ali Career uh, Investigators presentation. And uh, also here we have some pro uh, program change. Uh, I will just slightly, we have one. So we, we have some, two will join us online. The rest, I hope, are here with us. And if you look at the program, their names are there on the program. But we have a sudden translation. So number top number eight will be given by Dr. Hossein. I think uh, I already communicated with him. So he has that chance. He will take that slot. So uh, if uh, we can have our first speaker, Tamu, uh, please, if you're in the crowd, uh, follow me that order. And uh, top number five, she is in Texas, and she requested, it's 3 a.m. in Texas, she requested our talk to be the last, so we will make some ad adjustments in the program. She's in Texas, she will join us from Texas. And uh, Emeka is already on standby, we will have uh, his talk. And the rest of the team should be good to go. The first presentation, Pablo, please. Okay, so hi everyone, good morning. My name is Pablo. I'm a final year PhD student at the University of Hull in the UK, uh, at Professor Nicole Palm's group. And I would like to thank the LBBC conference organizers for giving me the opportunity to present this work. And the work consists in the development of a platform, an integrated platform for extraction, amplification, and detection of Neisseria gonorrhea DNA. So gonorrhea is a curable sexually transmitted infection that is caused by Neisseria gonorrhea uh, bacteria. And there were 87 million new infections reported in 2016 worldwide. And in this map, you can see the estimated incident cases by thousands. And one of the regions with the highest incidence was the WHO African region. Around 50% of gonorrhea infections are asymptomatic However, if left untreated, uh, gonorrhea can lead to complications such as pelvic inflammatory disease, ectopic pregnancy, and infertility, and also increase the risk for HIV. 
Additionally, during the last decades, the gonorrhea has been developing antimicrobial resistance to almost all antibiotics. And in 2019, a report from the CDC classified this drug resistance Neisseria gonorrhea one of the top five urgent threats for antimicrobial resistance. Therefore, a timely diagnosis through routine screening is key. Um, among the current diagnostics, there are many three types. We have microbial culturing, antigen detection, and nucleic acid amplification tests. Microbial culturing used to be the standard methods because they are sensitive and specific. However, they are also time consuming, technically demanding, and they can be to a few days for a result. Um, the WHO, although it uh, recommends uh, microbial culturing for monitoring the drug resistance development of gonorrhea. Then we have antigen detection tests, such as lateral flow platforms. These are excellent for community testing purposes because they are quick and specific. However, they, use to, uh, they usually have lower sensitivities, which can lead to false uh, negatives. And they are relatively equipment free, and in some cases, um, tests need a centrifugation step of the urine in order to reconcentrate enough pathogens to be detected. And finally, we have nucleic acid amplification tests, uh, such as quantitative PCR. This is the gold standard test because they have excellent sensitivity and specificity. And for this type of test, uh, usually you require a sample preparation step. So the cells need to be lysed and the DNA needs to be extracted. And in these types of machines, they can be already automated, these steps, and then they require less hands-on time. And the most modern machines can do this in a one and a half hours. However, these are uh, very expensive pieces of equipment. They usually work with cartridges, which can also be expensive. And then if you need uh, maintenance or any repairs, it's also going to be uh, expensive. Th this leads to um, the availability is mainly to big and centralized laboratories and they are not so readily available in low and middle income countries or resource limited settings. So we wanted to tackle some of these issues with nucleic acid amplification tests and we have been developing a small platform that integrates uh, steps of DNA extraction, amplification and detection. And Nicole has mentioned this platform a bit before, but it makes, basically combines two concepts. One is uh, what we call this microscale immiscible filtration, and this is to do the extraction step. And then we, we perform a colorimetric isothermal amplification in order to combine two steps of amplification and detection in a single uh, reaction. So this platform consists of a series of chambers, and these chambers contain aqueous solutions and oil, and they are connected by these shallow and narrow gates. And so we use the immiscible nature of, the, of these liquids can be used to separate and purify analytes of interest. And here we use silica paramagnetic particles to capture uh, Neisseria gonorrhea DNA on the first chamber. And then uh, by using an external magnet, we can just track the captured DNA with the paramagnetic particles and separate them from the sample matrix. And then on a final chamber, we can do an isothermal amplification. And we use a colorimetric test because then it's easy for the reader, we just we don't need another a platform to detect. And it changes from, from pink to yellow when amplification takes place, and otherwise it stays pink. And on the top right image, you can see a microscope from the, a microscope photo for the last chamber, for the lamp chamber, and you can see, hopefully you can see the pink, which is the lamp substrate, and then the paramagnetic particles in the corner, and you can also see the interface with the mineral oil. And this interface is stable, even at 65 degrees that we need for amplification. So we first decided to evaluate the detection of our colorimetric lamp assay uh, using tubes. And panel A shows the sensitivity of the assay. Number one is a non template control, and it stays pink. And we don't have amplification when we run on an agarose gel. And because this, um, the nature of this isothermal method, we have these ladder-like patterns on the gel. And then number two to number six are serial dilutions of Neisseria gonorrhea DNA. And we can detect up to 50 copies after 30 minutes amplification. Then on um, panel B, we were testing the specificity of our primers. And again, number one is an untampered control. Number two is a positive control with Neisseria gonorrhea DNA. And then number three to number seven are different concentrations of other common DNAs 
from other common as, uh, sexually transmitted infections, such as chlamydia, trichomatis, trichomonas vaginalis, and trichomonas pallidum. And you can see that three to seven, they uh, did not cross-react with our primers. And so the primers are specific to Nicaea gonorrhea DNA. And panel C is just some controls to prove the integrity of these other DNAs, and they can be amplified by using their own respective parameters. Then we want to evaluate our silica paramagnetic particles. We found out that uh, it's important to wash them first because they come in one indium hydrochloride in the stored in, in, in the solution. And if we just that straightly add them into a tube based reaction, they inhibit the amplification step. And you can see that in panel A, numbers two and four. And in number two, the, the paramagnetic particles were, were not washed and they inhibit the, the reaction. In, in number four, we washed them prior to the addition and they allow for normal amplification just as a, a positive control that would be number five. So we proceed to do tube-based uh, capture of DNA using these uh, paramagnetic particles in tubes under this panel D. And we could detect five, 10 times to the four copies after 40 minutes amplification. Or we could also detect uh, around 500 copies after 60 minutes amplification. And finally, we, uh, this is just the results of everything integrated on, on our platforms. And here the sample was one milliliter of five molar one indium hydrochloride spiked with the Nicaea gonorrhea DNA. And panel A shows amplification for five, ten times to the four copies per milliliter. And then in panel B, these are uh, mixtures of the different DNAs. And only one Nicaea gonorrhea DNA is present, that is number two and number four. We have amplification and colorimetric change from pink to yellow. So this again proves that the, the platform is specific and also sensitive. So we wanted to show you how the workflow goes. And we use very standard laboratory equipment, such as pipettes. And so the device is made of polymethyl metacrylate, which is a good candidate material for mass fabrication. And basically, we load one milliliter of our samples, which we think this, in, in a real case scenario, could be urine, and we could have the vanadium hydrochloride salt pre-stored in the device. And then we have the paramagnetic particles. And then we can cover the device with another piece of adhesive tape. This is like PCR tape, transparent. And then we can proceed to do the DNA capture. We can mix for five minutes either manually, or we can put it in a rotator. And then we take a, a permanent magnet, and we can gather the bits into a corner of the chamber. So that would be the DNA capture step. Then we can fill the rest of the chambers. We can put a mineral oil on alternated chambers. And then on the last chamber, we put our lamp substrate, our colorimetric lamp substrate. And then we fill the rest of the chambers with an alcohol solution containing a bit of surfactant in order to wash the, any uh, remaining contaminants. And then again with the magnet, we just move the magnetic bits and we separate them from the sample matrix and we wash them through these immiscible um, phases of oil type of solution. And so this device will calculate around five, uh, 10 US dollars for small scale fabrication of the device and also include the price for the reagents. But we don't include these things like a block heater that can be reduced for the pipettes. So then it's important to uh, overlay the last chamber with oil because this prevents uh, evaporation of the reagents and it also prevents cross-contamination. And for the amplification, we just incubate them for 40 minutes on a block heater, or it will also be on an incubator at 65 degrees, and the results can be uh, interpreted by naked eye if it's pink is negative, and if yellow, then it's positive. So as a summary, we've developed this uh, sensitive and specific platform for detection of Nicaea gonorrhea DNA and integrating these steps of DNA capture, amplification, and colorimetric detection. As future work, we would like to study also the DNA extraction efficiency using Nicaea gonorrhea cells in spiked in urine. And we would also like to do clinical validation with patient samples. And we are doing this in collaboration with our partners at Mount Kenya University. And we are also thinking ways of how to be better optimize the protocol and minimize uh, piloting steps to make it as user-friendly as possible. And with that, I would like to acknowledge my supervisors, Nicole, Alex, my colleague, Bongol, and also the, our partners in Mount Kenya University, the different funders, and the AIBC conference. Thank you.
thank you for that interesting talk. So, any two questions for Pablo? Thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is, is it possible to multiplex this system to detect different pathogens in one go? Yes, uh, yes, uh, good question. So we've been thinking about that, and in theory, yes, we could, and we could uh, basically parallelize our devices to different, um, to different pathways, and then like from, a, from the same sample, we could divide groups of lead two groups of paramagnetic particles and then we could have different primers in two different chambers to detect two specific uh, pathogens. Question? Second question? None. Thank you, Pablo, for the interesting presentation. So we can move on to the next presenter, Bonkot Nansam. Everyone, my name is Mungko Nyamsong of Paul. I also work in Professor Pan's group at, uh, at the University of Paul in the UK. The work I'm going to present to you today is a collaboration between the University of Paul and Mount Kenya University. The idea is to develop a fully integrated platform for extraction and target specific detection of SARS CoV 2 RNA for COVID 19 screening in resource unit settings. As uh, everybody knows that uh, the COVID-19 screening tool is for standard is RT-PCR. The technique is sensitive and specific and can detect down to a thousand copies per milliliter sample. It is expensive and time and labor intensive and also requires specialized instruments that all the trained personnel can operate. And this results in very long turnaround time, one to two days, uh, making testing in resource limited settings a lot lower than it should be and making it difficult to contain the disease. Other points of care tests are available are antigen natural flow assays, but as you know, they are easy, cheap, and uh, easy to use, get very quick result, but they suffer from uh, low sensitivity. They also can give false negative results depending are uh, highly dependent upon correct swapping technique. Uh, automated systems from Apple, for example, ID Now or Simplic Gene Expert, also give very reliable, sensitive, and specific uh, tool. And you can get results within 45 minutes to an hour, but you can you need uh, expensive instrumentation. The CRISPR cast best detection utilizes the complex between Cas protein and CRISPR guide RNA. When hybridization between guide RNA and the target uh, nucleic acid occurs, not only the targeted uh, molecule breaks, but the collateral cleavage of the non-targeted DNA or RNA in the vicinity also takes place. And these non-targeted molecules can be uh, labeled and used as reporters for fluorescent or lateral flow readout. The assays don't usually use uh, Cas12 or Cas13s, which cleave the DNA and RNA respectively. The assay also combined, normally combined with isothermal amplification method to increase their sensitivity. And this makes the assay very highly specific because of the uh, selectivity mechanisms from the amplification primers as well as the CRISPR guide RNA. The 
the essays are very complex and requires many steps. Also, you need to uh, extract the RNA from the samples before prepare, uh, performing the assay. So here, we propose to use the IFAS platform to combine all the essential steps of RNA extraction, RG-LAMP, and CRISPR-Cas12 detection of SARS-CoV-2 RNA in one single device. The device is made of polymethylene methacrylate and uh, alternately filled with immiscible liquids of aqueous reagents and oil. And uh, there are three steps involved. First, the RNA is extracted from the sample using silica pyromagnetic magnetic beads and in combination with aluminum salt. Then, the magnetic bead extracted RNA is moved to mix with the RT lamp uh, reagents containing primers targeting nucleoprotein gene. And finally, the amplified product is detected using CRISPR-Cas12 assay uh, coupled with lateral flow assay. For the single-stranded DNA reporter, the 5 prime end is labeled with FAM and the 3 prime end with biotin. For negative sample, there is no targeted DNA molecule, so there is no hybridization. This results in a strong control line, which is the line closest to the sample pair. For the positive uh, samples, on the other hand, the hybridization of the guy RNA and the targeted DNA molecule triggers the collateral cleavage of the double, sorry, single stranded DNA reporters, and these result in the presence of the test line, which is the line further away from the uh, sample pad. I started the investigation by performing two-phase CRISPR-Cas detection using genomic RNA and SARS-CoV-2 RNA. I diluted, uh, I performed 10 dilutions of uh, initial sample of 4,700 4, genome copies and you could see and checked the uh, RTLAM product using gel electrophoresis. And you can see here on the test grids that the, the assays is very, very sensitive and it could detect from 4.7 genome copies using 30 minutes amplification and 10 minutes uh, CRISPR-Cas detection. I next checked if my guy RNA is specific only to SARS-CoV-2 RNA. To do this, I added other RNAs um, of um, other human coronavirus strain OC43 and um, influenza A virus H1N1 and their respective primers. You can see from the gel electrophoresis result that positive amplification uh, can be found when with the correct pairing between the RNAs and the primers and some cross-reactivity of the SARS-CoV-2 RNA with uh, SARS-CoV-2 primers with OC43 RNA. But when you take the sample and perform CRISPR-Cas12 detection and use the deep stick to check the result, the test line only appeared on the sample from SARS-CoV-2 RNA confirming that our guy, our guy RNA is specific only to SARS-CoV-2. After this, I started to evaluate our device for individual steps. The first step that we perform on chip was the on-chip RNA extraction and rt -LAM. Then I take the, sample, the amplifier product to perform CRISPR-Cas detection in tubes. And you can see here that uh, the targeted DNA uh, was successfully amplified on chip from 470 copies of lead sample. I next checked if I could perform CRISPR-Cas detection on chip. So the first two steps of RNA extraction and RT-LAMP were conducted in tubes. 
Then I take the sample from the amplification and load it in the last chamber of the iFast device, which was pre-filled with CRISPR-Cas reagent. And I compare between no template control and from the sample from magnetically extracted RNA from 940 copies per milliliter. And you can see here, the negative has only control line and the positive has a test line. So it is successfully performed on chip. And having successfully done, perform all the individual steps on chip, I next integrated all those of the steps on chip. I started with genomic free RNA. So here in the sample chamber, it's, all, it's just an RNA sample. And for five minute extraction using magnetic beads, and for 45 minutes RT lamp and 10 minute crystal cast detection, I could detect from 470 genome copies per milliliter sample. Then I wanted to check if I can do this thing with viral particles containing SARS-CoV-2 genome. As Professor Pan mentioned earlier, it was very difficult for us to access the clinical sample. So what I did, I just bought commercially available uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, verification panel. So here, I combine our own chip assay with the control of the free, uh, of the negative control and the free RNA. And you could see here, I could detect the test line from the sample that contained initial 1,000 copies per milliliter in one hour. And this is the same sensitivity that the RT-PCR offers. So at this point, I was very happy. And uh, to summarize, uh, I, we developed a single uh, device that integrated all extension steps for RNA extraction, rt lamp and CRISPR-Cas detection for uh, detection of SARS-CoV-2 RNA that doesn't require anything else but only a single heating source which could detect down to 470 copies per milliliter. The assay takes about one hour turnaround time to perform. It is still in the proof concept stage, so there are still few of manual detecting steps required. We are looking into validating the, our device with clinical samples and also looking to pre-storing uh, the reagents for uh, to reduce the, the amount of hands-on steps and automation for ease of use. Finally, I'd like to thank the Newton Prize 2020 for funding the project. My supervisor, Professor Nicole Pan, Dr. Jesse Parker for our PI in a Kenya partner, and Pablo, the best ever that partner, and uh, our friends and teams in HAL and NKU. And thank you for all of your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Bonkot, for the excellent talk. I think we'll open the floor for questions. Do you have any questions? You go first, Prof. Please take it up. You did a really excellent job. Good work. Thank you. Sir. You're, you're very welcome. Um, what I missed, and it's my fault, I'm a little daft, is what is, no, sincerely, um, what part of the virus are you detecting? Because what I was thinking the whole time, right, with the molecular-based technologies, what about variation in the virus? Because when we sequenced the virus, we were developing some different types of probe sets and we can use them specifically for different types of variants, but when there is variation, that created a challenge for us, of course. And so what regions of the virus are you targeting? I completely missed that, that was my fault. The, we used the primer targeting the nuclear protein gene of the, the RNA, okay. the virus. Yes, thank you. Okay. 
that more or less made us what I wanted to ask. But then I, I was just wondering about the same aspect of uh, different variants are coming up. Maybe if you target one particular part of the virus, or maybe and then we have these variations. Are you able to really clue up or you have to redesign your device to kind of accommodate yes. those? So this is our very first iteration of the device and we just wanted to check whether or not we could perform all this on chip. But we are planning to do multiplexing, so detect uh, the E gene as well as other genes and also incorporate the RNS pre, uh, sorry, RNSP as internal standards as well. We have the facility to do that because if we uh, redesign the, the chip a little bit, so we could have the parallel chip, uh, like a uh, line with a different target, different um, RT9 chamber with different primers and also the CRISPR with different, and we could do that in one, uh, one sample with the uh, various assay, and you can confirm that. One quick one, the off targets for CRISPR cas how do you deal with that problem? Sorry, the the off target, cut, uh, uh, CRISPR cas sometimes got errors. Okay. Uh, so yours is very, very specific and very, very wonderful. I was just wondering if you have any tricks to, how? in your design of the, the guide RNA. Uh, I did not design the guide RNA and all the primers. I used the protocol okay. that's already published. Yes. Okay, all right. Yeah. So fortunately for, for us, the you know the coronavirus uh, SARS-CoV-2 genome is quite small, and um, you with this guide RNA you are likely to really get uh, off target. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, it's really a small so that's a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again. So we're going to invite our next speaker, David Loco from the Technical University of Kenya. Good morning, everyone. My name is Glito Onyango from the University of New Mexico Kenya Global Health Programs. And I'll give a presentation on how transcriptome analysis reveal dysregulated L5 signaling via jump start pathway in Kenyan children with severe malarial and <coughs> malarial anemia. Most malaria mobility and mortality occur in sub-Saharan Africa accounting for 94% of global deaths and global cases respectively. Most of the mobility and mortality are due to infection in Plasmodium falciparum. In all endemic falciparum transmission regions, such as Western Kenya, immune-naive children bear the greatest burden of severe malaria, which primarily represents as severe malarial anemia, hemoglobin concentration of less than 6.0 grams per deciliter. And SMA results in high rates of mortality. Low hemoglobin concentration in immune-naive children with SMA has been attributed 
to the dysregulation in the innate immune response, promoting inefficient erythropoiesis. Our previous studies using candidate gene approaches have found numerous innate immune response pathways that contribute to the pathogenesis of SMN. Therefore, our study was designed to further characterize the molecular basis of SMA pathogenesis using an unbiased approach to catalog the entire express transcriptome, i.e. next generation sequencing. The study compared differentially expressed genes in children with non-SMA and in children with SMA. The study was conducted at Sierra County Referral Hospital in uh, Western Kenya, a holoendemic area for Plasmodium falciparum malaria. Children presenting at the hospital were enrolled as part of a short-term ongoing prospective study after obtaining informed consent from their parents and legal guardians. 64 age and sex matched children with falciparum malaria were stratified into SMA and non-SMA groups. RNA was extracted from baby puncture blood samples and uh, next generation sequencing was performed to identify differentially expressed genes between the two groups. Differentially regulated gene networks were then identified using enrichment analysis in Metacor. Shown in the table is the distribution of the demographic, clinical, and laboratory characteristics of our study participants. Based on a priori grouping, the distribution of gender and age were comparable between the study groups. Uh, for the results presented, I'll describe the statistically different results with the regard to the SMA group. To begin with, the admission temperature was lower in children with SMA, and uh, as expected, based on the stratification using the hemoglobin levels, children with SMA had low levels of hemoglobin, hematocrit, and RBCs. In addition, children with SMA had a higher red cell distribution with mean corpuscular volume and mean corpuscular hemoglobin. White blood cells, lymphocytes, and monocytes were elevated in children with SMA. And finally, the distribution of the sickle cell trait was different, differed across the groups, with the SMA individuals characterized by a higher proportion of HBAA, HB, lower proportion, sorry, of HBAA, HBAS, and a higher proportion of HBSS. Transcription analysis uh, revealed 6,862 genes that were differentially expressed with an FDR adjusted p value less than 0.05. 3,420 genes were upregulated, while 3,442 genes were downregulated. The Volcano plot shows the overall distribution of the differentially expressed genes. The red depicts upregulated genes, uh, green represents downregulated genes, while blue represents the genes that were not significantly different. We then performed enrichment analysis in Metacore to identify the top emerging pathways that are associated with SMA. Only the genes that had an FDR adjusted p value of less than 0 0.05 were used in the enrichment analysis. The top ranked pathway was the immune response IL5 signaling via JAKSTAT pathway with an FDR adjusted p value of 4.59 times 10 raised to power negative 10. Shown is the pathway map of IL-5 signaling in SMA. Uh, the, positive, the, the green arrows represent stimulatory effects, while the red ones represent inhibitory effects. Thermometers shown in red represent down upregulated genes, while those in blue represent upregulated genes. IL-5 is an uh, TH, T helper 2 cell derived hematopoietic cytokine that acts on uh, immune cells mediating cellular proliferation, uh, cellular cell survival, and uh, inflammatory responses. In children with SMA, the IL-5 receptor alpha was upregulated while the CFS2 receptor beta was downregulated, leading to an overall upregulation of the IL-5 receptor complex, since you need the two subunits to make the receptor complex. Moreover, Intracellular signaling through JAK2 and uh, transcription factors STAT1, STAT3, and STAT5 were downregulated, as well as their downstream target genes, cyclin D3, BLF, IMP1, and CISH. 
suggesting that children with SMA may have improper cell proliferation and B cell differentiation and maturation. This trend, along with the uh, altered expression of SOX1 and 2, which are cytokine, cytokine suppressors of cytokine signaling, uh, also point to impairments in the negative feedback loop of IL-5 signaling in children with SMA. And this may result to an uh, improper jack start signaling. Uh, the transcription factor STAT5, the regulation of STAT5 in the context of reduced expression of XBP1, BCL6 and uh, IgJ revealed that children with SMA have uh, a reduced ability to elicit class switch recombination and B cell differentiation and maturation. And collectively, these two effects lead to an inability to properly mount an uh, appropriate adaptive immune response. There were other effects of IL-5 signaling on expression. Uh, to begin with, the transcription factors, nuclear factor activator of T-cell 1 and 4, were upregulated. And uh, these are known to be upregulated uh, in the cases of p falciparum induced CD4 T-cell exhaustion. Nuclear kappa beta 1, uh, Jan B, and uh, nuclear kappa beta inhibitor alpha were all unregulated and uh, suggesting disruptions in the nuclear factor kappa beta signaling cascade in pediatrics with SMA. Uh, transcripts of IL-1 beta, cis lt one receptor, calgazarin SLP76 were all unregulated alongside uh, MCL1 and E4BP4 suggesting that pediatrics with SMA have uh, improper pro-inflammatory responses and uh, an inability to properly inhibit apoptosis. Finally, hypoxia inducible you gene 1 and uh, uncoupling protein 2 were upregulated in children with SMA. And uh, this were indicative of uh, a stress response to stress due to hypoxia and oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria. In conclusion, IL-5 signaling by jackstart pathway emerged as the top ranked differentially regulated pathway in children with SMA. Children with SMA had impairments in the negative feedback loop of IL-5 signaling, which can inhibit the IL, the jackstart pathway. And then uh, children with SMA also had impairments in B cell differentiation and maturation, and class switch recombination, which can result in uh, an inability to generate an appropriate adaptive immune response. And finally, transcriptional patterns in children with SMA suggest disruptions in pro-inflammatory responses and an inability to properly inhibit apoptosis. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the children who participated in the study as well as their parents and guardians. I'd also like to thank our outstanding team from the UNM Center of Global Health, UNM Kenya Global Health Programs, and uh, Applied Sciences at Mitrida University in Germany. This work was sponsored by the National Institute of Health. Thank you. So, thank you for the presentation. Questions for Onyango? Uh, good job, Onyango. Uh, I understand there could be a possibility of other co-infections impacting on, the, on this pathway. How, how do you rule out those possibilities? Possibilities of uh, other co-infections like bacterial infections or viral infections impacting on the single pathway. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, when we were matching our samples for the RNA sequencing, we ensured that there was no possibility of uh, confections. In other words, the samples that we took did not have the confections. For example, uh, we ensured that all the samples that we used were HIV negative, because we know that HIV positive children could also have anemia. So to rule out that, we had children who did have the confections that affect anemia, that could cause anemia in children.
check for bacterial infections? Yeah, we the children didn't were bacterial negative, so they, that was not a factor in the analysis. Any other question for Onyango? So Iman, thank you for the good presentation. Welcome. So the next presenter is uh, Emeka Mwanochi, who will join us online. So we'll take a minute to connect. I can hear you in Stockholm, but that doesn't help in Africa. <laughs> Yes, I'm saying something. Oh, good. We can hear you. Can you uh, put your slides on the presentation board and you get started, please? All right. Thanks. We are good to go. All right. Thank you for that. Hey, my name is Emeka Wanoche, and I am a third year PhD student at Purdue University in Biomedical. about the motivation for this project just a little bit and the first thing here is that as you can see the numbers displayed on the screen that HIV is still a pretty significant um, infection public health infection and currently as of now since the beginning of the epidemic since 1982 uh, it, it has claimed about 36.3 million um, lives so far so with this said, the United Nations came together in 2014 to put together this goal for 2020, in which that 90% of people living with HIV will be aware of the status, and out of this population, 90% will be placed on treatments. And also, they predicted by 2020 that 90% the of this population will already have achieved virus suppression, which culminates to the end of the epidemic by 2030. But then again, in 2020, this was what was achieved, and these numbers are not pretty much um, near what was predicted. But with help from all the different things and contributions from different people, just like scientists across the world, um, the 2030 goal is still somewhat on track. But the thing is, um, this year, 20, 2021, the 95%, 90, the 3.95% goal was re-established, and um, hopefully by 2030, we'll get to this um, goal. And as you can see here that the numbers, especially of the viral load suppression here, is pretty lagging. And this is because um, this could be attributed to many factors, um, spanning from so, um, patients' um, social economic factors or behavioral factors. But we as a group of scientists from Purdue University have taken it upon us to focus on improving these numbers and what we could do to help uh, people living with HIV on, among this population to be able to improve patient health care and to encourage and increase the patient compliance. So we talked about looking into ways and to create technologies that we can actually make them to be able to, um, to sort of a way um, track their viral loads within the privacy and convenience of their homes. And when doing this, we also have this clinically relevant numbers uh, at the back of our minds to help guide the technique or the device or the technology to make this a reality. So with that being said, we have developed a smartphone-based platform for HIV detection among people living with HIV. This will enable them to track the viral loads and to be able to track treatment responses across this population. So what you can see on the screen right now is the integrated device where you have the device base. On this end, I'm going to put my laser pointer here. Uh, so okay, 
And this is just the optical or the electronics portion of this device. And our device combined the um, signal amplification by RT lamp, which is a method of isothermal amplification or increasing signals of the presence of the genetic material of this um, HIV virus. And we now have this in-house integrated form of transducing the signals created from our RT lamp, which is called particle diffusometry. So basically, this is just a method to track the changes in viscosity of a volume from a you know, quiescent volume. And it does this by using the movement or tracking the random motion of beads in the solution with the aim of getting some sort of um, uh, viscosity change in if the particle of interest or the gene of interest is present in the solution, in this case, the DNA of the cDNA is present in the HIV um, or amplified solution. And with this, we're able to find or get a sort of a change of viscosity and um, the diffusion coefficients that could be used to translate the presence of, or not the presence, but in this case, a threshold number of measurement of the uh, virion's presence. So this is just a general workflow of the fluidic platform that we've de um, developed. And this you can see here is the microfluidic chip where you have both the imaging center and the control line with the various um, integration of the push buttons. You add the samples here, you amplify the signal by RT lamp, and then here you image the samples, and you can see that in the presence of low diffusivity, the particles are moving rather slowly compared to the figure of the picture on the right, where it's a high diffusivity, meaning that less of the viral load in the sample. As you can see here, the diffusivity um, figure and that translates the color coding here, the high diffusivity, you have a low viral load, like I said before, and this will now be displayed on the screen where the results can be tracked over a certain period of time. So in the next case here, what we, do, we did first of all was to develop this assay and our project designed to, um, to target the integrated region of the HIV virus. But first of all, we needed to develop this by, um, in a complex matrix and we did it in a tube where we extracted the plasma by using bench touch centr centrifuges to get the plasma. And these were now amplified and run in the gel. As you can see, these are visualized DNA pa um, banding patterns on the gel electrophoresis. And we were able to detect down onto 10 billion copies in per reaction here in this um, N of two um, experiments. And we, have, we also um, subsequently subjected these same samples to particle diffusometry. And in general, general here, we can see a significant dif um, decrease in diffusivity between the negative controls and the series of dilution where we have the virus in place. So the next thing here is um, this has become a sort of a, a requirement, a critical requirement for integrating what we call internal amplification control to sort of to give you a positive control to differentiate between a truly undetectable viral load from false negatives. False negatives in this case may result from anything that has to do with um, poor sample handling and um, storage, um, maybe um, very, very, uh, not the very conducive storage, and this can result to the samples or the reagent failure going to um, sort of a false negative. And we decide to integrate and design a control line that is able to tell the samples and give a truly reliable result. And just as a rule of thumb here, that when you look at the test signal and the IAC control line, we can actually validate or invalidate a result. So whenever you have, you always have to have a signal in the internal control line. And when this signal is absent, then that test is sort of invalidated at this point and needs to go for further retest. And Doing this, we have to work between various specifications that kind of like ties down into the whole device as a whole, in, in a sense. And doing this, we have optimized and iterated various methods, and we decided to settle in this form of um, integration of the control line. And this is the more spatial multiplex form, where you have the imaging chamber of the test line um, parallel to the IAC chamber. And for this, we're supposed to use an RNA-based target. So this technically will control even the reverse transcriptase used that goes from the RNA, HIV RNA, onto the cDNA. So this controls all the reagents used and also every other thing to know that you have a reliable result. Um, then you also have to have a, a, like a consistent PD or particle diffusometry measurement 
all through for this particular um, control line and it should be able to withstand freeze drying so because this device and equipment will be going elsewhere where if cold storage is not possibly the case here so you need to be able to dry down these samples and to keep them as stable as possible over a long period of time for this design we decide, I decided to use uh, the virus encapsulating all the protein coats and um, using the RT lab reagents with detection particles and also for the probes using the same probes that are used for the test to detect the integrase gene and a stabilizing agent to keep all this um, mixture of the cocktail as stable as possible so we are able to have the signal whenever we desire. So this is sort of a proof of concept for the IAC control line and we started the optimization in the tube but this was done in a, a buffer just to get the, the whole system working before going to tweak it and tweak it until you get it in complex matrix so for this part we, are, we, are, we use the highest concentration of the virus here so you know that for sure that you have a signal that's always been amplified and you can see the picture there you can see the white crust of um, powder so that is after many hours of freeze drying or lyophilization and these were then rehydrated in buffer and run through the fluorescence plot of planes. And as you can see that we had a fresh IAC control line where every other thing is the same with the drive, but the only difference here is that it didn't go through the many hours of lyophilization time. And we can have this um, sort of a proof of concept to show that even after many hours of drying in this whole condition of low pressure, low temperature, the virus was also able to withstand that and we can actually get a signal when you run an RT lamp and a, a gel electrophoresis. So this gave us an idea to sort of design and keep developing this IAC signal further. And in this case, I'm going to play this video. Automatic. Yeah. So in this other um, instance here, I was able to uh, try down the detection particles, which is about the streptavidin coated beads, which we use for particle diffusometry. So I was able to dry them down with uh, going down with the lyophilization and reagents um, and the H uh, HIV RT lamp reagents. And you can see that in this video here, you can see the movement of these particles. It's sort of in the mono dispersion here, and you can see that there is even less aggregation in even after drying and rehydration with plasma. So this is exactly what we want to enable that particle or efficient um, sensitivity from that particle diffusometry. And when this particle diffusometry was run with the algorithm, we actually have a significantly um, diff um, redu a reduction in diffusion from the highest concentration of the virus or the dried virions um, compared when compared to the negative control. So for this right now, we sort of concluded the fact that we are able to detect the HIV virions down to uh, about 400 copies per mil, which kind of like puts us into this clinically relevant um, clinical values for um, de uh, developing these technologies in a complex matrix. And the PD will be used to establish a threshold. So we're going towards this um, quantitative, going from a semi-quantitative to a more quantitative in the future way of uh, actually evaluating the amount of virions per mil of the patient sample. And with this IAC incorporated into this whole system, we will be ensure the way to ensure the reliable detection of HIV across different um, runs using the system. So for the future work, we will be optimizing. I've already started doing that with the microfluidic chip, but we've run into sort of different problems in this case where we're unable to, um, not unable at this point, it's still under development to integrate all the complex matrix a way to optimize the processing on the microfluidic chip. And the next thing is kind of like take this semi-quantitative uh, system to its truly quantitative measurement of HIV virions. So the figure on the right here is just a real-time PD, uh, PD plot from the microscope. And this is um, about the highest concentration of the virus we use and now monitored during, uh, you know, under the microscope during particle diffusometry. So that is the relative diffusivity graph on that side that you can see that once time is increased, you can see this diffus diffusivity is increased further, is decreased, sorry. And then the next thing is to further, because we have used the HIV virus to establish the proof of concept for this IAC, but we kind of want to go away from using something of less um, 
health um, harm or anything, but to use something that is very, very friendly when it comes to health and also can withstand um, many, many um, the freeze temperature and stability over a long period of time. And then the final thing here is to develop a fully integrated system handling the sample prep, the lyophilization, and the amplification all done on the chip before this is now um, optically uh, visualized using the particle diffusometry. And with this, I would like to say thank you to a very uh, phenomenal group that I'm able to work with and my advisors, um, Professor Linus and Tinsa Rossum, and the NIH funding, the NIH um, R61 grants that have made this project go pretty smoothly. And thank you, everyone, for the audience. Thank you. Some of the devices look a little bit complicated. Uh, do you have any idea of uh, how in idea of uh, how in the target here right after with the feasibility studies we're trying to make all this especially on the chip is to make it below $25 in essence. So that's why the selection of the materials especially for the microfluidic device uh, we went towards a thermal plastic COP um, and all those chips because of the war, how relatively cheap they are. So our idea and the target here is to get it below $25 or $20. And uh, this is just for development because we figure that the smartphone technology is something that is a bit ubiquitous in this recent day and era. And we can actually get this not just to the end users but also to clinicians as well. And hopefully with the right funding and finances in place that we can be able to get this technology out at some point. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amika. I would give you another round of applause. Amika, I would give you another round of applause. So, Amika, thank you very much. Fantastic presentation. I have a question for you. Maybe uh, I should know it by now, but um, an intact virus that's inactivated. Yes, it's inactivated virus here. Okay. And uh, would then that also give you uh, an idea whether your license solution also works, or is it on the amplification part that you are looking into from uh, uh, the control point of view? So it's the amplification, and for this point, we didn't use any form of license cocktail. So this is very, very, very much in the nascent development periods where we're looking to use the heat as a form of license. But the idea behind using the virus intact was to exploit it into the IAC. So that's why I'm going from the virus just to show the concept of the IAC to something rather less hazard in that sense and also very stable. So anything that goes from, like, I'm open to suggestions here. I'm looking at RNA, synthetic RNA, but something that has to go through this low pressure, low temperature, low pressure, low temperature. Okay, thank you. Well, we are here to learn from you, so we're here to learn from you, so we're here to learn from you, so thank you. Thank you. A round of applause for Mr. Norman here. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Priscilla Tabel. 
um, a PhD student um, year two at the University of Ghana, Wagbet. So my talk today will be about immune responses um, to SARS-CoV-2 in among Ghanaian patients. So um, the world, or we are all faced with um, a disease, COVID-19, which in which around 252 million people have been infected, and we have lost around 5 million people. If we look in Africa, like other speakers have been saying, Africa has not been severely affected as compared to the rest of the world. Going um, narrowly to Ghana, one of the countries in North Africa, which has also been not been um, severely infected, of which we have around um, 131 cases, and 1.2 thousand of those people um, have died. Uh, so COVID-19 is caused by a virus known as SARS-CoV-2, which has uh, four uh, most important structural protein, the spike, the nuclear capsule, the membrane, the envelope. This uh, structural protein has on its pathogenesis when uh, it comes upon uh, the host. So upon infection with this virus, like any other pathogens, the human body or the host tend to elicit some immune response, which includes the production of the cytokines and the antibodies, which help um, to, um, to fight uh, the virus. And um, also upon infection with this virus, people tend to be asymptomatic, that they do not show any symptoms or they can be symptomatic. The symptoms can be severely mild or depending on an individual. Um, antibodies are a very important part of the immune system as they help fight the virus through lysis, neutralization, agglutination, and optimization. And also, importantly, cytokines are also important as they control the growth and activity of other immune cells. Cytokines are a very important aspect of COVID-19. We all heard of cytokine storm, in which an excessive uh, inflammatory response to cells because we can cause us cytokine storm. So cytokine storm is the production of um, cytokines that are more that the body can not be able to, to control it. So the production of cytokine storm can cause um, acute respiratory distress syndrome in people. It can also, also cause uh, multi-organ failure and finally um, death. So it is very important for us to uh, study this uh, part of the immune system. Um, Sexual kinds and antibodies have been done elsewhere. Obviously, people are studying most of cytokines, and it has been found that uh, in other parts of the world, IL-6, IL-10, IL-8 are some of the cytokines that are correlating or are associated with severity of the diseases. But looking at Africa, looking at um, Ghana, we have the same cytokines as associated with uh, severity because and though in Africa, in Ghana, we have less uh, severe cases. We have more asymptomatic people as compared to symptomatic. And we also when we go to antibodies, um, other people have also found that we have a lot of anti-spike concentration concerns compared to nuclear capsule. Now the question is, do we have the same in Ghana? Looking at the difference in COVID-19 in both um, continents. Uh, now, with this, uh, the objective of this talk is to determine the kinetic of SARS-CoV-2 specific humoral responses among asymptomatic and symptomatic infected individuals. So it's basically to uh, compare the symptomatic and asymptomatic patients um, in Ghana. Uh, the experimental approach, uh, we collected blood samples around Ghana. We are collaborating with some hospitals in which we isolated our plasma. Um, this study was basically based on luminance. We use our uh, MAPFIS um, luminance. Uh, for the antibody profiling, our antigen targets were the nuclear capsid and the spike. And we got um, a protocol that we adopted from our collaborators in France, where they have already uh, coupled our antigen. And then we did some hybridization and then we analyzed our results in the luminance. And for cytokine profiling, we use a kit. The human central hundred five blood kits, um, which target among like twenty five cytokines. These are the different uh, cytokines that these kits uh, target: the chemokines and and the cytokines. Now the result. So um, 
we first try to compare uh, the symptomatic and asymptomatic cases. Uh, what are the different the, um, the levels of antibodies um, and the symptomatic and uh, symptomatic um, levels? So we are targeting uh, IgG. So from this study, we can see that uh, we had a lot of um, we had a lot of um, antibodies in the symptomatic as compared to asymptomatic uh, for both uh, the spike and the nucleocapsid. And when you compare on um, bigadin, when you compare, we try to compare the nucleocapsid and the spike. Though the difference is not that significant, we can considerably say that um, our spike antibodies or our body produce most of a spike as compared um, to nucleocapsid for both uh, symptomatic and asymptomatic. And I try, in this study, I tried um, to compare our results which are, with what has been done elsewhere because we all know that uh, everyone is doing, mostly doing uh, COVID-19. So, have a lot of data every day and every day. So it's good that you compare what you're having with uh, 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 what people are finding out there. So um, from this study, this study I think it was from uh, Asia, um, they also found the same that um, symptomatic patients have uh, more of antibodies as compared to, to asymptomatic. And also we tried, um, our study was a longitudinal study, so we are following patients for a week, I mean for four weeks, for a month and we are sampling them weekly. So we tried, we are trying to see if, um, how the changes in uh, antibody levels as time goes on. As you can see on, the, on this um, tape figure two here, uh, we can see that our antibodies are uh, increasing as the time uh, goes on. Though our study was limited to um, 21 days, uh, it was good if you could probably have um, sampled uh, more. Um, when you compare this uh, to literature, we found that it's almost the same. It's more like um, a plateau. So the antibodies increase, then they reach um, a constant, um, a constant level. Then after that, I don't know, which uh, we need uh, to see on that. Um, then our next um, um, part was to look at the cytokine levels and try to compare symptomatic and asymptomatic. And you can see from these graphs here, we can see that uh, symptomatic patients uh, tend to elicit more of the cytokines as compared to um, asymptomatic. We have the IL-6 in which is, uh, other people have found that it is associated or correlated to severity. But here we can see that it's very low in asymptomatic uh, patients. Um, we have more of asymptomatic patients in Africa, so uh, that explains why um, probably most of our cases do not have most of um, cytokines from. But interesting here, we found um, eotoxin. So eotoxin is one of the chemical kinds that is um, associated with um, people who have asthma. So it's a um, chemical kind that helps um, to uh, ma the migration of the eosinophils to site of inflammation uh, during asthmatic um, infection. So we found that this uh, chemical kind was the only site of uh, chemical kind that is. Um, higher in asymptomatic as compared to symptomatic uh, patients. This probably may be interesting. Uh, it probably can be an interesting site for, uh, chemical kind of study. It could be a biomarker for asymptomatic uh, patients. And also maybe it's a cytokine that, or it's a chemical kind that is probably protective of people with respiratory disease. As asthma is a respiratory disease, uh, same as uh, COVID-19. So when I compare this to literature, that's almost the same. Um, we have uh, more of cytokines in symptomatic as compared to asymptomatic for all, um, most of the cytokines. And also we try to see the, um, the change in levels of the cytokines as uh, also as time goes on. This is the same study like for 21 days. Um, here we found that as uh, the times or as the time goes on, we found that uh, the level of cytokine decreases for both uh, symptomatic and asymptomatic patients. But if we, um, uh, if we see that, uh, we can see that uh, for asymptomatic uh, patients, the cytokine tend to, uh, for symptomatic patients, the cytokine tends to last longer as compared to um, asymptomatic. As you can see some of the symptomatic patients have some cytokines, we have some cytokines as they bring to one, other than asymptomatic cytokines, um, um, they finished as day 14. And also we tried to look at um, the blue, um, the nine survivors. 
the ones that are shown in blue. So these nine survivors, unfortunately, we couldn't um, sample more because we lost them during the case of, of, of the study. But when we look into literature, there are not much studies that have been done on the uh, trying to see the level of cytokines in COVID-19 patients as the study goes on. That's the only study that I can find, but it does. I could not find any trend whether the cytokines are increasing or decreasing. But from what I can say is that the cytokines in Ghana, I don't know in other countries, they decrease as um, during the infection. And also we went ahead to try and look at the correlations between the cytokines, how the cytokines associated, associate with each other, um, uh, comparing the symptomatic and asymptomatic. Uh, we used um, um, a heat map. Um, if you can see as a, um, the clusters that we have for symptomatic and asymptomatic, for symptomatic we have two um, almost the same clusters, but asymptomatic we have a one big cluster and a small cluster. So this shows how the uh, cytokine clusters among each other between um, the two groups. So from these two uh, clusters, we can see that we have different clusters between asymptomatic and symptomatic. So I tried to uh, zoom down into um, some of the cytokines. If you can see on symptomatic, the cytokines that are highlighted there, we have most of the uh, uh, anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory cytokines that are negative, are uh, positively correlated in symptomatic. But when you go to asymptomatic, they negatively uh, correlate. It shows that the correlation between those cytokines in asymptomatic leads to a decrease in number of cytokine levels as compared to asymptomatic. Same applies to this big uh, cluster that we see in asymptomatic here, which is mostly um, positive correlation. But when you look at asymptomatic, we do not see those um, the, the cluster. So generally with this, uh, we're able to find out that there's difference in correlation between uh, symptomatic and asymptomatic. Now, in summary of my results, uh, I can say that um, the anti-spike are considerably higher uh, than anti-nucleopepsid in both symptomatic and asymptomatic. Symptomatic patients appear to have higher expression levels as compared to symptomatic. And a neotoxin may be a biomarker for COVID-19 asymptomatic patients and also the level of cytokines in symptomatic and asymptomatic reduces over time with both those in asymptomatic uh, last finishing more than um, the symptomatic. And finally, the cytokine or cytokine signature between symptomatic and asymptomatic differs. And finally, I would like to acknowledge my supervisors, my sponsors, uh, my team members, the lab, hospitals, and all those others who are involved in this society. Thank you. So thank you, Mr. Bokita, for the wonderful presentation. Any questions for Kisego? Yeah, we generally observe that uh, the outcomes are usually worse for males. Did you try to differentiate? And the other question is, uh, uh, did you did you look at uh, different disease manifestations for cytokines? So we know some people have had a more of a systemic infection, others lungs, others uh, you know, uh, kidneys involved or gastroenteritis. So what is the observation of that? So did you see, were the cytokines expressed similarly for clinical presentations affecting the different systems of the body? Okay. So the first question was like, uh, did I find any difference in gender, males or okay. Oh, okay, so um, our, our patients, we didn't have any significant difference between females and males, so the study wasn't based on the other, it wasn't gender based. Oh, so the second question is, um, I don't think I clearly understand the question. <laughs> Did the clinical manifestation uh, alter, or did the set was there differences in the cytokine, uh, you know, measurements you found, depending on the different clinical manifestations in, in uh, whatever severity of the disease? Uh, 
Okay, yeah, so I think I showed where uh, we had non-survivors. Those were uh, severely infected patients, so they had a higher cytokine levels as compared to others. So with that, I can say as the, the, the severity, there's higher concentration levels as compared to those that are mild or asymptomatic. Thank you for uh, that presentation. I'm just actually quite interested looking at your profile, especially the cytokine profiles. Did you consider other co-infections, especially almonds? Because um, looking at the profile, especially for your cytokines, you're seeing more of pro-inflammatory uh, for using R10. And in other studies we've looked at, uh, in our lab, especially looking at malaria and um, sh uh, schistor and helminth co-infection, we see that helminths actually are immunoregulatory, and we actually see that they are protective. So I was just wondering if that might be a factor. Okay, so which cytokine did you find protective? Um, not really protective, but down regulation. You, you find IL-4 IL, IL as a pro-inflammatory. Okay, yes. Oh, IL-4 and IL-10. IL-4, IL-10, anti-inflammatory. Uh, anti anti yes, yes. so um, being associated mm. a lot with um, infections, as we know in Africa, mm. we have a lot of infections. So could that be a factor? Or did you look at that? Yeah, yeah. So actually, we were um, we had some uh, demographic data, like uh, the clinical data. So we were doing this study in collaboration with some hospitals. So they gave us all the co-infection or the morbidity that those uh, patients have. So for those that had a lot of morbidity, because cytokines can easily be um, affected by any any infection. So for those, we were excluded from the study. Okay, the last question. Um, so thank you very much for your wonderful talk. Uh, as a follow-up to the question she just asked, I wanted to find out whether you also looked at people that did not have uh, COVID at all and compare them to people that had COVID but were asymptomatic. Yes, yes, we did. Unfortunately, I didn't show it here. Yeah, but yes, we had some healthy pre-COVID patients that we um, that we did for our study. So they showed a lower lower uh, cytokine levels compared to symptomatic and asymptomatic. So thank you, Mr. Gop. Let's please appreciate her with a clap. <laughs> so let's move to the next presenter. That is Hussein Abkalo from Ilri, Kenya. Um, my name is Hussein Abkalo. Uh, I come from Ilri and I'm also an adjunct fellow at the Mountain University. I'm here to represent a minority because uh, the bulk of the talk has been on human clinical stuff. So I'm switching gears to, to veterinary disease. And the title of my talk is a Rapid CRISPR Cas9 Editing of Genotype 9 African Swine Virus Separating Eastern and Central Africa. So this virus is a causative agent of uh, African swine fever, which is a little hemorrhagic fever in pigs. Oops. Yeah, so this is caused up to 100% mortality in pigs. And historically, this was described in Kenya in 1921 by a British uh, veterinary pathologist who was representing the British government at the time. Uh, the virus is uh, vectored by soft tips of Potinodora species, and in the animal cycle it infects warthogs and um, uh, bush pigs. Uh, this virus is endemic in 26 countries of Southern Africa, and all the 24 genotypes are present in, in Africa. 
Uh, however, in 2007, uh, the virus was transported from Africa to Georgia, subsequently causing a havoc uh, currently in Asia and some parts of Europe. The genome uh, of this virus, I mean, the, the virus has icosahedral morphology and a linear double stranded genome ranging from 170 to 190 kilo uh, and also contains an operating frame uh, ranging from 150 to 160, uh, 167, depending on the, on the isolate. And this difference is attributed to the deletions uh, or the gain of uh, uh, ORFs from antigen families. The genes are closely spaced and they're encoded on both the strands. Uh, and some of them are overlapping. Uh, the genome doesn't, do not contain introns, and therefore splicing of transcripts does not occur. The replication of this virus is uh, predominantly cytoplasmic. So currently, there is no vaccine or treatment for this uh, uh, disease. And therefore, contain measures uh, include slaughter and disposal of infected and potentially infected animals, and strict biosecurity measures. Uh, however, uh, presently, uh, previously, there has been attempts at generating recombinant uh, virus using uh, conventional methodologies like homologous recombination, uh, where uh, viral genes are replaced with uh, fluorescent markers like GFP. Uh, an improvement on that system was the use of a CLELOX system, uh, which enables sequential deletion of uh, viral genomes, uh, rather viral genes. Uh, however, these approaches have limitations because uh, the homologous recombination uh, that's used conventionally has rare and low efficiency uh, capabilities. And the isolation of the, the clone is uh, laborious because it needs sequential uh, uh, limiting division. And to be sure, it takes up to average of six months to get a, a recombinant clone. Uh, therefore, there is an urgent need to deploy uh, new technologies like CRISPR-Cas9 and tweaking of protocols to, uh, like for cloning of this virus to expedite development of vaccine against this disease. So to uh, achieve this objective, we deployed the CRISPR-Cas9 system. Uh, I'm sure everyone here has a clue about what CRISPR is, so I'm not going to go into details. But this is uh, originally discovered in bacteria uh, as an uh, antiviral uh, immune system. And uh, the CRISPR system consists of repeating sequences uh, interrupted by spacer sequence, which are remnants of genetic code from past invasion from bacterial page. And these uh, spacer sequences are used as an identification barcode uh, that helps the cell to detect and destroy invaders uh, when they return for repeat infections. The CRISPR-Cas9 system uh, it has uh, two main components. The Cas9 enzyme, which has a dual function. It's a helicase, which unzips double DNA helix. And the nucleus, which interrupts a double strand break in the genome. And then there is a, a postman called guide RNA, or the homing device, uh, which is a combination of two RNA that helps Cas9 to target specific region in the genome. So once the Cas9 causes double strand break in the genome, two mechanisms, uh, mainly two mechanisms are deployed. And the first one is uh, a homologous end joining, which is uh, an efficient system but is error prone since it induces insertions and deletions resulting in friendship mutation. So this is preferably used for generating knockouts, but it has one challenge which I will, I will show later on. The second uh, approach is a homology directed repair, whereby uh, a donor template or a repair template is needed by the genome to fix the double strand break. This system is less efficient, but it is high fidelity. So to achieve our objective, we uh, adopted some schematic uh, or protocol. We had to start with uh, generating a cell line, an ASMV permissive cell line, which expresses Cas9 enzyme. So we had to do some uh, initial experiment to determine the response, uh, response for the selection of the plasmid. 
Cas9 uh, transfection and expression profile to see how it's expressed in the cell. And then once we are happy with that, we went ahead to identify a target gene. So the one that I'm going to show is just for initial approval principle. Uh, so once we settled on this gene, we identified optimal guide RNA using uh, available softwares. We went ahead and synthesized the guide RNA uh, and then generated donor DNA for the HDR uh, mechanism. So the next is infection and transfection, uh, the cross-parting part, and then genotyping of the recombinant virus uh, using different systems, uh, detection PCR sequencing, and then phenotyping uh, for virulence, growth rates, and protection of, of, of the recombinant virus. So to start with, for promising dose response, we determined, because the plasmid that we are using, uh, besides Cas9, it co-harbors uh, pyromycin for selection. So we determined that 0 0.5 microgram per ml uh, to 1 microgram per ml of pyromycin is sufficient for selecting the, tra the, the transfected cell. Uh, and then we, once we were happy with that, went ahead and did this uh, plasmid uh, transfection and selection with pyromycin. And we, after getting uh, resistant cell lines, we checked for the expression of the Cas9 protein using Western blocks. So the first lane is the uh, wild type, and then the second one is the Cas9 expression cell line. And that the, uh, one at the bottom is the beta tubulin uh, control. So, uh, so we, we, we employed both systems. First of all, the NHEJ mechanism, whereby you only need the guide RNA, but not homology, uh, the donor DNA. So for this, we identified the gene of interest, H38L. This has been shown from literature to be an essential for SMV replication. Uh, and then we identified potential guide RNA targets uh, using ChopChop -chop software, and we targeted a region which is close to the start codon for efficient uh, knockout of this gene. Then we uh, synthesized the guide RNA in vitro transcription in the lab, performed transfection in uh, WSL Cas9 cell uh, infected with the uh, ASMV. So for this approach, I used a virus which is expressing DS red. Uh, for the reason that I'll explain later. And thereafter, to confirm that there's cleavage in the genome, we did a simple assay uh, called genomic condition assay. And uh, uh, from the gel, it shows that there has been a uh, modification of the genome. Uh, thereafter, we did a, a protocol that we developed called Florence Focus Dilution Cloning, whereby you have a fluorescent microscope and then a simple object marker that you can be able to identify the foci which expresses uh, uh, this fluorescent marker, the DS red. And then you just mark those ones and pick them, by then to limiting dilution uh, to assess whether uh, you, get, you have a, a modified clone. And then we also perform a modified version of uh, this cleavage detection assay whereby you have your clones DNA and then you mix with the wild type DNA. And if you get a, a double, uh, multiple bands, it will tell you that you have a combination of wild type from the, the spike DNA as well as the uh, modified. So, and then you proceed and you select from the above, from uh, the clones with the multiple bands. You select these ones and you do now another round of detection assay to see if they have now single or uh, just uh, one clone. But for this case now, you don't spike with, with DNA. So those... Uh, Clones, which do not, the red ones which are indicated in red, we went ahead and do, did Sanger sequencing. Uh, and this protocol, using this press focus assay, we were able to reduce the cloning time from the average of six months to less than two months. Uh, sequencing of uh, clones, we, uh, we were able to see that this mechanism has a higher propensity for in-frame deletions. Because 89% of the clones that were analyzed had eight amino acid deletion, so this is not a uh, this is an in-frame deletion. What you will prefer for knocking out is out-of-frame deletion. 
So in, in this case, you end up with uh, a residual protein which may be functional. So, and this is consistent with previous reports, which shows that uh, NHJ deletions are prevalent than, than in sessions. Therefore, although this system is, uh, is attractive for generating a mutant that is devoid of uh, exogenous protein, uh, it turns out to be unsuitable for, uh, uh, for generating vaccine because you end up with in-frame deletions and then you may end up with uh, a residual protein. Uh, we also sequenced uh, uh, some of the clones uh, and then we saw two nucleotide insertion which resulted in the in-frame, uh, which resulted into frame shift uh, uh, mutation and you were able to have uh, premature stop code introduced in the gene. Uh, this effectively knocks out the gene and if you look at the, now the whole gene, you will be able to see like, multiple stop codons introduced in, in, in that gene. Uh, so, although this only was only 11% of, of the analyzed clone, we were able to show that this gene has been effectively knocked out. So, uh, we went ahead and performed uh, HDR uh, method, which now requires use of a homology uh, template. For this, we amplified uh, a plasmid, which harbors the left homology arm and the right homology arm of the, of the targeted gene, and then EGFP cassette, which has a P2 promoter and a, and a terminator. Uh, if you can look at this, there is a log speed sequence upstream, upstream and downstream of the EGFP cassette. So this is purposely done to be able to remove the final fluorescent marker once you have the, the candidate uh, vaccine. Uh, and then this is the genome of uh, ASLV. Once you now introduce your guide RNA and Cas9 enzyme, it will introduce a double strand break in the genome. And with this, for the genome to fix uh, uh, the scar, it will undergo homologous recombination with the, with the donor template. And then you end up with a virus which has now taken up the GFP uh, cassette. And you'll be able to see fluorescent, uh, fluorescence under the microscope. So uh, this is the log speed sequence that I mentioned. This is used for removing the, the sequence sequentially uh, uh, after you prove that this candidate is, is, is worth pursuing. So this is a J image which shows uh, uh, integration of EGFP and, uh, in the genome. And uh, also we did some uh, PCR to show that the clones that we obtained were devoid of alter contamination. And this is a fluorescent image uh, showing uh, the expression of GFP by, by the mutant. So, uh, in, in conclusion, uh, we have shown successful modification of this genome uh, through both uh, NHEG and HDR mechanism. Uh, NHEG has higher propensity for in-frame deletion since 89% of the mutants had consistent 8 amino acid deletion. And only 11% of the clones had the preferred out of home condition. Therefore, uh, HDR pathway is the method of choice for generating vaccine candidates uh, with the option of uh, deleting the flow of using the HP sequence. Uh, uh, with the whole genome sequence that performed on these clones, we will not detect any off target cleavage in the genome. And the cloning protocol that we used, uh, we were able to obtain the recombinant virus in less than two months. Uh, reducing the time frame from uh, the uh, average six months that has been uh, shown previously. So this approach is therefore uh, uh, efficient and to facilitate expeditious generation of SV vaccine candidates. Uh, using this approach, we have also generated uh, 20 vaccine candidates against ASF, and we are now expanding this system for other livestock pathogens like the Laria buffer. Uh, these are my uh, colleagues at ILRI, our collaborators at FLI, and JC Bay in the USA. Thank you. Thank you, Hussein, for that excellent talk. We only have time for one question. One question from the audience. The slash not scare you, please. Last question. But it has to be out of the box. 
Thank you, Sam, for such a nice presentation. My question is, uh, you said you do not have any off-target yes. events. Yeah, maybe, uh, what is it? A very clever grid RNA design or what? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So, uh, we usually with this uh, chop chop uh, software, you are able to uh, measure the specificity of your, your guide RNA, so you have to select, because they give different parameters. And uh, based on where you are targeting, you are able to pick uh, the optimal guide RNAs. But uh, even with that, you need to do whole genome sequencing. Right? So you, you don't just rely on, on, on the design, but you also do uh, whole genome sequence to see if the crispr uh, can induced mutation elsewhere in the genome. Okay, thank you. A round of applause for Mr. I just wanted to, it's a very quick question. Maybe I missed it in your presentation. It's the swine fever, I think it attacks a couple of different uh, animals. It's mainly pigs. It's just pigs. pigs. It's only pigs. Pigs, yes. So when you design this, it's only for pigs? It's only for pigs. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. A round of applause for Mr. Hussein. So we'll move on to our next speaker for the day. Atish Ramesh Chandra Shah from the University of Strathclyde. Welcome. Uh, we have an announcement for everyone who's getting the COVID-19 vaccine. You need to log on to the portal, which is portal.health.go.ke, and you sign up and open an account, and vaccinations will be given at 1.30 p.m. So you need to open the account before that. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Adin Shah uh, and I'm a master's student. I'm graduating next week uh, at the University of Strathclyde and now I've become a visiting industry researcher at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow uh, and I'm also a medical doctor and uh, today I'm going to present uh, on the leveraging of 3D printing technology in the fabrication of myelectric prosthetic hands, a panacea to upper limb amputations in sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, so East Africa has more than 100,000 upper limb amputees. And the cases are rising uh, due to trauma uh, and other medical conditions such as peripheral vascular disease. Uh, and there is no, as of now, there is no uh, company or institution that offers uh, myoelectric prosthesis, prosthesis to uh, upper limb amputees. And the market uh, is, is going to be valued at 2.3 billion by 2025 globally. So there is a market for for, for upper limb myoelectric prosthesis. So we came up uh, with the Mkono one, that's what I call my uh, prosthetic, that's our brand, brand the, the prosthetic hand. Um, and there are three uh, major things that go in the fabrication of this hand. First of all, we 3D print the whole assembly. So from the fingers, finger attachment to the wrist, uh, to the socket, uh, secondly is using the EMG sensor, the electromyographic sensor, to pick up muscle activity. Uh, we normally use uh, the bicep muscle, so we place the sensor on the belly of the bicep muscle to get the most uh, EMG, the, 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 the highest amount of EMG signal. And the other, uh, the last one is reading the data from the sensor, uh, processing it uh, in the, in, on the microcontroller, and sending the relevant actuator signals to the motors to actually trigger the finger movement. Now, why did we choose 3D printing? Uh, first of all, it is, uh, it is very low cost compared to the other fabrication methods. Uh, it is very customizable. So, uh, if you are doing pediatrics, if you are doing uh, uh, children, you know, ch child amputees, if you are doing uh, adult amputees, you can actually uh, customize it uh, 
to the uh, to the size of the uh, ultralateral hand. Um, and I, I was doing my master's and I was doing it online and this is actually a part of my master's thesis. So I got uh, remote support and collaboration uh, from my supervisor. So he could actually send me the CAD designs and you know I could I could print the hand uh, on the 3D printer in Tanzania. This is a small video we made uh, at the peak of uh, COVID infections in Tanzania when we were uh, under uh, self-imposed lockdown. And I would just want to play it. So all the machines, uh, I put it in my uh, old home. And the whole uh, hand was fabricated uh, in-house. So let me just uh, try to play it. The design which you saw in the video uh, is an year old and since then we have come up with a new design uh, because we we found that the other design had a lot of moving parts and it was very easy for something to break. So this design actually does not have uh, the five fingers. It, it's, it's actually uh, like a, a, a crab hook, like a crab claw uh, and uh, there is only one joint, there is a single joint. Um, and I can show it to you. So we use a lead screw actually, which is connected to a tiny motor uh, below the hand, if you can see it, the white one. Um, and, and this is actually our new design. And every, uh, most of the parts are locally sourced. So you see that lead screw that is connected to the motor that is actually a bolt, uh, you know, which we cut uh, and, uh, you know, made an adapter uh, that would fit uh, the, uh, the end of the bolt and the shaft of the motor. And uh, in blue uh, is where we are testing the hand. Uh, if it can, you know, if that tiny motor can um, uh, um, grip a 500 uh, milligrams uh, water bottle. Uh, we've got some grants and uh, we have got a PCB printer, a printed circuit board printer. And what we want to do is we want to make uh, uh, in-house sensors, so flexible sensors, because the sensors uh, that uh, I source uh, First of all, are very expensive. Uh, secondly, uh, the sensor is very rigid. So when you put it on someone's bicep, uh, it, 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 it normally does not um, uh, um, go according to the curvature of the bicep. So it's very rigid. So if you have a, a flexible sensor, uh, you would have uh, reliable, uh, more reliable readings. So the future work, um, so we are one year old uh, since we started the project. We want to implement uh, advanced uh, digital signal processing. We also want to implement proportional speed control. Uh, we have still not designed the socket, but we'll start doing that very soon. And we also want to apply machine learning to classify those EMG signals. So uh, right now we are using thresholds, 
Uh, but then if we can classify EMG signals, uh, it's very easy for that machine to know, uh, you know, it, a particular signal is coming from which muscle and is it contraction or relaxation. Um, I'd like to thank my uh, university uh, supervisor from Strathclyde. Um, also, I would like to thank my mentor um, and some of the organizations that support us. And this is our team. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur, for the excellent presentations. We just have one question. One question. Okay. I, I just had a small uh, suggestion in where you're, you said you're going to use like machine learning for the is it EMR signals? EMG signals. So like, I, 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 I recommend uh, a technique called reinforcement learning because there are so many pieces like that, that, look, that, 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 that you're going to put together and people have like got really good results like OpenAI. Okay, thank you. So let's appreciate uh, Atish by clapping for me. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this very nice, beautiful presentation. Would would you be open to uh, working with uh, teams of biomedical engineering students? We teach senior design. We need projects that we can have feedback on. This seems like a great project for. Our uh, us to be able to help your team with our students. Certainly, certainly we offer for uh, collaborations and that is what we are looking for. Thank you. Then collect the bacteria 
and distribute it either inside uh, tubes or even on uh, solid support matrices like uh, paper bits. And then simply dry the bacteria by placing them in uh, jars containing some chemical desiccants. And after they are dried, these reagents can be stored at ambient temperature for extended durations. And in order to use these reagents, they only need to be rehydrated back with water and then distributed into the uh, reactions uh, such as PCR, more lab, for DNA assembly, or even uh, more involved RDP PCR reactions. So in this manner, the cellular reagents can be used in place of pure enzymes in a variety of processes. And this includes some examples here, for uh, example, PCR, which is shown here uh, as an agarose gel analysis. Uh, products that were made using cellular reagents expressing TAC DNA polymerase. Similarly, uh, we can use cellular reagents to perform isothermal amplifications such as LAMP. This particular figure here in the middle is showing uh, reverse transcription LAMP OSD assays that were performed using cellular reagents that are expressing an engineered DNA polymerase that was made in our lab. Uh, now, this polymerase we have found uh, surpasses the properties of many commercial enzymes and its ability to do uh, not just lab, but also single enzyme with first transcription lab. So uh, this figure here shows uh, analysis of SARS-CoV-2 virions using uh, cellular reagents expressing this single enzyme. And the readout can be uh, taken visually by using uh, strand displacement probes that are labeled for a course and are incorporated uh, in the single uh, vessel reaction. Uh, so these uh, probe signal can be read either using cell phones or uh, by uh, transducing it into a color reaction on a dipstick. Other common reactions that uh, we have been able to perform using cellular reagents include uh, a reverse transcription, as seen here with an RT-PCR reaction, uh, and even uh, DNA assembly reactions uh, like bone -like. So uh, performance of uh, these cellular reagents is uh, quite comparable to that of pure uh, uh, enzymes in uh, most analytic patients. For example, uh, seen here, uh, we compared ta uh, the TAC DNA polymerase cellular reagents with uh, an enzymes obtained commercially uh, in TAC 92 PCR assays, and the performance was quite comparable. Similarly, on uh, the right side, uh, we compared cellular reagents expressing uh, BSDMF, which is uh, which can be. While, uh, while traditional uh, QC, while traditional QC metrics such as uh, absence of nucleic acids or other cellular components, uh, as can be applied to pure reagents, cannot be applied to cellular reagents. However, we uh, can obtain a fairly consistent batch-to-batch -batch performance. Uh, for example, uh, you can see here uh, QPCR reactions done with three different matches of tagging and polymerase perform uh, quite consistently. So uh, because the uh, process of producing cellular reagents is uh, very simple and requires minimal instruments, uh, most in most cases only a uh, simple incubator and a tabletop centrifuge, uh, it is very easy to uh, prepare cellular reagents with a uh, very uh, minimal setup. Um, so our collaborators, uh, Dr. Malloy and her team, they in fact uh, were able to manufacture cellular reagents, uh, not just in UK, but also in Ghana and Cameroon. And in this case, uh, as shown here, they uh, used a DIY incubator that they built uh, using a cooler box and locally sourced uh, parts. And they uh, prepared cellular reagents that expressed an open uh, enzyme um, called the open meant DNA polymerase. And with this enzyme, they could uh, also uh, show that uh, these cellular reagents worked in performing PCR. And in many cases, they could amplify uh, fairly large tumblers. 
And as we have seen before uh, here at, uh, in Texas, they also saw that the reagents they prepared uh, could be stored at uh, ambient temperatures for uh, long durations. So uh, in conclusion, uh, by simplifying the production process as well as eliminating the cold chain uh, needed in preparing as well as storing these thermal reagents, uh, these reagents we think uh, offer a low cost as well as locally sustainable alternative to commercial molecular biology reagents. Uh, so therefore, uh, our hope is that cellular reagents uh, could enhance the accessibility as well as affordability to molecular biology uh, research, as well as education, um, as well as going beyond that into diagnostics and uh, technology uh, development. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank uh, our uh, funders, uh, which include, among others, the Lodge Foundation, uh, the Gates Foundation, NIH, uh, Shutterworth Foundation, and the Solar Foundation. And also, thank you for uh, to everyone here uh, for listening in. Uh, I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sanchita. You have saved us a few minutes. I'm going to open the floor for questions, but I'll only allow one because of time. Go there, sir. She can see. Uh, thank you very much for such a nice presentation. My question is, uh, uh, have you tried other, you know, reagents, you know, trying to pack re other reagents into this uh, bacteria, or is it just the uh, enzymes? Thank you. Uh, that's a great question. So at this point, it is, uh, we have uh, focused mostly on enzymes um, that are uh, fairly commonly used in common uh, reactions, but uh, our future goals are to pack uh, other uh, proteins uh, and reagents into these bacteria. Okay, thank you so much. Once again, a final round of applause for her. <laughs> so we move on, and our next speaker for the session is Maine Nyabuti from Analytics Elarian in Kenya. So as he comes, we have a few announcements for the poster session. Uh, we're not going to follow the order that was initially um, shared with you because yesterday we didn't do it. So you just look for your poster and stand by it. So it's not according to the order that we shared. The other thing is that only those who registered for the vaccine should go to the desk. Um, and Christina Adel Bimper and Kesego Tapella, please see Dr. Gernam John after this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Somebody left a mask here, please. Uh, Please try to be as brief as you could. Uh, if you can save us, uh, we will be very happy. Time is very hard on our time. Thank you so much. So if you just, just use this. And, uh, I am I'm a data scientist at a company called Illyrian. It's based in Kenya. So what Illyrian does is it's a customer engagement framework. And the simplest way I can explain what that is is like you can make an application on Illyrian, and maybe you want you wanted to see you wanted to like like if there's a drug if, if, if there are a couple of patients and you want to like remind them to take their medication in a certain way to reduce like any any drug variability, you can remind them the area and that's after building an application. So the title of my of our project is Machine Learning Meets Microscopy, a cell explorer tool for the diagnostic laboratory. So first thing let's just dive in. So like for the longest time microscopy has been used for morphological identification of cells and we went a step further and created something called a cell explorer. So for from our initial results, we think that it improves on microscopy by increasing like the its efficiency and effectiveness according to us. But this cell explorer is powered by a, a technique called machine learning. And whenever someone asks me about machine learning, I remember the cartoon on the left. And here, like you can imagine like for instance, like how you make a decision. Let's say from Monday to Wednesday, it's been raining like the whole week. And then on the evening of Wednesday, you're like like thinking like, man, I should carry like an umbrella tomorrow. And yeah, so that's that's how a regular human being makes a um, decision. But now if you ask a computer the same question, you'll have to come up with rules that where 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 it will, it will take data, maybe most likely like data about like what are the factors influencing like rainfall, like for for a period of time, and then you use like, a, like an algorithm, like if you've done statistics, statistical modeling, like logistic regression, and you'll be able to answer the question: Will it rain tomorrow? Yeah, just that's just that, just put it up roughly. But the next thing I want to talk about is like how do we create, what are the raw materials for the cell explorer, sorry about the formatting, I think 
there's an uh, issue with switching between Linux related software to, I think this is Windows, but I hope you guys can see this. But so like the first thing is we created thin blood smears of those parasites over there. So there's Leishmania donovani, Plasmodium bacchae, and uh, Trypanosoma brucei, Rhodosiese, and we mostly use like model organisms that they cover. I've highlighted there, so we used the uh, the Palpsi mouse, and we took the sample for the Leishmania from the spleen. So once you do that, and you have your images, right? So like once you've done that, you have the raw materials, but then you need to take those images and then process them. So there's a certain segment of the cell explorer called the image explorer. So what that does is it takes the 401 images we took, we process it, and in terms of we grab the sections where like there's uh, a cell with um, intracellular parasites or 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 or, or extracellular par parasites around, and then once once we do that, we we're just honing in on that, and then once once we have that, like, we do that so that the the, the neural network that we will talk about later is able to now detect the patterns we, we want in those images. So that's the, the image explorer part. So the, the, next, the next part is you need to bundle up your, your, your images and labels into independent and dependent variables. And then, so what, once you do that, you now do something called data augmentation. And data augmentation is just simply adding noise to the image. So for that, we are trying to simulate what if another investigator was looking at the slides and then they do different things, like they raise their, their, their course, they, they raise their, what do you call it? Sorry, they, they, they mess around their microscope in different ways and then maybe they change the brightness because that's yeah, the preference. You can change the contrast, change the saturation and flip the images. So we wrote code that specifically does that for the images. And then once you have those, you bundle that together, and then there's something called a data loader. So the data loader is the one that will present these um, independent, independent variables to something called the neural network, which is a resonant 18. In full, the resonant 18 is a residual network with 18 layers. So what that does is it breaks down the images into very small uh, components, and then from there, it's it's you are it's able to like I get like once it's broken down like that the features that actually make the image this is like the morphology of maybe the trypanosoma or like the RBC that that is like transformed into a very compressed file format and that's that things and that and when you do when you do that you've done you make like image compression and then like once you look at the components that have been broken down you will you will definitely you. If you make it, you get the, the the main components that make the like the image in terms of morphology. And once you have that, you can now relate that to the dependent variables. So the dependent variables are now the labels of the images of the image. And for, from over there, like I try to scribble something there, and you get so like you get this kind of structure. This is a vector. And then it relates to the label, and then once once that pattern is found, like you create another image that that is probably similar to maybe a trophozoid of of pipa A, like it will be able to detect it like really fast. All right. So I've mostly talked about like uh, how like the what what are the components of the cell explorer and how some of them work. And here is now the part called the image explorer. This is just for pre-processing the image. So we have like a couple of uh, of uh, of like of, of like icons there that if you like read your buttons and check boxes. So these are read your buttons and these are check boxes. And then you just give a description there and then save. So yeah, this is this is this is for this is what the image explorer like entails. Just getting the image and then. Pre-processing it a bit and then later on, uh, another part of the cell explorer is is used. So here is another part of the cell explorer, which is which is just basically the machine learning applications. And this one's almost written by, with uh, the Jupyter framework, so just Jupyter notebooks. And to the left there, 
is a is a machine learning model, but specifically a deep learning model, where you just like upload an image, and then it it will click on classify. It will it will like it like in like roughly one second or less, depending on. It will tell you like what what is in the image like that. It's it predicted like it's a spinosad with a mass equals of H to L dot of Barney, and then it was really confident in that prediction, and it gave uh, point nine eight nine. Like, yeah. So, so yeah. That, that was that was the. So yeah, that, that was the probability. So it, so it was really confident that it was it, that what's in the image is a spinosad with a mass equal to like n dot one. Then to the to my right, like we have something called uh, uh, another model, like another machine learning application, and this one uses a. Uh, a technique called simple linear iterative clustering, and that's a mouthful. But what what that does is that it divides your image into like segments or groups, um, and the the parts the parts that are labeled that are in purple and blue there are sections which have like similar values, and and here what what happens is I just you see that major that major segment the purple one. This is this is this is the cell that we're interested in. So what my my code does is like it it, it like counts that major segment, and then like here I just found one, so it reports the number of cells there is one. So in conclusion, I like to say like our our, our the, the neural network was able to identify cellular morphology, cellular morphology, and also identify parasites with an average accuracy of about 95. And this was done on something called the validation set. So this is this is a set of images that images was not that was not used in the training time. And then so like this this is these are images the model the the neural network has never seen before. And like it was still able to like classify them with, with an incredibly high accuracy. And then there's a part for this for the cell culture which just which is which uses the simple linear iterative clustering. And then that that just counts the cell. And so, like in short, it was able to differentiate parasites as well as life cycle stages. I didn't show that so well. And uh, so, like this tool, this this software is like a very novel tool, like just for for the diagnosis of multiple parasitic infections, and it can be potentially used in the resource settings. Uh, I like to acknowledge the people who were involved in the work, it was a couple of people, but uh, 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 so there's the Department of Tropical and Infectious Diseases in the Institute of Primary Research, and first I. So I happen to be an international fellow for, 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 that, for that program, and yeah, the, we've written a lot of code, and some of it I've uh, used it for, for this, for this uh, project. I wanted to do a demo, but we are out of time, so I am inviting any questions right now. Thank you, thank you so much, Ben. I know you were really pressed for time, and you've, you've been able to give us a presentation in a short time. Thank you. So we'll open up the floor for just one question. We are very short for time. Come on, it was not bad, was it? Yeah, that was a very nice presentation. Uh, I'm wondering, is it possible to repurpose this system? Because what you are showing is for diagnosis of parasites, right? Is it possible to repurpose this for diagnosis for, let's say, cancer? Yeah, uh, yeah. That's actually actually when you're thinking about these experiments, like right now, I think you're supposed to be thinking about like how can I sustain this experiment or this project for other things? Because like those are just images and labels. You can just add it in and then just work work. So the answer to your question is yes. Even you can you can even make one right now if you have the images. I'm serious by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. Uh, a round of applause for you. Thank you. So we're going to break for lunch. A few announcements before that. Again, if you're registered, you go for the vaccine. Uh, good afternoon. Yeah, I have a fun announcement. Uh, for those who went for the COVID test, if for the COVID test, uh, after one hour, you need to go to Fan Bio. Then, uh, once you're in the system, 
an email will be sent to you. So follow the instructions on how to download your certificate. We went for the COVID test today in the morning. In the next one hour, go to Van Bio. Once you're in the system, instruction will be sent to your email, which you should follow on how to download your certificate. In case you have challenges, please get back to me so that uh, we link you with the contact password at uh, Waterloo. So that is sorted. So in the next one hour, please check on your result certificate. Okay, thank you. So you're free to go for lunch. Bon appetit. Now, now I have to make the time announcement. Yes, uh, before you break, please, very, we are we are having a, a hail of time is not on our side. So we request you kindly, please grab your lunch. We have the posters. We want to squeeze in the poster session as much as we can. So just grab a quick lunch. Let me down there for the posters, please, please. We are running out of time and it's chaotic. So just go for the posters as soon as you grab a quick lunch. All right? We thank you so much for your understanding and for your patience. Thank you. So we have to be here by 3 p.m. Everyone should be in this hall for the lectures coming. Professor, uh, Professor Weissman will be joining from the U.S. 3 p.m. all in the hall. Back in the hall, please. Quick posters. Poster judges, if you're in here, poster judges, please. Be ready to evaluate the posters from 2.30. Be ready to evaluate the posters from 2.30, please. Thank you. So, can we clarify? So, uh, uh, 4 o'clock, why is
Uh, we're ready to begin the next session. I'm Paul Robinson. I'm chairing this session. The first speaker in this session is Professor Drew Wiseman, who is professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Uh, his laboratory has studied RNA immunology, immunity excuse me, for many years, being the first to discover that mRNA could activate dendritic cells. It was one of the three groups to identify the TLR7 and TLR8 recognized RNA. His group went, uh, went ahead of the pack to identify, sorry, to, uh, <coughs> sorry, sorry for somebody is uh, moving the technology. Somebody moved uh, the, the back. Oh, sorry, the back. Professor Wiseman, just give us a moment. Uh, his group went ahead of the pack to identify that the inclusion of modified nucleosides allowed the mRNA to avoid activation of RNA sensors. He's won several high-profile awards, uh, most notably the 2021 Alaska Award for his pi pioneering work on mRNA technology, which has enabled the development of COVID-19 vaccines at breathtaking speed. His lab is designing new vaccines, including pan-coronavirus vaccine designed to protect against all viruses in the coronavirus family. He's also working to increase the global supply of COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Professor Wiseman and um, please uh, begin your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, what I wanted to talk to you about today is the basic science behind nuclear mo nucleoside modified mRNA therapeutics and then introduce countries, companies in the African continent, how to make mRNA LNP vaccines. So the hope is that in the future, local production of vaccines will be possible to allow local distribution. But let me go on to, uh, to my talk. So uh, my conflicts of interest, we have many patents on modified RNA and work with a bunch of companies let me just a yeah. moment. Uh, if you would allow me to record your talk, sir, would you? Oh, of course. Okay, thank you very much. So, recording in progress. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, people mistakenly believe that the RNA vaccines were invented in 10 months. And, and that's clearly not true. The first time mRNA was injected into an animal with the idea of using it as a therapeutic delivery system was in 1990. There was a single report after that, and then all of the research with RNA focused on vaccines. And, and this involved taking dendritic cells out of animals and out of people, pulsing them with mRNA, and then injecting the dendritic cells back. And the reason why this was done is because of this. There are 17 innate immune sensors. These are germline encoded sensors that recognize different forms of mRNA. And they're everywhere. They're in extracellular fluid, the cell surface, endosomes, inflammasomes, uh, cytoplasm. They respond in a variety of ways. Some produce pro-inflammatory cytokines. it 
the cell. Back then, none of the 12 receptors were identified that recognized RNA. So to us, it was unknown why RNA that fills our cells was being recognized as foreign. So we did this experiment. And what we did is we isolated RNA from different subcompartments of mammalian and bacterial cells. And the thinking was is that if RNA was simply immunogenic, it simply activated cells, then all RNAs would have equal potential. But that's not what we saw. And what we saw that was striking was that bacterial RNA, and mitochondrial is a version of that, was similar to in vitro transcribed RNA and highly activating, while transfer RNA in mammalian cells didn't activate at all. That led us to a new hypothesis that maybe nucleoside modification modulated recognition of mRNA. So there's over a hundred different types of nucleoside modification. They all occur by a, a variety of mechanisms. Bacteria through humans. Many of their biologic functions are still not understood, or the enzymes that mediate the modification are not known. What we did next was we made nucleoside modified mRNA. So the, the way you do that is the way you make RNA is you start with a piece of DNA. You put a promoter for a phage RNA polymerase on the DNA. And you follow that by RNA structures like untranslated regions, capping sequences, the coding sequence of the protein of interest, and a poly A tail. And what we did is we exchanged the cognate uh, triphosphate nucleosides with a modified nucleoside. So instead of using UTP, we do use pseudouridine triphosphate. And that way, every place where there was a uridine in the RNA, there's now a pseudouridine or now a methylated 5-cytidine. And we, and we were able to make RNA for many different modifications. When we tested them for innate immune activating potential, and we used monocyte-derived dendritic cells, because they contain most of those 17 innate immune sensors, we found that certain modifications reduced the activating potential of the mRNA. It didn't completely get rid of it, but it reduced it. The striking thing, though, was when we tested those modified RNAs and asked, could they still make protein? And our bet was that they wouldn't. I mean, every U was now a pseudouridine, or every C was methylated. It, it was striking that not only was some of the RNAs still translated, but they were translated better. And, and that was unexpected. We spent a number of years, probably around five or six, figuring out the mechanisms behind this. But along the way, we also found another source of activation. The phage polymerases used to make mRNA also made errors. So we developed a way to purify the double-stranded RNA contaminants away. And when we did that, we got rid of any remaining immune activation. So we produced an RNA that was, didn't activate any inflammatory mediators in cells.
when you look at the combination of modification and purification, what you see is about a four log increase in the amount of mRNA, uh, of, of protein produced from the mRNA. So that's a huge increase. The other thing you have to take into consideration with mRNA is its transfection efficiency. So if you've ever tried to deliver DNA to primary cells, you're happy if less than 1% of them take up the DNA and make protein. But with RNA, both in primary cells and in vivo, we have transfection efficiencies of 80, 90, 95%. So it's an incredibly efficient process. All the RNA has to do is get into the cytoplasm, and then it's translated. So this is now 2004, 2004. And they asked, well, why would you want to study RNA? It's, it's difficult to work with, it degrades rapidly. And we pointed out a couple of things. The first was what it took to make protein therapeutics. And protein therapeutics are the most rapidly expanding element of pharmaceutical industries. This is a GMP site uh, at a pharmaceutical company. You put Cho cells or other cells into 50,000 liter drums and you let them produce the protein of interest. You then have to figure out how to purify that protein away from the cell culture contaminants. During this process, you can sometimes misfold or uh, uh, induce the wrong modifications, glycosylations, etc., to the protein and end up with bad effects when they're given to patients. With mRNA, it's produced in a single reaction vessel. That's identical no matter what the coding sequence is. It's purified in a single vessel. That's identical for any coding sequence. Instead of 50,000 liter drums, Moderna and Pfizer use 100 liter bioreactors to make mRNA. So the production of RNA is simple. It's the same no matter what the coding sequence is. And the RNA, the, the protein is produced by host cells. Host cells know how to fold and modify the RNA. So we also believe it's much safer. But the issue then came up, well, how do we deliver the RNA? We are a bag of RNAs. Every fluid, every cell has RNA sits in them. We studied every imaginable formulation to protect and deliver the mRNA. And we found that lipid nanoparticles were the best. Lipid nanoparticles contain four lipids that self that loaded in the germinal centers for long periods of time. And in the next few years, will have to be given to people. Uh, Professor Wiseman, um, I have a question myself. I had the vaccine in uh, February and then the second shot in March, and I had been taking my blood frequently in the lab, uh, mm, taking some serum, and I've taken my blood every two weeks and monitored the antibody teeter. And um, I had a colleague monitor it. And actually, he told me that if I was a goat, they would have done a death bleed on me because my antibody teeter was so high. So I thought that was great. But I wondered when I had my third shot, should I really need it if I have a high antibody teeter? What are the ramifications? Yeah, you know. The, the, this is unknown. So for, for most viruses, most vaccines that we develop, we follow people over time. And when people start to get the disease again, we give them a booster. With tetanus, it's every five to 10 years. With polio, you don't seem to need a booster. 
Um, with influenza, it's every year. So what we see is that different immunogens induce different durabilities. Drew, a marvelous presentation. Uh, so nice to meet you virtually. Uh, I had read about your work and that with uh, Katie uh, Carrico, uh, and it's uh, certainly inspirational uh, to be able to hear from you directly. But my question uh, pertains to uh, what you just said about the boosters actually protecting against variants. So that seems to imply that there is some activity uh, that is level dependent in terms of the number, that the level of the tiger and in terms of the, the number of antibodies that you have and their effectivity uh, as opposed to being specific for a given variant. So I'm, I'm trying to So if you, if you understand what I'm asking. Yeah, so it, 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 it's not, you have to first start by tuning Penn's horn. Uh, Penn developed clinical use of CAR T cells, and we, we made the first gene therapy that's been FDA approved for blindness. But if we go back to LNP physiology, this is how lipid nanoparticles are made. You put the lipids in ethanol, the RNA in acidic, and we attach it to the end of the peg molecule, the particles that are binding uh, PCAM expressing cells. And we've put an anti PCAM antibody on the LNP. And not only do they bind, but after binding, the mRNA is expressed in the lipid nanoparticle. So they maintain effectiveness, but now they can bind to specific cell types. Human UVEX don't take up LNPs at all, but when they're targeted with PCAM that they express, now every one of them expresses the mRNA. And striking, and, and you know, the picture is worth a thousand words, PCAM is expressed by endothelial cells, and the highest number of endothelial cells are in the lung. And we can see now that with PCAM targeting, the lungs are lighting up. So we're targeting lungs with anti-PCAM targeted LNPs. And interestingly, the amount of liver uptake decreases, and that's likely because we've added PEG to the LNP and we're blocking APOE binding. My lab has had a long interest in HIV, so we've developed the ability to target CD4 positive T cells. Again, we added uh, 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 an anti-human or anti-mouse CD4 antibody to LNPs. They potently bind to CD4 positive T cells. And strikingly, and, and this was the big hurdle, 
if you've ever tried to transfect a T cell, they don't take up lipid complexes. They don't take up nanoparticles because T cells had no free and acidic activity. Our hypothesis was if we targeted an antigen that endocytosis after binding of a, of a particle, that would deliver the RNA to the cell. And that's what's occurred. So CD4 positive T cells don't take up untargeted LNPs, but they highly take up and express mRNA from targeted lipid nanoparticles. We switched to a system of a, a Lots P mouse that had a stop cassette in front of his DS uh, green gene, and we delivered Cree encoding mRNA in the targeted LNPs. Ex vivo, we just took spleen cells and added targeted LNPs. We saw high levels of gene recombination, almost nothing in the control targeted LNPs. And when we injected the LNPs, cells that were expressing the mRNA. But what was striking is th these were animals that were injected with luciferase. And after we took out all of the organs, we imaged the animals again. And we saw that were expressing luciferase. What that means is that the MPs are escaping from the circular, going into the tissues draining through the lymphatics to lymphoid organs, and they were still capable of binding CD4-positive T cells and expressing their mRNA, which was a, you know, a, a nearly unbelievable event that lipid nanoparticles could cross basement membranes and retain effectiveness. Again, we purified the T cells, and they were the ones making the mRNA. We injected the targeted or not LNPs into animals, and we found high levels of gene recombination in the lymph nodes and spleen. The x-axis is an activation marker, and what this tells us is that resting as well as activated T cells are equally capable of taking up targeted LNPs and expressing the mRNA. So we're now using this targeted technology to target proviral HIV DNA and resting T cells as part of an HIV cure. So we've been able to show that we can target particular cells in vivo, and we're using this to deliver a variety of gene editing technologies. We've developed other targeting delivery systems. And one in particular is we figured out how to target all T cells using a CD5 scavenger receptor. We get levels of transfection in the 80% range for both CD4s and CD8s. And we've developed a new technology. Uh, this was just accepted into science and we published soon. But the idea was we can deliver CAR encoding mRNAs and form CAR T cells in vivo. Wow. To make CAR T cells right now, you take a patient, you leukophorese them, you stimulate the cells for 10 plus days, you deliver the CAR molecules with the lentivirus, and then you give the cells back. That's a half a million dollars per dose. Our idea was that we can use CAR T cells for more common diseases and then make the CAR Ts in vivo. So we deliver an LNP that's targeted to T cells. The LNPs are taken up, the RNA is translated, and we put CAR Ts on the surface that can then target whatever the CAR wants to target. In this case, activated fibroblasts. When we deliver these targeted LNPs with CAR, 
in vitro, 80% of the cells express a CAR molecule on the surface. After in vivo injection, 20% of the T cells express the CAR. And we treated mice that had been uh, induced to have hypertensive cardiac fibrosis. Slide fibrosis. We dropped the ejection fraction. We increased the diastolic and systolic volumes. When we treat them with targeted mRNA LNP mouse system, and we found that we could gene edit over 90% of the cells with a single administration of bone marrow targeted LNPs expressing CRE. We followed these mice for six months. The level stayed in the 70 to 90% of any bone marrow cell dairy transplants and dairy transplants and ahead with this for sickle cell anemia we expanded to probably all the other bone marrow any other genetically deficient cell we're also using lnp targeting to deliver therapeutics so we're uh, delivering um, anti-inflammatory molecules to stroke uh, animals uh, to uh, myocardial infarcted animals, to lung inflammation, uh, the, the, you know, the, the potential for treatment is enormous. I need to thank the people in my lab and all of the labs that we collaborate that have done this work and our funders. Thank you. Outstanding presentation. Yes, so, you know, I, I, you know I, as I mentioned, the, the cost of CAR T's are about a half a million dollars a dose. I think that with targeted LNP delivery of CARs, that will reduce, you know, I, I don't know, but maybe in the $1,000 a dose range. And it will be off the shelf. You, you walk to your pharmacy, you get LNPs, and you inject it into the patient. Uh, we're looking at delivering CD19 cars for, uh, for, for leukemias. Um, it, it can potentially be expanded to just about any car delivery. Wonderful. So I got uh, one last question. Uh, I'm, not a uh, I'm not an expert in HIV, uh, but this is rather naive. Looking at the coronavirus, the vaccine has been developed. You say it started a long time ago, but it really materialized in a very short time span. And the HIV vaccine has been uh, under consideration for a long time, and we've never reached that level of speed. Uh, do you have any thoughts as to what are the challenges? Can we translate, translate the coronavirus uh, vaccine development to the HIV stage and uh, arrive at this, uh, we get some solution? What's your perspective? Yeah, so uh, two of the clinical trials that we started before COVID hit were for HIV. Um, the, the, the issue with HIV is that it's an incredibly difficult virus to make a vaccine against. And the, the approach that we're currently taking is that it'll probably be a series of vaccines that are needed. Our, our approach is that we're making responses against now go ahead please Rod. Yeah. Oh, so true the ability of uh, FAMCAR if I'm pronouncing it correctly to reverse myocardial fibrosis and improve the function as you described 
uh, is exciting and, and quite promising. The question that I have is the exact mechanism, because once there is true fibrosis and scarring of the myocardium, reversal, reversal to date has been very difficult. So the, the, it uh, simply stopped the inflammatory process, and the myocardium is able to recover or function with whatever was before these. Uh, this therapy won't encourage or it won't induce cardiomyocytes to to proliferate and to expand. That, that may require other uh, other uh, growth factors or other factors to induce. But you know we're, we're, we're thinking about using this for lung fibrosis and for muscle fibrosis associated with DMD. Uh, so that, that there's potential to treat a lot of diseases where fibrosis is, is a key endpoint of the disease. You still have to treat the, 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 the original disease, but at least you can improve patient uh, outcomes by, by reducing the fibrosis. Opportunities in Africa 
ones that we're familiar with also in the U.S., even though we don't have camels, but we're certainly concerned about uh, remote delivery and, and, uh, uh, and reaching peoples in all parts of the country, uh, of people all over the globe uh, need to have access to healthcare services. Uh, the advent of uh, wireless uh, devices and portable devices like this handheld uh, ultrasound uh, have promise for that and develop de uh, delivering modern diagnostics uh, to in remote settings. The concern about affordable vaccine uh, uh, medicines uh, as well as, as vaccine but medications uh, uh, for everyone uh, is clearly a global issue. And one of the things that we know exists, but in the uh, in the past, I would say until recently, maybe the last decade or so, the appreciation that mental illness is a true illness. It is a disease. It has a cellular molecular basis the way other diseases have. Many of the technologies that have emerged over the last decade have pointed that out. Uh, for example, uh, functional MR imaging and, and PET imaging have shown uh, definitively that there are cellular mechanisms, uh, there are molecular mechanisms that are in play when people have uh, illnesses such as anxiety and schizophrenia and so forth. And so we need to uh, focus our attention and our technologies to help us do a better job in more uh, objectively identifying those and, uh, and treating them. And the concern about connectivity, well, this is a concern everywhere, uh, but uh, obviously uh, a challenge to be met because the payoff is tremendous, uh, the potential for us to reach people across the world uh, through these wireless uh, approaches uh, is something that we can leverage. And I was not surprised to find this concern about the talent in Africa uh, being attracted away and leaving Africa. And if we are able to do the kind of job that I'm talking about, where we have a great ability to reach across the planet with these technologies, I think it would be more attractive for talent to stay within the regions where that talent grew up, where it was developed, so as to afford everybody on this planet the opportunity to access the best that medicine and medical technology has to, to offer. So in this regard, I actually wrote a commentary that was published by the National Academy of Medicine uh, a little over a year ago, uh, and it, uh, it's shown here in the title. But the focus of this was the advances uh, that could be afforded by an integration of engineering and clinical medicine. And while this is beginning to happen, it has started already, the institute that I used to lead at the NIH, the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging uh, and Bioengineering, specifically focused on this intersection, this nexus between the physical sciences and the life sciences. But what I'm proposing here is an even deeper integration of uh, clinicians and engineers to meet these challenges, where we not only include medicine and engineering, but also sociology. And here we need to design approaches that have in mind when they are designed where they will be deployed, who needs them, the environment that they live in. And uh, engineers are very good at creating solutions that, that meet certain boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions that should be folded in into our research and development are those conditions of to whom and where, not just what we're doing, but where it will be deployed and who will take advantage of it and who needs access to it. So this, I... And this 
kind of thinking I think really is needed to, to address and redress the inequities in healthcare that we see uh, across the globe and in fact uh, in, in the U.S. where COVID has shown a bright light on this issue of socially based inequities in healthcare delivery with black and brown people in the U.S. contracting COVID at four to five times the rate of white individuals and having deaths at, at three times that rate. So the public health crises that have been global uh, consequent to COVID-19 uh, are multiple and compounding. They all derive from this medical uh, challenge that we've had with the virus itself and its infectivity and how it has uh, visited the whole planet. But as a consequence of that, also uh, economic crises and uh, unveiling the stark social inequities and the social crisis that I just, just referenced. And all of these are compounded. Our way out of this is with the kinds of innovations that you've heard about over the last couple of days and the speakers that we've heard. I want to specifically point out what uh, Professor Weissman described. I, I would actually uh, call and inject in this uh, the concept of immunoengineering. They're actually developing uh, mRNA and lipid nanoparticles in such a way as to uh, attack specific features of, of this virus. That is immunoengineering, and it um, uh, involves the immunological system, so immunoengineering uh, is an appropriate phrase. And you see from this review article, uh, three years ago, uh, they essentially uh, used that type of language. Engineering of the nRNA sequence has rendered synthetic mRNA more translatable, yes, uh, and advances in these areas of mRNA engineering it is what uh, uh, we're talking about and is a manifestation of this convergence of engineering and medicine. Uh, similarly to uh, what uh, Professor Weissman ended with is this concept of the pan-coronavirus or the universal vaccine. We see a couple of articles here talking about uh, innovations. One with developing a, uh, a broader uh, uh, targeting antibody that would be produced uh, by mRNA that has the ability to attach to different regions of the spike protein as a step towards developing a pan-coronavirus. So that's very exciting. And my former colleague and still good friend, Tony Fauci, you know, 10 years ago, uh, talking to him about the, the focus on developing the universal vaccine, a uh, one that attacks, uh, as he uh, uh, projected, the stalk uh, of, of the uh, of the viral particle, uh, somewhat as described by, by Dr. Weissman, which seems to be more common among different viruses where the, the, the head uh, has more variations and, and, and more mutations. So that is upon us, and that also um, invites the, the, the input and the, the merger of uh, engineers who are skilled in developing these kinds of, of technologies. And also, uh, down in the bottom right hand corner of this slide, uh, approaches that are uh, supplementary and ancillary. Uh, these are approaches which would uh, provide ways in which you can before they actually uh, develop uh, symptoms and have a positive test. Uh, this is promising, the ability to have a sort of rapidly accelerated diagnostic uh, in, in, uh, available to people, including those that can be deployed uh, at the point of care to detect uh, COVID. And this resulted in the first of its kind uh, home uh, test diagnostics that tell you whether or not you're infected with the virus. Uh, this is something that I wanted to do when I was there. Work with the Gates Foundation in development 
a home test, like a home pregnancy test, that would let you know whether or not you had the flu. Uh, we're never able to quite do that. So, but one of the positive things that have come out of COVID is this accelerated focus on diets, not diagnostics, bringing technologies into the clinical space and what I would call the emergence of conversions uh, has resulted from COVID. Here, uh, and this is a, a uh, image from one of the uh, popular pharmacies in the U.S. showing these home uh, point of care tests that you can take at home and determine whether or not you have a COVID infection, which resulted from the work uh, being supported by at that institute NIBIB. We'd also like to have uh, taken this even further. If you can diagnose COVID at home, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could receive your vaccine and, uh, and vaccinate yourself at home? This kind of technology uh, is under development, undergoing uh, clinical uh, phase trials right now. Mark Prosnitz, uh, uh, who is a bioengineer at Georgia Tech, working with an immunologist, has developed this uh, micro needle patch that has in the small uh, patch 100 uh, biopolymer micro needles that will degrade uh, within five minutes when you place it on your skin. They're so tiny that they're painless, uh, but they uh, can be loaded uh, with a solid form of a, a vaccine. And after five minutes, you are then uh, vaccinated. This has not advanced to the point that we have a coronavirus uh, vaccine that has been uh, affixed to or, uh, or loaded into this microneedle patch. But I think we can look forward to something in this version going towards the future, particularly if we can get it into a solid form, which is what this uh, utilizes and, and is based on. And if that's the case, and then you don't have the temperature concerns and the need for temperature uh, uh, control for stability. And you could pick this up uh, in, in, in a shop or in the store. Uh, quite a bit of, of, of focus and research now uh, in the area of improving our ability to uh, diagnose uh, infections. Uh, much of this conference is focused on, on viruses, uh, but bacterial infections uh, are a major uh, concern and the most common pathway of death in hospital is sepsis. So Rashid Bashir and his colleagues at the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana or Urbana-Champaign are developing point of care approaches that not only identify whether or not their uh, bloodborne pathogens, uh, but uh, are able to detect sepsis at various stages, at the earliest stage of sepsis, before you get to this the stage of, of septic shock where death uh, has a, a high uh, probability. So uh, their approach the uses this platform uh, technology is, is shown here that takes whole blood, licenses it, uh, um, has, has the micro post uh, labeled with antibodies specific to different uh, uh, cells and protein uh, and uh, markers and cell surface markers such as uh, CD4, et cetera, uh, these protein biomarkers. And with this being able to capture uh, different cells and, and, and proteins, and, and as a result of that, actually from a drop of blood at the point of care, their goal is to develop a CBC, a, a complete blood count, where you have uh, a, a count of the number of white cells, but also cell subtypes, and these different bio biomarkers, uh, CD4, et cetera, that emerge at different stages of the infectious process so that you can determine whether or not uh, what the, 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 the stage of the sepsis is, and particularly if uh, sepsis is developing early on in the process when it can be treated and dire consequences be prevented. The advent of handheld ultrasound devices uh, has emerged uh, over the last decade or so. Now even being wireless, uh, like this one here, uh, and those that are, can be placed
plugged into uh, a, 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 a portable phone, a handheld phone. And I was going to say a laptop, but not only a laptop, but also uh, a portable phone. With the advent of, of this, uh, shown here in, in Africa some years ago, this was one of the early models, V-Scan, which actually has this wired probe into it, it was the earliest model. And now with a model that doesn't even have a wired probe, and it can be done wirelessly. With these kinds of small and portable ultrasound devices, the ability to improve our delivery of health care in the hospital, where something as simple as placing a needle in an artery and not going through the artery is a problem, and a problem that you may not know even exists if you're not a clinician. But here, uh, using this device uh, that pairs this portable ultrasound with the needle that shows uh, clearly in the top here the uh, intended vessel that's being cannulated show you when you're in the vessel uh, with that needle being placed and introducing uh, a catheter uh, when that's needed to cannulate the vessel with the kind of uh, pinpoint accuracy that comes with this kind of visualization technique. And speaking of accuracy and ability to do a better, a better job of diagnosing uh, and coming from that treating diseases and developing techniques that can be uh, delivered uh, in more regions and are more accessible. Uh, this approach being pioneered by Lee Hong Wang, now at UC <coughs> at Caltech, who used to be uh, at our Institute of Texas and uh, developing this technique called photoacoustic tomography, where light is used to activate uh, a target molecule, and, and then once it's activated and pulsed, this pulsing molecule actually then produces an acoustic wave, and the acoustic wave is what is actually imaged. Uh, and the, the penetration, the escape of acoustic waves from deep in the body uh, provides a greater degree of, of, of spatial uh, clarity and resolution, uh, where light uh, degrades as it uh, emits from the body, and so that the spatial resolution also, and the clarity of the image will be degraded. So this is sort of a combination of two techniques, the specificity of light and, and light-activated molecules located on the target site, and the sound and the ability to image sound is this combination. So here's a patient with an invasive, invasive uh, carcinoma of the breast. This is the a nipple. And what you're really seeing with this photo acoustic imaging of the blood vessels itself and the accumulation, the density of those uh, in this area of, of cancer. Uh, with the ultrasound uh, images uh, as well, the sound-based images, being able to do what's called elasto, uh, elastography, in which the stiffness of the tissue is actually uh, quantified and the uh, cancerous tissue having a greater degree of, of stiffness uh, than is the case with more normal uh, breast tissue. So here is a potential for identifying uh, breast cancer and identifying it early on uh, and having a technology that's complementary and supplementary to conventional uh, mammography. Looking further down the road and into the future, combining this kind of light-based and sound-based approach into a bra, for, for example, might afford the ability to do continuous monitoring and allow us to identify cancers very, very early in the stage when they are not only treatable, but quite curable. Looking also uh, at light and, and uh, and light activation and the ability to, to more precisely identify uh, target and cancerous tissues was this idea that was the brainchild of now uh, deceased Nobel laureate Roger, Roger Chin, who uh, died at a, at a young age from a bicycle accident. He was a pre professor at UCSB. And one of his uh, medical uh, MD, PhD 
Dr. Fellows was Wayne Newman, who is a head neck surgeon. And he had this idea. Uh, so his Nobel Prize was, he was one of the recipients of the prize for green of fluorescent proteins. He developed proteins that fluoresce in a variety of colors. And he had this idea of developing these fluorescent cell penetrating peptides. Peptides that have this uh, 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 pot, pot that are positive and that attach to the cell and actually penetrate the cell. But so his idea was to complex them with a negative uh, 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 molecule uh, joined by a cleavable unit that can be broken by a protease. And a protease is, uh, proteases, or uh, as we know, are expressed by cancer cells. So the cancer cell with lysis uh, released the uh, uh, cation carrying this fluorescent plate payload that would attach to the cell and make the cancer cells fluoresce. You can see them quite, quite brightly. We saw some images somewhat like this from uh, Philip Lowe, Professor Lowe, yesterday. So here's an example of a tumor. Uh, this looks like a tumor, and then here's the, here's the nerve. And his uh, idea, by the way, was not only to target cancer cells with one peptide, but then target nerves with a different peptide and fluorescent with a different color, and thereby providing the type of precision that every surgeon wants to have. Where is the tumor? Is the tumor all gone? Or do we get it all? And can we avoid any neurological deficits by uh, not cutting across nerves? Here you can see the nerve. You see the nerve that appears at the end of this tumor. But what you don't see quite as clearly is this nerve branch, uh, which you can now see quite well when you specifically label uh, the, the nerve. Here is a, a video uh, from Wen Nguyen uh, showing this uh, in the operating theater. You can see the tumor there is quite, quite large. But what you did see before, and you can see now when you illuminate the nerves, is a nerve bed. So here it is in its more natural state now, illuminating the nerve beds, and the nerves are all quite, quite clear. And when you want to see where the tumor is and how far the tumor tissue goes, you, now the tumor tissue is, is uh, clearly illuminated. And the interplay, you can see how intertwined the nerve tissue, the nerve fibers are with the cancer's tissue, and how delicate the surgeon, surgery is in order to remove the tumor and avoid uh, clipping nervous tissue. But quite an advance, and this also uh, it is uh, under uh, uh, clinical trial now, undergoing clinical trial, uh, in, 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 with a company that was started by Gwen Nguyen uh, in Southern California. Similar to this is the advent of technology, some, somewhat analogous to the kinds of uh, developments that we just heard from, from Dr. Weissman, is this idea of engineering cells that can produce a number of therapeutics. Hormones such as, as, as uh, insulin, uh, antibodies, well, the type of antibodies that are produced by the uh, mRNA uh, of vaccines, or uh, enzymes, uh, telomerase, for example, is an enzyme that, that stabilizes the ends of, 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 the, of DNA. Of molecules and is uh, related to cell aging and, and stabilizing those. And then factors uh, such as uh, factor VIII, which is involved in hemophilia. So with synthetic biology now and in engineering, we, can, we know how to uh, engineer uh, and harvest and cultivate cells that produce this variety of therapeutics.
has uh, been uh, synthesized and produced specifically to be immunotolerant and not elicit an immune response. This is a very promising approach of being able to deliver medicines uh, uh, broadly. Uh, and, and hopefully, you know, if this can be do done in large scale uh, in a less costly way. But here's an example of producing uh, insulin in a mouse model of diabetes. Here's a healthy mouse, and it shows the, the glucose level in this healthy mouse over about a six month period. Here it is, a mouse with diabetes and with this bioartificial pancreas of the type that I just showed you that has these uh, immunoengineered cells that produce uh, insulin, but they're encapsulated uh, in these immunotolerant uh, polymers so that the uh, animal, did, uh, the, the mouse did, did, did not reject it. And the types of bees that are being uh, uh, engineered here that allow this immunotolerance and don't elicit an immune response. And fibrosis and reaction is shown. They're engrafted into the omentum of this non-human primate and removed. And you can see how clean it looks. It doesn't have the type of scarring that you might would, would expect with something that would elicit an immune response. So here they're calling an immunoprotected and unclumped pancreatic island cells within these immunoprotected bees. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And also looking down the road at novel approaches to deliver a therapy uh, is this concept uh, pioneered uh, by one of my former colleagues, uh, Kobayashi and uh, Peter Choiki, at, still at the NIH, who uh, have found a a, 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 a nanoparticle uh, that is hydrophilic uh, and has a high absorption for near-infrared light, and in response to that high absorption to near-infrared light, it becomes heated and swells. I can attach it to uh, a, uh, a, a monoclonal antibody and use this as a way uh, to elicit uh, an immune response uh, therapeutically, uh, as, as indicated here, as shown here by having an antibody against uh, tumor cells, uh, the antibody attaches to the tumor cells, then we have this near-infrared uh, light response that absorbs the light, uh, the cell then swells, and it's, it's uh, because of the uh, light absorption and the heating uh, of the cell. And that causes this uh, uh, cell to rupture and release uh, immunogenic uh, components. The immunogenic components then stimulate the immune response and the, and the immune response then attacks uh, the cancer cells. So this is a way of enhancing our own bodies to attack cancer cells. Enhancing our own immune response uh, to can cancer cells. Uh, an a interesting concept for the developing this type of photoimmunotherapy for cancer on the horizon. So my final slide, uh, Paul and, uh, or second to the final slide, basically, uh, uh, Paul and Kennedy, is to uh, come back to where I actually began, but with a different slide, the one that I also shown by Dr. Marino yesterday, is the promise that healthcare has from converging medicine and engineering and developing this new approach, this new mindset that will lead us to both a better understanding of disease and the disease process as beautifully illustrated in the lecture today by Professor Weissman, also as beautifully illustrated yesterday in the lecture by Philip Lowe, and how this enhanced understanding then leads us to better, more imaginative, more creative solutions to those problems. That is what we're after. And having that information at our fingertips should allow us to address the challenges that exist across the globe and bring us to a healthier uh, and more resilient planet. 
I leave you with this final thought. If we think today as we thought yesterday, we rob ourselves of tomorrow. So I hope that the biggest message that comes from this is more creative and innovative thinking. Thank you, Eric. sort of philosophical question and that is that it's often said that uh, because physicians teach physicians we will never be able to change the mindset that um, the way it's always done is the way it should be done how do you address that and this is going to be a challenge I think well a point is hit it on the head, you know, and it, it really um, is an expression of that last statement about thinking the way we've always thought. <coughs> How can we expect change? Um, this is behind the idea of a convergence of disciplines, a convergence of experience. Uh, the whole reason that fundamentally diversity is our best way to innovate uh, solutions to challenging problems, bringing in fresh ideas, different ideas, things that you didn't know, things you hadn't thought of before. No single individual and no single discipline has all of the answers. The, the answers are more likely to come from disparate uh, thinkers, disparate disciplines, all con converging together to address the challenges that, that, that we face. I've always thought that you stand to learn the most from those with whom you have the least in common. And that, I think, speaks to this idea that you uh, just expressed, Paul, of having different people uh, teach at least be involved in, in medicine and medical teaching. Uh, different areas of expertise being brought into the classroom. That's where the aha moments are likely to come from. That's where the, the new way of thinking and, and the more creative solutions are likely to come. And that is actually what we're trying to do in our new NMED uh, program uh, which is in our new school, which is this, the, actually the name of the school is the Intercollegiate This makes it easier for Professor Pettigrew to hear. Um, thank you for your nice uh, presentation, Professor. Um, But the other question is, uh, relates to the intersection. Um, so you have the opportunity to either be an engineer or a physician, or combine them. And for all of my life, I've been trying to combine the two. But the, the, the driver is the focus 
of problem solving in the healthcare arena. And the reason that you're a physician is that you wanted to, to deliver health and well-being to everybody that you come in contact with. Well, one of the best ways to do that is to develop uh, solutions to the healthcare problems and challenges that you have. And as I think uh, Dr. Marino pointed out yesterday, not simply learning how to get good and using the tools that you have now with the limitations that they have now, the technologies and the approaches that you have now with the limitations that, they, that we have with them, but actually developing ways that are better than that, that are better than the tools that you have now, that are better, that address the limitations that you're challenging with. That's what you do as a physician who's also a bioengineer has the unique opportunity to do. So I would encourage you to focus uh, on healthcare from a innovative standpoint, from a problem solving standpoint, because you have that training and that background as a bioengineer. When you see a patient or a set of patients or a disease or a disease process, and you wish and you think, I wish I had then go out and work to make this happen. That's, that's where innovation uh, occurs. Are there any other questions? Perhaps I can ask the last question then myself. Uh, Chairman's priority. You know, we have all these amazing technologies. What do we have to do to actually solve the problems? How do we actually change the... Because it seems to me we still have an untold number of problems to solve. And yet we've got all these extra technologies over, you know, 40 years and then 20 years and now to now. How do we really get there? Yeah, Paul, <laughs> so it, it, it's interesting. Uh, I was reading a, a months back uh, the, the, the life of Einstein, uh, and there was someone in the golden year, 90, in 1905, I think it was, um, where he had this golden year where he came up with the uh, the photoelectric effect and the general theory of relativity and the special theory of relativity uh, and, uh, and and this uh, this theory that has actually uh, proved out it leads to electromagnetic induction. So he had this uh, this one year where he created a lot of things. Well, just a couple years before that. There was this famous scientist who was president of the, uh, the National Society of, of, of Science and so forth. Uh, before then, just a year before that, who had written a statement saying that everything in physics had been done and there was nothing new. And then that was just a few years before Einstein broke on this, the scene with these monumental innovations that are still having an impact to the day. Uh, and since then, the differences over the 100 years are enormous or tremendous, and no doubt the differences 100 years from now will be even more enormous. We actually are accelerating at the, the pace at which discoveries are, are being made. And, and that should be the case, because we have the benefit of everything that happened before us so we should be accelerating in our innovations and our thinking. But your question of how do we get to the point where these things really are able to address 
to the challenges and the problems that we have. I think that one of the things that we need to do now in this uh, first couple of decades of the 20th of the 21st century is indeed to bring in a more targeted problem-solving mindset into the healthcare arena. It really looks at boundary conditions so that people all over the world who operate in different kinds of boundaries with different kinds of conditions have access to these technologies that we develop. Specifically, what I'm referring to is that up until this time, largely speaking, with some exceptions here and there, many of the space uh, into the space of healthcare improvement and healthcare care delivery could improve on that. We have to challenge uh, our developers to think about these global issues in order to have these solutions actually be deployed globally. And I kind of keep saying that. But I think there's a subtlety there that somehow is not really appreciated. That largely speaking, we've had these disciplines that's, that talk to each other, but they haven't been blended and integrated in such a way that when you actually design a solution to a problem, you also think about how it's going to work, where it's going to work, with whom it's going to, to whom it should be delivered, and what are the boundary conditions and the location where that is going to be deployed. And that's the thing that we can do going forward that hasn't happened to this, to this point. You know, it hasn't been a part of the design goals, and it could be. All right, well, um, I would like to have the audience please express your and wisdom to our group and we will see you here one time soon <laughs> thank you so both, both dr moreno and i are committed to come home thank you so much all right um, we are going to take a short break Maximum. And I'm going to be going out there and yelling and screaming uh, like I did earlier to get you coming back in here. But now I would like you to take a short break. Well, Mom. Um, yes. Can, can I just do one final thing? So, and I was just thinking about this. In asking your last question, I spoke in generalities. But let me give you one somewhat more specific example. We were working with the Gates Foundation when I was at NI. At NIH, and we're talking, you know, they focus on global health care. So we set this criteria that any innovation that would be developed by any of our grantees had to fit in a backpack, and it had to be able to be transported in a backpack. And if that condition was met, then we thought we would be able to deliver it across the globe, uh, utilizing soul power rather than having to plug into a wall, 
something you can put in, in, a, in a sack that you can carry. And that is an example of sort of a broad design criteria that is a part and parcel of what you put in front of your design team and the people who are trying to develop solutions to the problems. That is where engineering and medicine could come together as a concrete example, and that specific example, of the broader concept that I have of in everything that we do, thinking about the conditions in which the solutions that we're working on will have to work. Thank you very much for that uh, thought. All right, with that, please, you have 30 minutes. And uh, the goal is to get your posters done. Is there going to be any uh, tea available? Um,
health is global. These are uh, shipping and uh, airline travel in 24 hours. And I think we all know with uh, COVID that uh, diseases can spread very quickly. And so today's talk is going to be about SARS-CoV-2 detection on a smartphone for COVID diagnostics. Uh, and so what this is, is that we have a smartphone that does the computing and is a camera, a little microfluidic chip that has the specific test reagents, and a small embedded microscope that's got a laser and a heater that are able to do our uh, nucleic acid amplification that we are targeting. So this uh, steps through with saliva collection uh, from a potential uh, somebody who wants to test if, if they've got uh, COVID. And then that gets loaded onto a very simple microfluidic chip that just has a, a sample inlet and a, a detection zone. And that is heated at 65 degrees C and lysis of the virus and amplification of the nucleic acid targets occurs. And so inside that chip, you've got your saliva SARS with SARS-CoV-2 in it. And we're targeting two genes on uh, the uh, two primer sets towards the NSP gene, which makes the N protein. And so we've got 12 primers total in this reverse transcription loop mediated isothermal amplification process and allows us to hold the temperature at 65 degrees C for 30 minutes. And that makes billions of copies of uh, DNA products. And what is particularly useful in LAMP is that these products are very long chains. And when you put long strands in a solution, they increase the viscosity. Uh, and so we put this in the smartphone, the little chip, and uh, take a 30 second video and identify if SARS-CoV-2 has been detected. And we do this using particle diffusometry for the detection. And what particle diffusometry does is exactly what your eyes are doing now, which is to see that on the left, there are uh, very slow moving particles that don't go very far. And on the right, there's very fast moving particles. And so when you have the DNA amplification, you have this uh, huge increase in uh, long strands that make it hard for the particles to move. And that is able to uh, identify the pathogen based on the diffusion of those particles. We're, uh, whoops, we're quantifying this using uh, something called particle diffusometry, and uh, that is it's a cool physics-based uh, detection where you look at all of the particles in a solution, and you look at any image correlated against itself, called the autocorrelation, and then correlated against a subsequent image, which is the cross-correlation, and uh, compare those two. And when you know the magnification and the time between the image frames, you can uh, determine that diffusion coefficient. And this worked initially really well on a microscope uh, that was a $200,000 instrument with a very fast camera and um, a dark room that it required. Uh, and so Jay has translated this to a smartphone that, oops, if I can get the video working, you can also see the exact, um, you can see the particles moving, Maybe not today, but uh, you can at least see the particles, and then as they move around, uh, you can see, similar to the previous video that I showed, these little 400 nanometer, nanometer stripped atom coated particles where the DNA strands amplify, and um, some of them even attach to the particles, which makes the apparent diffusion even slower. We use this as we developed uh, SARS CoV 2 assay. And uh, we're able to show that it's both sensitive and specific. So on the left side here, you can see the diffusion coefficients. And remember, high diffusion coefficient means that they move quickly and there's nothing in there. Low diffusion means that they've slowed down. Uh, we tested against dengue virus, MERS, and SARS, uh, the original SARS. Uh, and none of those uh, had a, a big change in diffusion coefficient, and so there was nothing detected in there. Whereas at 50, 500, and 5,000 copies of SARS-CoV-2 in the chip, we saw um, increasing uh, reductions of that diffusion, uh, and therefore uh, able to detect the amplification. On the right side is a gel electrophoresis, 
for um, those who trust the biology, you can see that we do in fact have amplification um, via these ladders at the um, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and so that, that was lovely and it worked well in CHIP, which we were excited about, but that's in water samples. Um, and so what we want to do to make this translatable is uh, we made sure that we could use lyophilized reagents to dry it so that we could take these um, and ship them where they need to be. And uh, we titrated how much saliva could be used in the chip. And so only 8% of the reaction can be saliva, which means that we would have to do dilution from uh, a direct sample. But uh, what we did in, in the lab was uh, we didn't have folks uh, with COVID-19 that were volunteering to give samples, but we used uh, fresh samples from lab members um, under an IRB, and then spiked in the um, heat inactivated virus. So uh, when we did that, we were able to see that the no template control and MERS and SARS um, are all, uh, there's no statistical significant difference between any of those, and that's good because the SARS and MERS are off target. But compared to our various concentrations of SARS-CoV-2, we are able to see a statistically significant difference between those uh, for detection using this uh, technology. Ongoing next steps, uh, we have this, pro uh, this platform has been used in a few different uh, disease targets. Uh, we've been doing cholera work, but right now we have uh, asymptomatic malaria field tests in Indonesia with Foundation for Innovative Diagnostics that Ashley has led. We just got all that data back and we're excited to take a look at it and analyze it. As well as quantitative detection for HIV viral load monitoring, which uh, Dr. Melinda Lake, a postdoc in the lab, and Jay have been working towards. Um, we also had the pleasure of working with a um, Professor Eddie Odari, who's out there with you all now uh, on the uh, assay development for that, and are doing field tests uh, with Indiana University and Moy University concurrently. Um, and uh, as Dr. Pettigrew mentioned, making sure that these technologies get to people who need them and uh, that want them and that can benefit from them. We're also, as part of this NIH-funded study, are doing uh, working with social scientists who are uh, doing a lot of that evaluation of the feasibility and acceptability of this technology, um, which is a really critical step, both um, that, acid, that testing here in Indiana and um, concurrently in Kenya in Elder Edge. And so I'm looking very much forward to taking this device back in the future years, that's Dr. Clayton, uh, as well as other um, AIBBC attendees and, and workshop um, visitors um, checking out how this device works. And so thank you to collaborators on this project, to funders on uh, this project and all the projects in my lab, and um, thank you everybody for taking the time um, to listen. So how are you working to reduce your costs so that it can be uh, deployed to people that actually need it in resource limited countries? Thank you. Thanks. That's an excellent question. And um, you know, when we originally designed the technology, we thought it was going to be uh, really, really cheap, uh, and we could do it with a laser pointer from the lab and um, and some uh, little heaters. And I think that that has been the core principle. It's, it's not going to be a $5 box. Um, the, the company making it, Omnibus, they are um, integrating everything. You'll notice that the, the pictures were all on iPhone, uh, and they were an iPhone 6, which was top of the line when we got started, 
and now we have to purchase on eBay because it's hard to find them. And so moving away from that a smartphone is going to help because it really is just a camera and a computer, which you don't need all of the additional accessories for. And uh, additionally, trying to make sure that we can get the, the low cost reagents that are still high quality because the test chips are, are probably the most expensive for any nucleic acid amplification assay. Uh, those enzymes uh, and are, are always going to be the highest cost. But we have been very much keeping that in mind and looking at how to make it accessible and affordable uh, at every single step of the way. Hi, Jackie. Everybody standing Hi, here seems to know you. Uh, I'm here to report back. The house is still standing. The experiments were fantastically done. And uh, Anthony actually helped me out a lot as well. So with that, let me ask awesome. you a question. Uh, when you were talking about the nanoparticle, did I hear you say streptavidin coated? And in that case, what is the strapity? What What's the function of the streptavidin? Oh, did you hear my question? I, I heard the streptavidin coating and then the ding. Uh, something happening, exactly. So I heard you say streptavidin coated, which means uh, do they, the streptavidin have any function or is it just the size of the particle that is uh, of interest for you? And thank you. Yes. So, so it does have a function in order to, um, the, the amplification of the long particles, the long chains, increases viscosity, but diffusion also increases based on particle size. So when we tag the primers with um, biotin on the, one of the um, forward primers, it binds to the streptavidin feeds, and then the apparent size of that particle gets really, really big and slows down the diffusion. Thanks, Jackie. Um, he's taking credit for getting the assay to work, but I carried it all the way from the United States, so I should get some credit. <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, that you heat killed the virus, and um, I don't know um, what impact it would in your assay. I, I had been talking to uh, somebody um, in uh, developing assays, and they pointed out that heat killing changes the structure and that uh, you should use a uh, irradiate the virus. So can you comment on that? So we used uh, whatever BEI resources provided. And um, now that you mention it, I'm not sure if it was irradiated or heat killed. Um, but to counteract that, uh, we've just uh, been working with Indiana University to get uh, saliva samples from pop COVID positive and negative patients that are neither irradiated nor heat killed. And so those are headed to our lab next week so that we can be able to do testing with um, frozen samples that are not, uh, they're, they're not fresh, but at least they're more realistic. I, I don't recommend irradiating or heat killing patients. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, hi Jackie, it's me now. Oh, we have, we have Professor. Pedigree, please uh, take it up. Oh, okay, uh, uh, Jackie, I uh, got a call in the middle of your presentation, so I may have missed this. But given that your basic parameter for detection is diffusivity, the uh, question is about specificity and off target effects. Um, if you could comment on that. And then the other thing that I missed was how long this takes. Um, so the, the second one is easy. It takes about 30 minutes to do the amplification and detection. Um, and as we're trying to move towards real time uh, diffusion detection, it would be more like a RT PCR where if you get above the cycle threshold, you'd be able to even stop knowing that you've got uh, that amplification occurring. As far as the um, control goes, we I didn't mention that. That's something we're working on, which is uh, an internal amplification control, as well as, which would be a sort of a biological solution, and then also an engineering-focused solution, which is just to have a positive and a negative available at all times um, using the same, uh, using the same uh, saliva matrix, but making sure that you can always get uh, those clinically important controls. Because otherwise, you're right, it would be specificity issues. Could, could you apply this 
to uh, the flu. So somebody early, early mentioned, I think it was Kennedy, about whether or not he means his flu shot annually. So, you know, the flu is such a common problem that we, we really don't have a good way of diagnosing flu. Not really, it's not, we don't have a test, even right now, it's very flu specific. Right, or, or at least, yeah, sensitive and specific at the same time. Yes, uh, that's definitely one of the targets that could be applied. Uh, it's really, it would be just changing out the test kits for other diseases, whereas the platform itself can remain the same. Can we both, uh, Yeah, with those uh, questions, I think uh, let's appreciate Jackie again. Thank you. Yeah. I think uh, she's been traveling well and been with us, and I uh, hope uh, the next AIGDC she'll join us for a conference. So thanks, Jackie, once again. So our next presenter will be Wataru Kagaya from Osaka City University in Japan. He'll talk about the uh, impact of IRS on the native equivalence in the Lake Victoria Basin of the county. So welcome. I think you're in the wrong place. No. That, that's not it. Because that was the one we tried to get yesterday. Close it out and start again. Thank you, uh, Chairman, and also thank you for our uh, organizer for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, so my name is Wataru Kagaya from Osaka City University, Japan. But, uh, currently, I'm working in uh, Homabe County uh, as a field coordinator of uh, malaria project. We call Saturday's malaria project. So uh, as the title said, today I want to talk about the uh, impact of indoor digital spray on malaria prevalence. But, uh, from there, uh, I want to go detail of the, some epidemiology of this uh, home of malaria. And also, uh, if time allows, uh, I want to talk some uh, plan of our project, because our project just started in 2020, so 
it's still ongoing, and then there could be more interesting things. So I want to introduce uh, one by one. So uh, okay, let's start from the malaria situation in the world or in Africa. So uh, since as you see here in the bottom, uh, malaria investment, uh, investment increased since uh, 2020. Uh, sorry, not 20, uh, from two, 2000. Uh, thanks to the uh, SDGs, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, uh, malaria investment increased dramatically from 5,000 m to now it's almost 3,000 million. So, uh, in, uh, so along with this uh, huge investment, malaria case and malaria deaths start to decrease from the 2000 globally and also uh, in Africa as well. So, but uh, since uh, around 2010 or 2015, the case reduction or this case of this uh, reduction is somehow uh, uh, slowed down. And it's almost flat. And then if you look at uh, very carefully, the number of this is actually slightly increasing, uh, depends on the area. And also, uh, uh, as same as, uh, at the same time, investment also flattened. So uh, there was a first global malaria control program in 1915-5 up to 1916-9. At that time, we were using chlorine or uh, DDT spray. And then, uh, initially, we could achieve quite good uh, uh, malaria elimination in some area. And also, people are uh, expecting of eradication. But, uh, as you may know, uh, there was a chlorine resistance or DDT, a problem of DDT against the environment so that this uh, control program uh, failed out and came back to the uh, high malaria uh, endemic world. So the lesson learned from the first global malaria control program was no magic field for malaria elimination. Like if you rely on a few uh, items or if you rely on uh, only some items, then you will fail. And then somehow we can, uh, maybe we can simply say that the situation we are now is similar to that because uh, since 2000, we use uh, bed net, especially long-lasting insecticide treated bed net or uh, rapid, diagnosis test, rapid diagnosis test and also uh, artemisinin combination therapy. These uh, tools, like uh, treatment, diagnostics, or prevention, these came up and then we are happy with that one. We are then, but now the effect from there was uh, somehow uh, fading away. So IRS is also in a, uh, we can say, in the same uh, scenario. So as you see in uh, this uh, left side graph, IRS is one of the key factors for controlling malaria since 2000. The purple color on the top, this one is an uh, estimation of the IRS contribution to the malaria reduction in uh, prevalence. So, and also, uh, several studies show that IRS is effective uh, in the study. But uh, if you look at the uh, uh, real settings, of course, there's uh, some other factors which will contribute, such as logistics of IRS or uh, acceptance of IRS in the community. And also, uh, in a uh, scientific way, uh, other factors also hamper the effect of uh, IRS, such as in insecticide resistant mosquitoes because uh, we are using uh, similar, uh, similar insecticide for spray and then uh, mosquito uh, develop their resistance against the insecticide. And also uh, nowadays there's a behavior change in the mosquito. Uh, they start to bite uh, not only the houses but also outdoor. And also uh, people believe that mosquito, uh, especially anaphylis mosquito, uh, we bite human in uh, uh, night time, but some of the mosquitoes start to bite uh, before dusk or uh, yeah, so before sunset or even after sunrise, uh, they start to bite. So that kind of things uh, make it a bit complicated the situation of IRS impact. 
So the uh, right side uh, figure showing the population project with uh, IIS degrees. Uh, so yes, uh, since 2010, uh, there was a good uh, contribution from IRS, but now uh, the situation is starting to change. So uh, what is happening on the ground? That's what we have to know and we want to know. So there's a need for the long-term monitoring in practice or on the ground of IRS. So uh, in a, our study site, home of a county, there was an IRS program since uh, 2018. Uh, before starting, uh, before talking about the IRS program, I can briefly uh, explain the marriage station in Lake Victoria. Probably you already may know, but uh, it, this is a high uh, marine area, which having uh, more than 30% of uh, person with falsified prevalence among the two to 10 years old. Uh, there, was, there is a, a constant ITN definite distribution program, and uh, thanks to that, uh, based on our questionnaire survey, uh, people are saying that around 70% uh, of the population are saying they're using IT uh, bitnet. But still, again, still, uh, this is a high endemic area, as you see in uh, this Kenya map. So this Lake Victoria region is a kind of last one mile in Kenya of malaria. So IRS program in Homo Bay, it started from 2018, and they, they, uh, they're doing annual spray in uh, February and March. Uh, they're spraying uh, entire Homo Bay county, but except some islands. And also, uh, interestingly, there was a, a, a one big island called Fangano Island. And this island, they spread only 2018. <coughs> and after that, they stopped. Uh, the reason I will explain later, I will talk later, but uh, uh, this is uh, some of the unique feature in this area. And uh, here I wrote the uh, drug and uh, insects which they use. So uh, here, in the same settings, uh, we are uh, doing a cross-sectional malaria survey since 2012. So we continuously monitor the malaria situation in this uh, malaria endemic area. And then we found several uh, interesting uh, features, which is, of course, high malaria prevalence in one of that, but uh, also heterogeneity in the transmission. And also, there is a high submicroscopic infection, or uh, as well as we can say, uh, high asymptomatic cases. Yeah, this one also I will talk later a bit more. But uh, uh, in, if you look at uh, from the viewpoint of IRS program, uh, we have uh, three different categories. One is a no IRS program at all. Another one is uh, IRS only once in 2018. And uh, most of the mainland, they are receiving IRS annually since 2018 up to now. So uh, based on this IRS program situation, together with our uh, malaria survey, we, uh, it, it enables us to monitor the impact of IRS program with uh, malaria prevalence uh, data. And then from there, uh, we can answer the question, what is the long-term impact of IRS, or what happens if you withdraw the IRS from the program? So that's, that's the, the one of the, our research question here. So uh, let me go straight to the first result. So this is a, a prevalence result from uh, Bungoi area and the Wakura area. So Ungoi, this is an uh, area where they received uh, annual IRS uh, since 2018, as shown in the arrow. In case of, uh, okay, so, but uh, Wakura, this is uh, one of the areas in Fangan Island, and which is receiving only once IRS, and since then, they were uh, uh, not receiving anymore. So uh, we did a malaria survey uh, targeting around 200 children, uh, school going children per school. And then, uh, yes, IRS uh, coverage in uh, 2018 was 92% uh, in the Mungo area and 72% in the Fangan area. So, actually, in Fangan, they, uh, they received the uh, IRS, but coverage was a bit lower than the, the mainland. 
So in this kind of situation, under this kind of situation, as you already seen in the clearly in the figure, the prevalence was dramatically reduced both in the Bungo and Wakura significantly after the first IRS. And then uh, the graph is showing the PCR result and RT result both. So you are seeing uh, both PCR and uh, both RT and PCR uh, prevalence were reduced uh, thanks to the IRS. Of course, this is a, a observation study or observation based on the observation. So we cannot uh, directly answer this is uh, because of the IRS or not. But uh, based on the uh, observation from 2012, uh, since we haven't seen this kind of trend before, so we can safely say this is a suggestion of uh, impact of IRS. And interestingly, after that, 2018, <coughs> Ungoi maintained the uh, low prevalence. I think this is quite dramatic because uh, the prevalence was uh, around 60% in the initial stage. That was reduced to the 10%. Since 2012, we never see this kind of uh, low prevalence in the mainland, so we are quite surprising with this one. But uh, what we have to look at carefully is the uh, situation in the Wakura because, okay, the prevalence also reduced from 60% to 10%, but after reducing, uh, after uh, withdrawing the IRS, we are seeing the clear uh, resurgence of the prevalence, and which was not observed in any other area. So uh, we can safely say again, the IRS is quite effective, but it's not sustainable. So. Uh, this kind of trend, geographical pattern, was also observed in uh, other area. So this is a Fangana island, and then the round shape, yeah, each round dot uh, representing the screw, and the color representing the prevalence by RDT here. But the uh, are also uh, showing the similar trend. So only Fangano having the screws which having the more than 30% RDT uh, in this is the data from 2019. But uh, mainland, there was a, a very minor uh, malaria prevalence, very low malaria prevalence, uh, almost all area. And this trend was maintained for a uh, couple of years. So uh, again, uh, here we can say uh, this is a, a trend based on the IRS. And, uh, so I pointed this sub, I want to emphasize this sub point as well. So heterogeneity, I, uh, as a background, I mentioned there was a high heterogeneity. But this heterogeneity is somehow still maintained in the uh, mainland. I mentioned that uh, most of the uh, mainland prevalence was uh, reduced to uh, less than 30%. But still, uh, there was a uh, heterogeneity. So some area still having a, a, a prevalence, by PCR prevalence around 30%, but some area, or most, I can say most of the area is less than 10%. And the previous, uh, previous uh, genetic study showing that there is a high uh, degree of human, a uh, high degree of parasite movement in the area, which we, and also we are also observing the, there is a high uh, human movement between the island or even between the uh, mainland. So this population is quite mobile. Uh, but even though this heterogeneity is somehow maintained, so uh, parasite or human is coming in and transport the uh, parasite to the area. But some factor uh, defining this heterogeneity in each area. Probably uh, that can link to the mosquito, or uh, probably link to the human factor. Uh, we still don't know the answer, but this is quite an uh, interesting feature. I mean, one of the topic which we want to uh, tackle in the project uh, from now on. So when we go back to the uh, impact of IRAs, uh, we are seeing not only the prevalence, but also we are seeing the impact in the anemia. Uh, this is also a very clear uh, figure, I think. But uh, if you have the anemia, uh, if you have an ANS uh, prevalence of anemia, which is uh, lower than uh, 12 gram per deciliter HP, it's 
reduced, but not in a uh, uh, non IRS area. Uh, this area, we are uh, speculating that there are many factors contributing to anemia, but if you look at this Pengoi data, uh, somehow we can say uh, the pr primary cause of anemia could be malaria, because uh, this reduction of prevalence of anemia is uh, synchronized with the um, uh, prevalence of malaria. Uh, so these are the uh, data based on the malaria survey, but also uh, we want to emphasize the uh, community side, community perception. So again, as I said, uh, there was a slight difference of the uh, IRS coverage in the mainland and the uh, island. And also, uh, this low coverage in Fangano was uh, one of the reasons why they the, uh, withdraw the program. So the uh, PMI, who is uh, leading this IRS program, reported that there was a low acceptance from the community side. So they were listing some uh, comment from the community side, saying IRS bringing the bed work or IRS being a bad smell. Probably you already familiar with this kind of uh, uh, comments. But when we, look, when we went to the uh, island, actually, and then when we talked with the community members, there was uh, also a uh, different uh, message. So they are saying uh, sprayer did not visit the island on the designated day, because this is a remote island, a remote setting, so you have to come with the spray material and even the chemicals. So that's uh, quite understandable, it's quite hectic work. So could be one of the reasons. And also, they are saying they allocate only a few days for Ida. So, uh, of course, you know, uh, coverage is quite important point to achieve high uh, impact. And also, acceptance is important. So, this kind of controversial reasoning uh, maybe uh, requires uh, deep qualitative analysis. So, uh, based on this, of course, IRS program is not, uh, it, it, this is not under our project, but uh, still we have to understand what people are thinking and what is the motivation against malaria. So now we are collaborating with uh, anthropologists to do more uh, qualitative analysis to understand the community side. So uh, this is kind of summary slide. Uh, but, uh, so IRS uh, suppressed both prevalence and anemia, but this is not uh, sustainable. This was not sustainable. Previous, uh, another group uh, did a cost-effective analysis about IRS and then it's showing uh, this is uh, less eff effective in the low endemic settings. And uh, if you repeat many land, it reduces the cost-effectiveness. Cost and also, uh, so based on this one, we can say once suppressed by IRS, IRS probably strategy must be switched to the, uh, another way. So again, uh, there was a, again, I wrote this uh, lesson from the you know, uh, first malaria control program. There was no magic period for malaria elimination. So we cannot rely on uh, IRS only. That is uh, obvious. So uh, from here, I want to just briefly talk about uh, some uh, future, future plan or what we are working on. So uh, as an alternative uh, vector control method, we are working on a ceiling net. This is a, a, a fixed-sided bed net, but instead of, instead of covering bed, we are covering ceiling. So make the whole house as a uh, kind of under bed net, so that uh, we can prevent mosquito entrance from the eave, because eave if the gap between the roof and wall, this is the main entrance of the mosquito. So we can prevent the mosquito entrance. But also, uh, since it, it contains the insecticide, it can kill the potentially infected mosquito. After biting human, they need rest on the rooftop. So if there's an insecticide bed, bed net, it can kill uh, infected, potentially in infected mosquito. So currently, we are working on the uh, cluster under the control trial on this one. So actually from post, post uh, yeah. So next week 
we are planning to install this thing into the community. Uh, we have, I don't know, so we have uh, several other components uh, targeting uh, community side and uh, community behavior change. Uh, probably this, uh, some of this topic are already touched in uh, uh, my uh, workshop program. So uh, maybe I should skip this one. But uh, uh, also we are working on a, a novel viral diagnostic system, uh, which is shown here. That's, uh, that's uh, developed by Sysmex uh, company. Uh, this is a, a system based on the uh, flow cytometer uh, scheme. So we are evaluating this. We evaluated this uh, novel viral diagnostic system in a Homabe County Hospital by comparing uh, microscope and RDT, we are getting kind of, uh, quite promising uh, data. So from here, uh, now we want to move on to the uh, field setting. So, uh, so far we evaluated only with uh, hospital uh, clinical uh, sample only, but uh, by utilizing this in a community setting, we will see the impact with uh, uh, Submicroscopic infection or asymptomatic infection as well. So, uh, yes, that, this is uh, one of the uh, topics which we are working on. So, uh, yes, as I mentioned in the uh, first, uh, we are starting the Satellite project from 2020 and then uh, now we are uh, continuing several activities. So, uh, and then we are collaborating with uh, Mount Sinai University just in the last now. So we are interested in uh, a trivial malaria control program. Uh, you are very much uh, welcome to us. Okay, thank you for uh, listening. Thank you for your attention. Are some questions for Dr. Otaru? Thank you, thank you, Dr. Martin, for uh, that very informative and interesting presentation. My question is very simple. It's about uh, the, uh, there was a graph with, where you compared uh, the rebound after you stopped the IRS. And uh, I was wondering uh, the cause for that rebound. Is it because mosquitoes came back and the malaria picked up? And do you have any clue as to why? I think those mosquitoes which were there already were killed and maybe there was no malaria. Is it because of the, maybe the population still had the asymptomatic people? Or what, how do you explain that? Yeah, thank you for a nice question. Yes. Uh, I think there is uh, two answer. So, let me start with this one. So we did a uh, uh, mass drug administration in intervention in a similar area in this equitable basin, and we also observed that this kind of rebound. So it's quite similar situation. And then from that observation, we are uh, we we think this resurgence is partly because of the importation from the outside. So you stop uh, or you withdraw the intervention, but still a parasite with human will come. No, uh, we are not thinking mosquito uh, coming from outside, but the uh, human is uh, more a major source of the infection uh, and the re infection. But also, uh, at the same time, the number of mosquito is quite huge. And the, and the population is huge. So probably single IRS is not sufficient to reduce the mosquito population to maintain the lower prevalence. So once we resolve, still a mosquito population is enough, and they have enough ability to maintain their population. That's uh, my understanding. Thank you. That's a question once again. For the sake of time, uh, we've got the last speaker. Um, that's our distinguished uh, professor. Uh, 
it will be the last speaker for the day. And uh, we'll also give this closing remark. So Professor J. Paul Robinson. I can say the double professor. He's the SPM professor of uh, cytomics in the College of Veterinary Medicine and a professor of uh, biomedical engineering in the Wellington School of uh, Biomedical Engineering at Pagi University. He received his PhD in uh, immunopathology from the University of New South Wales, Sydney in Australia. And he completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Michigan Medical School. Currently, he is the director of Pani University Cytometry Laboratories at Pan University. In the past, he's been the president of the International Society for Advancement of Cytometry, chief, editor in chief of current protocols in cytometry, associate editor of Histochemica et Cytobiologica and Associate Editor of Cytometry Pack A. Definitely is an active researcher, having over 155 peer review publication. And with that, he has 29 book chapters and has edited uh, nine books, given over 120 international lectures and taught advanced courses in many countries, in terms of conference participation, is done over 350. I hope this one will be the 351. So, there's much to say about uh, Professor Paul Robinson. As an early, he was one was uh, among the early adopters of uh, web-based education materials, where he published the first known web-based CD-ROM in April 1996. And since then, he's published uh, 14 CD-ROMs, or DVDs, which have uh, a total distribution of over 100,000 copies, all free of charge. There are so many awards he's received as well. He was elected uh, to the College of Fellows, American Institute for Biomedical, for Medical and Biological Engineering in 2004. In 2004, he also received the Pfizer Award for Innovative Research. And 2002, he received the Gamma Sigma Delta Award of Merit in Research. He has participated in numerous NIH NSF, NSF and private foundation uh, review boards. He has also given a large number of talks, presentations to students, groups, and community service organizations. And he is also the immediate first chair of Paddy University Senate. So there's more I can talk about uh, our good professor here. But it's worth noting that uh, if I invite him, it's worth mention that uh, in 2009 he went to Nepal and climbed Mount Everest. <laughs> so those who like hiking, <laughs> I can see Josiah is so excited there. You can uh, team up with him. And uh, he did this in a bit to raise awareness of the major issues facing those who are HIV positive. So as AMBC, we are privileged, we are honored to have uh, Professor John, Professor J. Paul Robinson with us. And uh, it's like our father, our grandfather, is the one who's leading us. So join me in welcoming him to give his talk today.
Well, at least he didn't say grandfather. <laughs> uh, thank you, Steve. That was um, very generous and, and unnecessary. I, yeah, the privilege is mine to, to be here um, amongst you and uh, work with you. So thank you, and thank you to the other organizers who have put so much uh, effort into this meeting. You'll note that I changed the title of my talk. One of the privileges of being last is they don't find out till the very end that you've changed the title of your talk. I want to talk a little bit about, since everyone is talking about portability, I decided that um, I, want to, I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing in portability. And I put a note up there that we all talk about point of care, POC. Everybody uses the term. And I like to think that you can also use POD, point of detection. Because if it's not about care, but it is about detection of something that may be uh, a little different, um, it, it fits some of the areas that I, I like to talk about. I'm not exactly sure how to move the slide. <laughs> it doesn't move. This one? Okay. So the motivation here is, it's over there. Uh, the motivation uh, is for um, pathogen and toxin detection has been been an ongoing task, thank you, for decades. And technology and assay systems have advanced over the years, but there's still an enormous number of challenges. But one thing is for sure, the faster you can achieve a result, the better. And that's what I've been hearing in the last several days, uh, the people trying to solve this challenge. Now, laboratory tests are, are absolutely critical, but being able to detect pathogens and molecules on site is remotely is a major goal, and that's one of the challenges that we all face. And there are obviously plenty of times when it's just simply not feasible to take something back to the laboratory. And after all, if you can take a laboratory to the field and do the test, you don't need to then deliver the result. We've already had several slides at this meeting that talk about all of the traditional molecular or pathogen detection. So I won't go through them all because they're, they're all obvious. But there's one that isn't on this list. And now you're wondering what that is. And that's good because you'll have to find out in a minute. So what are the target pathogens that are around? We know what they are. They're there are so many of them, but these are some of the ones that are a little, little more tricky, uh, or ones that are, are even more important. And a lot of our work is funded by the United States Department of Agriculture, and they are also particularly interested in foodborne pathogens. So we also um, attack uh, that area. The first area that we, the first way that we tried to do this was to develop some techniques that used the more traditional and microbiological approach, which is growing organisms on culture dishes. Now, obviously, this is not a fast uh, process. But uh, there were a number of reasons why this technology was developed uh, in our lab some years ago. And uh, at the end of the day, one of the things you can do with this is you can create a fingerprint of an organism based on the colony itself. And it's not just looking at the morphology of the colony. Let me show you what we do. If you use a laser and you hit the laser onto each colony, it produces an elastic scatter pattern. You put a camera underneath the plate, underneath the dish. And you get these uh, beautiful patterns that you saw here. These patterns uh, can, be, uh, um, can be identified and then using a database, we can actually tell you what that organism is, just like that. Just looks at it and says, oh, it's E. coli, it's a cell, whatever. And uh, so we built these instruments 
And uh, this one on the left was designed to go onto an automation system. And over on the right, just so that you can see what's inside it, you can see there's a laser up here, the plate is here, the camera is here, and the whole thing is automated. And in fact, if you want to fully automate it, you put it in an automated incubator. We wrote software, control software that moves the plates up at some um, orderly manner, every hour, every two hours, every 10 hours, or uh, do it 12 hours and then every two hours. Uh, and then it produces uh, a data set. And if you look here, you'll see that um, for a single colony, it knows where every colony is on every plate, goes back to that individual colony, and then it maps it. And you can then actually look at colony growth that becomes out there. And then if you see that there's an organism on the plate that you cannot identify, it, um, it, it marks that uh, on, on the electronically on the plate. And then you literally put the plate, the Petri dish, onto a screen. This is just a small flat screen that's in the uh, uh, maybe a class two hood. And it um, flashes underneath the colony that needs to be subbed so that you then identify it by a PCR or whatever it is. So the whole, that was the whole idea of that technology. Well, clearly that uh, is useful in the laboratory. It's actually useful in the clinical laboratory even because um, all, almost all organisms are cultured anyway. But um, it's not very useful for rapid uh, a diagnostic out of the field. So uh, we came up with a, an approach that uh, used a different technology. Now, if you take an antibody and you, you uh, stick onto that particular antibody, a fluorescent probe, obviously you can identify the organism uh, one way or the other. And we've seen um, a dozen or more uh, talks that, uh, that show this sort of thing. But um, if you were to use a different molecule to add to the antibody, then you can use a different technology. So it turns out that if you take an antibody and you bind a lanthanide to it, and I'll talk about how that happens in a little while, you can attach the uh, lanthanide, the polymer that has lanthanides on it, to the antibody, and now you have a molecule that you can stick pretty much uh, a large number of elements onto. And then you've got tagged, um, tagged antibodies. Now, some of you probably haven't looked at this since you were in high school or as an undergraduate chemistry student in your first year. But, <laughs> but um, it's, it's a very, very useful chart. And um, there are quite a few interesting molecules that we can use. Turns out that these are the lanthanides down the bottom. You, you may never have even bothered getting to the bottom of the periodic table. But they're actually really important molecules. And there's 15 of them down there. And we can actually use any of those molecules and, bind them and attach them to an antibody, and then use the tag uh, as a marker. Now, they're not the only ones we can use. Any metal, any metal at all, we can use. Turns out there's about 27 metal antibodies, uh, metal, metal uh, elements that we can use. So think now about the fact that we have all of these elements that we can actually put on to our, um, our antibody. So how do you measure elements? Well, you can go to Mars. It, I don't recommend it, but uh, if you go to Mars, you can measure elements. Because on Curiosity, which has been up there for nine years now, driving all over Mars, shooting up stuff, it uses a, a, a technology called laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. And we just sent another one up six or seven months ago called Perseverance. And these machines run around Mars shooting stuff, and they're measuring elements. They're measuring its atomic spectroscopy. So uh, there are several ways of doing atomic spectroscopy, and 
you may not be familiar with spark-induced breakdown spectroscopy or laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. Um, you may be more familiar with mass spectroscopy uh, that's probably common in most uh, biochemistry labs. But it turns out that of the three uh, forms of matter, solid, liquid, and gases, we can actually go to the fourth, fourth uh, matter, and that is plasma. And if we utilize the fourth state of matter, we can actually um, transform uh, any, anything at all, virtually, into elemental particle, elemental um, um, molecular targets. So um, if you push an electron out into an uncomfortable position, it wants to get comfortable again and get back to its ground state. And uh, just look at uh, every element, every metal has a different color, you see that. Um, well, in spectroscopy, we can measure those colors very, very easily. And you see down the bottom there, you can see uh, gold. And uh, uh, we can tell exactly what it is just by looking at the spectroscopy. So we decided to try this in, for biological systems. So the first thing we did was um, build a sort of large system you can see here there's two or three large optical benches. There's um, an extremely dangerous laser on here. Um, uh, and it's, it's, it's actually running all around the room, which is really bad. But um, so it's bouncing from one part of the room to the other before it hits a target over here on the left. This is not quite portable. Um, in fact, it's not even useful in the laboratory because you need an entire lab to do this. And further than that, um, I don't recommend you look into the laser with remaining eye because it's very dangerous. So, what do we do? First thing we did was design uh, our own lip system. Uh, and then we built it. And you can see at the bottom there um, a, a, an ugly but a much smaller instrument which, which does uh, laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. But what's our goal? Our goal is to move over here and build a portable, uh, use a portable system. And a portable system is a handheld device that you can go anywhere with. And that's the target for us. Now, when you do LIBS, what you're doing is looking at spectroscopy. You're looking for elements, and there are lots of them. And so uh, you have to have, you have to know what ground truth is. But fortunately, uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology has a huge database which you can download. And we started building our own database. So you can actually create a database of the particular molecules or elements that you're sticking to your antibodies, and then you can track them. So we were ta tasked by the United States Department of Agriculture to go look for sugar toxin, botulinum, ricin, and others. And so that, that and also pathogens. So that's the, the target of, of our laboratory. However, um, one of the reasons for that, by the way, is that some of the toxins are rather time consuming to measure and, and difficult, several of them. And, and, and so uh, there's a need to, to do rapid identification of toxins. So that's one of the targets that we're trying to do. But <clears throat> we're also interested in paper assays. So we've had a lot of papers on paper assays here. So we thought, OK, if we're going to do this, we should just utilize paper assays. Because um, there's a lot of knowledge and reagents available for paper assays. And so we chose several um, molecules uh, botulinum antibodies, anti-shiga toxins, anti-aplatoxin, anti-ricins. We labeled them. And the goal was, can we make those measurements in paper? Because the, it, it's all very well to make them on, in the perfect environment. It's another thing to make them in an environment that's cheap, is transportable, and uh, reproducible uh, at, at, at a low cost. 
And the bottom line is, yes, you can. We can, we can quite easily measure these elements using lids in paper. And what was even more interesting was whether it's wet or dry, uh, and we can still make the measurements. Well, about a year ago, um, there was a bit over a year ago, you might recall there was a sort of chaotic situation occurred where a COVID turned up. And one of the things we said to ourselves, well, um, we, we do a lot of interesting stuff. I wonder if we could do something with COVID. Yes, like everybody else, we all tried to build a COVID asset. Well, the question for us was, can you multiplex? Because multiplexing seems to be important. And when, when we looked at the number of, of, um, of uh, deaths, do you know that since I, I made this first slide on September the 29th, when there were 703,000 deaths in the United States, and as of this morning, there were 759,000 deaths from COVID, uh, and another 3.3 million cases of uh, COVID. So this is a serious issue. So we looked at what do we know how to do and can it be used in COVID? And maybe if it can, it might also have another application. So since we do LIBS, we said, well, can LIBS do something with COVID? So we thought, okay, at the very beginning of COVID, that one of the questions was, what is happening to people in intensive care on ventilators? And the answer came very quickly. They, they, they have this cytokine storm. And I thought to myself, well, we measure cytokines almost every day in my lab. But it takes a long time to do cytokines. And it takes a, a day and a half, basically, to get the results. That's not very convenient. Well, it's now, it's, it was well known that um, like IL-6, IP-10, uh, uh, others, other cytokines were very important. So we looked up the literature, yes, the, this, this is something we, that we could do. And so knowing that we could measure cytokines with other techniques, um, such as ELISA and flow cytometry, which we use in our lab, we set about trying to measure cytokines. So the first thing that we did was to get uh, to take a cytokine uh, anti uh, IL-6 antibody. And uh, you have to go through a fairly uh, tricky uh, process, chemical process, to, uh, to attach these uh, metal tagged uh, molecules. But um, it's, a, it's a standard process, and there is now actually a kit to do this. And we took those labeled molecules, those IL-6, and we tested them uh, once we labeled them with different uh, elements. Can we measure those in our system? Uh, and so once we, uh, we tested them, we said, yes, on nitrocellulose paper, we can measure uh, at least the, 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 the elements. This is before, actually, we, we used the cytokine. The first thing is, could we measure um, these, these particular labels uh, on, on paper? And the answer was yes. So, um, this is probably of no interest to anybody, but this is some of the technical uh, details of, 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 of how you, you make the measurement. So here's a sort of cartoon of what you actually do. Um, we, we just have a, a small laser, and uh, the laser hits the paper where, where the, the molecule is, and it produces um, um, this plume, and then with a spectrometer, we measure the plume, and we end up with a straightforward measurement of um, elements. And from that, we can determine which element is attached to which antibody. And we're not looking for antibodies. The antibodies target the antigen, and then we look for the element that's attached to the uh, antibody. And um, we know the numbers, the elemental numbers, very specific, uh, and so we can um, then make our uh, detection. So now the next thing was, can we do this with these labeled antibodies on paper? 
uh, in a lateral flow assay. So we took those labeled uh, molecules and we put them on spots on paper, and then we followed through, did exactly the same assay, blew up the pieces of paper, and then the uh, spectrometer would measure the results, and uh, the answer is yes, uh, you can do this. Now, why would you do this like this? Well, I'll tell you, it's fast. You get an instant uh, measurement, and uh, it only takes uh, 10 minutes. So there, there are some reasons for doing this. So we tested this with uh, gold label antibodies, with our particular antibodies, just to make sure everything worked, and it did. Um, and uh, then we did the assay um, as we might do it in, in the field, uh, and um, we uh, then um, added this to our uh, introduction pad and let it run through the nitrocellulose. Um, and then we hit the line with, um, with the laser. Now you might ask, uh, well, there's no gold particles in there, so how do you know where the line is? It, it, it's called food dyes. You just add some food dye and uh, in, when you make the line, and then you can see the line. We're not interested in color or looking at it. We're interested in making a chemical measurement. Uh, but we need to know where it is. So uh, does can you measure IL-6 and IP-10? Yes, you can. Is it good enough for a, uh, an assay? Not quite. Um, we're um, a couple of orders of magnitude lower than the best detection of other systems, but it occurred to me, and after the discussion yesterday, about if you have a very high level, this is going to make the measurement. If you don't have a very high level, and it's probably not serious, then you're probably not going to be sensitive. We are working on this to try to improve the sensitivity. But why are we interested in this process? We're interested in it because in a lateral flow assay, we can multiplex this. We don't know how many we can multiplex yet, but uh, half a dozen, maybe 10, maybe 15. We don't know. And this uh, uh, instrument is now commercially available for other, um, uh, uh, other work. Um, and we have now been using this uh, in our lab uh, to transform these assays into assays that can be done pretty much anywhere. And I suspect we could use almost any uh, molecule that we could have an antibody to. When we first came up with this idea several years ago, I, I thought to myself, maybe we could do panels of um, reagents that would be related to different areas around the world. And um, I have not succeeded in going down this pathway. But it was uh, actually the first idea that I had. Sometimes you don't quite get to the first ideas. You get distracted. You have to solve other issues. But it's definitely something that we'd like to come up to. Now, the last piece of my talk um, before dinner, I want to talk about food, <laughs> cheese, uh, coffee, balsamic vinegar. Um, one of the questions we asked ourselves was, Oh, we've got this handheld device. Um, could we tell the difference between the, the cheeses in the store or where the coffee comes from? Um, we thought maybe we could. So we did this study. Uh, one of my postdocs did this study. So I emptied out my, my kitchen cupboard with every single thing we had in there. And uh, they put it in the lab, and they had 16 cheeses. Now, we didn't get them all from my lab. My house, we do this very, very quickly. And it turns out that we can tell the differences between all of these things very well. And every single sample has a, um, has a spectral signature, and that with a handheld device, we can look at pretty much anything. And look, look how accurate this is. Now, those uh, one, two, three, four, five are different analytical uh, approaches. And some are better than others. But if you look at the neural network uh, approach at the end, you'll see pretty, pretty high values uh, for us that we can tell the difference. Now, um, think about grain with pesticide, or food with pesticide contamination. We know the molecular structure of many of the pesticides. 
So we can probably rapidly identify pesticides. Fraudulent products that have been manipulated or something added to them that is not good. Um, perhaps we can determine that. And clearly substituted products. Um, so uh, we are now working uh, along this pathway. You see this thing in the middle here. It's actually just a flash of light that's coming. And uh, that flash is enough to make all the measurements. Now, I always add one educational slide in my talks. So this is for my students. Uh, you are now my students. Um, this is an educational slide. It's a hint from Paul. Um, I have no vested interest in the company that sells this product. But I use a product called Slidebox. It turns out I have 354,441 slides on my computer. That's a fair number of slides. It's uh, 25 or 30 years of uh, using PowerPoint and never deleting one off my computer. This program searches them all. It finds every word used in every slide and it documents, it puts it in a database. And, and as, a, as you get older, well, you don't know this, but I do. As you get older, I forget where things are. And I remember I changed this slide and I put this word in that slide. I need to find all the slides that have libs in them or spectral or something. And I can do that in a, in a second. It'll find that slide and it'll actually, you can actually drag that slide out into a new thing. So uh, it's called Slidebox. It's, um, in my opinion, it's uh, one of the most useful products that, uh, that I use. So that's my learning moment for my talk. So in summary, lots of people have developed uh, techniques for detecting pathogens and toxins, and it's an ongoing thing that we, we really need to do. What we've been doing is using a different approach by linking lanthanide molecules uh, to antibodies and be done with any antibody at all. And then we look for the lanthanide, and our goal is to move to total portability. Now, those machines aren't that cheap right now, but everything gets cheaper and cheaper over the years. And we think that, um, that if, uh, if this technology were, were seen as useful, that the price could come down uh, very significantly. And it would allow people to go into the field, do a quick lateral flow assay in a multiplexed way, and actually make uh, measurements. We think that we can do quantification. We're in the process of trying to do that. What we've tried to do is expand on existing assays, just make them faster or more multiplexing or more quantitative. The key is the multiplexing. So I want to just acknowledge the people in, in, in my team uh, that do this work. Bartek Greiner is our resident informatics guru. Ewan Bay is our resident mechanical engineer. Sun Ho Shin is a postdoc who is um, a biomedical engineer. Shi Wu is a molecular biologist. Then uh, Kathy, Brianna, and Doris are technicians in our lab. Cole is a graduate student. Uh, John is a graduate student. Valeri Petserkin is the uh, genius that transforms uh, all our ideas into software programs that make it easier for us to analyze. Um, we have collaborators uh, that uh, support us, and um, of course, um, funding coming from several agencies. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, uh, Professor Robinson. So we'll have two or three questions before the back end of this session. Paul, thank you so much for, for such a very interesting and illuminating talk. Uh, my question is quick on the leaps for POD. Uh, I, I saw you are using laser for the detection, and I was just wondering if you want to multiplex, are you going to use uh, lasers of several wavelengths, or how, how, how would you do this, the detection thing? Uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I jumped over the technical okay. aspects. Okay. These are pulsed, high powered lasers, very dangerous lasers. Um, and um, they destroy the sample. 
So it doesn't matter. There is no wavelength that, that and these are 1064 uh, lasers. So it's not wavelength dependent. Um, it's uh, simply temperature. It, it literally pulverizes the sample. Now, a very small amount, only uh, a few hundred microns uh, across. Okay. Okay. So, so any element oh. in that mixture will be measured. All right. Great. I missed that part. So well, thank you very much. I'm sorry, I, I just jumped over that. Any other questions? Thank you very much. So with that, uh, come to an end uh, this session. Uh, it was a privilege sharing this session being the, the last session of the film. Yeah, So with that, uh, uh, give back the mic to Collins, Eddie, and uh, can it direction of what next? Yeah, okay. And thanks to for staying this one. Uh, this is Guardian Bus, You'd former United Mall. I think it's still United Mall, so there's a station for Guardian Bus is there. So your bus will leave at 9 o'clock, 9 p.m. So whatever you do, just get to know that at 9 p.m. you should leave Kisumu. Um, those going on Sunday and Monday, we are not so sure how to handle you because when you remain on your private business, then you don't really become, uh, because we are supposed to release you here tomorrow. So if you're leaving on Sunday, I kindly make your own arrangements of going back to where you came from. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, after this, we are going to have dinner. And then normally this is the post-conference dinner and it's going to be up here it's all for you as you're taking your dinner there are some accompaniments that may come in just remember there is a swimming pool behind you <laughs> so that we don't I'm not so sure if, uh, when Paul <laughs> rescued somebody last <laughs> yeah so just remember that there's a swimming pool behind you otherwise let me Oh, welcome. Uh, I'm reminded that uh, just before the chairman comes, the chair of the conference, Professor Paul Robinson is going to give some gift, I think to one or two people. And then, uh, Professor Collins, I hope you've already arrived on when to at where, because you're supposed to announce the venue for the next AIDBC in 2024. 2023. The next AIBBC is going to be 2023, but we may strive to have a workshop next year as well. Before you leave here, there are your, you have your certificates out here, so we are not going to present certificates at the club for you. You will pick your certificates. Each person will, feel, will pick individual certificates uh, at the registration desk, so ensure you get conference participation certificates and then a workshop certificate, a participation certificate. There are, two certifi there are two workshops that have got specific certificates, and this is bioinformatics and the HIV workshop. All other workshops you are rotating, so you are only going to, you are only going to get one certificate that is both for conference and, uh, and, and, and the workshops. So ensure you get, you get your certificates. Uh, again, before we end, we are going to have the best poster a while. So we are going to see the best poster that was presented in the fifth AIDBC. So I think there should be some award. I can see Kennedy getting the dollars, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, and 
Hey, Jeffrey, man, what thousand? That's a thousand dollars. And 2,000 UK pounds. Yes. So let me take this chance to invite Professor, the only Professor Paul Robinson, to give his gift in a bag and then share. <laughs> Thank you. In a moment. In a moment. Yeah. Um, it's been my privilege to work with um, an amazing team of people. And I, I saw the beauty of African art. And I thought that it would be nice for some of our team to learn and appreciate Australian native art, the Aboriginal art, which is a thing of beauty. And so I brought with me, all the way from Australia, some gifts. Now, some of them are odd gifts, so I asked you to stay there, Eddie. And I think this is yours. <laughs> so, this is a special Australian device. Do you know what it is? Well, you can open it. You can open it. Um, this. So, take, take it out. Hmm? Sorry? So, this is a boomerang. And a boomerang comes back. And the reason I gave this to Eddie is because Eddie has spent the entire meeting running around in circles. And you know, there's a special way of throwing a boomerang, and it goes around in circles and it comes back to you. And I wanted Eddie to put this in his office to remind himself of, of all the circles that he's run around. And also appreciate this Australian Where is 
Kennedy. He's doing that in cycles. Kennedy. Can someone go and drag him back, please? He's already taking the vehicle. Oh, he's organizing. So, note the careful wrapping. <laughs> Where is Kennedy? Kennedy, please, oh. stand here. Are you going to arrest me? Yes. So, Kennedy has been working, well, I was going to say working his butt off, but that's an Americanism and probably isn't acceptable in Africa, um, so I won't say it. I was working off. <laughs> yeah. So, one of the things that I've noted with Kennedy is that he's quite interested in uh, wine, and uh, so uh, what I've got for you here is um, a stand painted with Aboriginal art, um, which will hold a bottle of wine. And you can open it. Um, wow. Will hold a bottle of wine on the table while you're serving. It's still wrapped, so. But uh, it, it it again has uh, the beauty of um, Australian Aboriginal art. Uh, and I encourage you to go and look up on the internet if you're not familiar with that art. And this is just in a, appreciation for all the hard work that you do um, on our behalf. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chairman, it's yours. Thank you so much, Paul. I don't know how to express my thanks, but I will someday. <laughs> We're working on the, on the posters. It seems we, we are facing some challenges. Some people have only two of them, have some or three. So it's a bit hard, but I told them to tabulate. We are just consulting a little bit, please just. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> now, I'm the only one keeping you away from the dinner. Yes. You know that, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Dangerous. Very really dangerous. <laughs> the problem is I started you off. Now I have to finish you up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, our speakers uh, who made it a success during the two-day conference. Can we give them a clap? Because uh, without the speakers, nothing could have happened. And then now, 
I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the participants who stayed there. There are so many temptations. We would have a case to outside here. But you made sure that despite the fact that there could have been some nocturnal activities, you are still here in class and making sure that you are sharing knowledge with the experts. Can we give ourselves a clap? I know we've been feeding here for the last <laughs> five days, isn't it? The hotel administration. And I haven't had somebody had some sickness or anything. Of my ears were on the ground as the chair to make sure that everybody was safe. And because there were no complaints and were served well, and there were no complaints about even the rooms, even the venues, and even even uh, whatever we were having breath or whatever we, what it was at the hotel. Can you give them a clap? <laughs> now, there have been our teams who have been making sure that we are visible visually. And I want to tell you that there's been a lot that has been going on on the social media platforms. If you are on Twitter, better go ahead in there and look for AIBBC so that you can retweet and retweet and retweet and retweet. Myself and Paul here, we've been very active, tweeting and retweeting. <laughs> so if you have accounts, I know you can just still go in, tweet and retweet and retweet about AIBBC so that become more and more visible. If you have a Facebook account, if you have an Instagram account, if you have, a, what's the other one? Facebook, YouTube, there's YouTube streaming which was being done. Uh, and you can go in because now it is open, you can share it with all your groups, uh, uh, show them what has been going on, all the wonderful presentation that we've been having throughout the week, and let it go as far as it can go because that is how we become more visible. So the team that made that possible, let's give them a clap. <laughs> and of course, uh, the, uh, my, uh, my organizing committee who have made sure that these things have worked. We haven't uh, received any major complaints. Of course, there are always complaints, but we can handle those complaints. Uh, let's give them a clap. <laughs> Finally, it's my honor to insinuate <laughs> that the next AIBBC 2023, make a guess, will be in which country? Australia. People <laughs> <laughs> are saying Japan, Australia, <laughs> Sweden, Italy. Italy. Kisumu, <laughs> Arusha, what would be the best option? Dar es Salaam. <laughs> so we are thinking, we, are not, we have not concluded about that. We are thinking of hosting it in South Africa. Wow. <laughs> we are thinking. We are thinking. <laughs> That, so that if, if we change our thinking, don't, don't get disappointed. We can say we are now going to Arusha, then it's still a good place, isn't it? We can yes. say we are going to Sweden, it's still a good place, isn't it? Yeah. We can say we are going to Australia, still a good place. We can say we are going to the USA, still a good place, isn't it? Yeah. So let's keep our eyes open, but for now, the thinking that we are supposed to go to South Africa. So hopefully, if that happens, we hope to see everyone of us presenting posters and giving us the best abstract for AIBBC 2023. Now, having said that, we talked about membership of AIBBC. And Dr. Eddie here mentioned that we give preferences to our members when we are going for such activities. If it is flight, we'll always give our members first priority. If it is accommodation, we give our members first priority. If it is uh, drinking beer, we'll give our members first priority. Yes. <laughs> so it is high time, if you are not a member, that you enroll as a member. Because if you are a member and you subscribe annually, you register, and then you subscribe to that membership annually, then we'll be able to know how active you are as a member so that we give you those advantages over the others. So keep that in mind always. 
Finally, you know, there, there were posters which were being assessed. So uh, the award ceremony for the posters will be done at the dinner. At the, is it called gala dinner? dinner? Banquet. 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 Yes. So we'll do that. But make sure you are not too drunk so that you are able to see people getting away. They know you are still getting away. Okay? So, but we'll make sure that that is done at that particular place. With those few remarks, and with the powers conferred to me as the chair of AIBBC, I declare this congregation is all. Thank you. So you can check this list on which group you belong to. Yeah, to those traveling tomorrow, you can, the list is outside there, so you can check.